Mostly Dangerous. The Women of Ambrose Estate, Book One. Written by Kimberly Montpetit. Performed by Reagan Boggs. Chapter One. With a small sigh and a suitcase, Sophia Ambrose climbed into her blue Lexus and drove north of Houston through the beautiful suburb of the Woodlands, and then another thirty miles beyond that to Ambrose Estate, the home of her childhood. It was a trip she made a couple times a year, but the sudden urgent request to come home right now by the matriarch of Ambrose Estate, her own darling grandmother no less, had annoyed her a little, especially midweek. The sudden trip was delaying her final negotiations in purchasing a veterinarian clinic from a retiring doctor. Sophia's meeting with the business loan officer at the bank tomorrow needed to be canceled until further notice. Of course, when Sophia came through the front door long after the dinner hour, luggage in tow, her grandmother was suddenly quite mysterious about the reasons for Sophia's critically required presence. Since it was already past her grandmother's bedtime, Lillian refused to explain anything until the next day. All was made clear, or at least a little clearer, the following morning. After your tour of the ranch this morning, there will be a reading of my will with my lawyer at four o'clock this afternoon, her grandmother had said at breakfast. She gave Sophia an exacting look. Your attendance is mandatory. Not that her grandmother was on her deathbed, far from it. Lillian Ambrose was as resilient and robust as the state of Texas, and mentally tough despite her 88 years of age. Are you lonely, rambling round in this big old manor house? Sophia had asked, but her grandmother would not admit that the emergency request for her granddaughter's presence was merely a ruse to get her to come running. I most certainly am not, Lillian said indignantly. This is business. Although, it is nice to see you, my dear. Gosh, thanks, Granny. It's nice to see you, too. But next time, give me more than a few hours' notice. And if you want company, just tell me, and I'll come visit. Lillian waved a hand as if she couldn't be bothered with companionship or conversation, and Sophia hid a knowing smile. Before you create any more presumptuous opinions, I've assigned you to hostess the event. Won't there only be three of us? Sophia asked. You, me, and the lawyer? That's not much of an event. Don't be silly, my girl. And with that, her grandmother had taken herself off to her upstairs study while Sophia was abandoned at the dining room table, gaping and wide-eyed with her now cold eggs. There was bound to be more drama. There always was with Lillian Ambrose, but instead of wearing down the mansion carpets with frustrated pacing, she had changed into a pair of old jeans and taken her own self off to the long row of horse barns beyond the back gardens. Finishing her ride around the Ambrose estate's massive, sprawling acreage, Sophia pulled on the reins of her chestnut mare star with both fists, slowing down her gallop. The cattle and oil fields were miles behind now on the grasslands. Star danced on her hooves after the final sprint from the clusters of willows along the gurgling creek, her nostrils flaring, flanks heaving. Sophia tugged at the brim of her cowboy hat. The blazing Texas sun was melting her skin off. She'd forgotten how hot it could get here, even on a May afternoon. Ooh-wee, she whistled, sweat dribbling down her neck. She'd probably missed lunch, too. There she is, old girl, she murmured smoothing a hand down her horse's velvety neck. The grand old house herself. Leading the mare toward her stall, Sophia gazed with affection at the old estate home she'd lived in most of her life. The house her mother had been raised in. The house her grandmother had been born in. The house Sophia's great-great-grandparents had built back at the turn of the 20th century in the late 1890s, or so she had always heard. The white three-story Victorian mansion had been added to over the decades with rambling wings, nooks, and crannies, and countless hallways spread over an acre. Dormer windows and cupolas and bay windows jutted out in a hodgepodge of glass. Not that acreage was a problem, since Ambrose Estate had nearly 10,000 acres to run cattle and produce oil. 
Her grandmother presided over it all with pomp and circumstance and a steely air of authority. Traits she had developed when her husband died young, and she took over the entirety of the Ambrose Oil Company, a move that was practically unheard of back in the 1970s. Come on, Star. Let's get you rubbed down. I have an appointment to prep for. Swinging her leg over the horse's back, Sophia jumped down, leading the mare to the barn with its ten open stalls. Star and Oscar, her grandmother's gelding, were the only horses left, despite Sophia and her sisters riding all over the ranch during their teen years, including trips into town, where the Ambrose Oil Company headquarters were located. But Oscar and Star had company during the workday because Colt Brennan, Ambrose Estates foreman, owned a black stallion, and Max Fitton, his ranch hand, rode his own young mare to work every day, so Star and Oscar weren't completely friendless. Checking that there was fresh water and oats, Sophia spoiled the animals with an apple each. Enjoy your afternoon, sweethearts, she called, trudging across the rear lawns. Sophia hurried up the rear stone steps, glancing back at the expansive property behind her. What was she doing back home at 32 years old? She was finally starting her own business after years of an undergrad degree, an MBA, and followed by veterinarian school. Yet, here she was again, yanked back home at the whim of her grandmother. In fact, Granny had asked her to stay for several months. That little tidbit sank Sophia's heart straight to the bottom of their livestock well. Why, why, why? Maybe her grandmother really was ill. Sophia was determined to get a straight answer out of her. Hurrying through the rear flower gardens, the stone slabs of the patios glittered under the sun. The swimming pool with its deep blue waters looked cool and inviting. Too bad she didn't have time for a quick dip. It was so hot she was tempted to jump in with her clothes on. That wouldn't be sensible, of course. Sophia was the oldest daughter, the oldest grandchild, and cursed by a sense of obligation and duty. That was the only reason she was here. Her sisters almost never came home, not even for holidays. Skirting the rose garden situated behind a low gate, Sophia marched toward the archway that led to the smaller enclosed patio. The windows of the French doors were dark under the sunlight, and Sophia picked up her speed. After slipping through the mudroom door at the far end of the lawns, Sophia finally yanked off her dirty boots. When she plunked herself down on the stool, the silver pendant she'd received from her grandmother on her 16th birthday thumped against her chest. She stared at the purple amethyst birthstone in the center. Was the necklace for protection? Or part of the death curse itself? Nobody knew for certain, and Sophia had never dared to ask. It had become tradition as each of Lillian's granddaughters had their 16th birthday, but the other reasons were never voiced out loud. Every Ambrose male was long gone, and she and her sisters didn't dare take a chance on a long-term relationship with anyone, unless her twin sisters far away at Smith College in Massachusetts were lying about their single life. She really should call her sisters more often. The Pendants of Protection, the Ambrose sisters' nickname for them, was a subject nobody brought up in an open discussion, let alone have a heart-to-heart -heart talk about. The fears, even if they were irrational, were better left buried. It was an unspoken pact between them all. Perhaps the family curse needed to be ignored once and for all. A stupid superstition. It couldn't be real. That only happened in horror movies. Even so, neither Sophia or any of her sisters ever took the pendants off. Because they didn't want to be responsible for someone else to die. Good grief. We're a superstitious bunch, Sophia muttered as she washed her hands in the sink and hung her cowboy hat on a hook. Every time she was tempted to unclasp the necklace and leave it in her jewelry box, a sickening niggle of fear would run down her throat and settle in her stomach. It might be superstition, but the deaths of all male members of the Ambrose family were definitely real. Running her fingers through her wind-tangled hair to banish her dark thoughts, Sophia definitely needed a shower before the lawyer arrived. Speeding through the laundry room, 
Sophia paused to grab a cold soda in the large modern kitchen that had been newly remodeled. Hanging brass pots and pans kept watch over sparkling white and rose-veined granite countertops. Passing through the intersection of hallways where crystal chandeliers hung overhead, Sophia jogged through the spacious foyer that rose three stories high. Windows showered sunlight over the curving stairs to the upper bedrooms. Beyond the foyer lay the drawing room, library, dining room, and morning room, with pristine white French doors that opened onto the rear patios and gardens. It had been many years since she'd lived here, for more than a few days at a time, or during breaks between college semesters, but old memories flooded Sophia with startling clarity. Images ran through her mind of the times she and her five younger sisters played hide-and-seek throughout the house, or slid down the smooth banister of the grand foyer. Sophia's favorite pastime was to race up and down the spiral staircase to the lookout on the roof. She'd missed this old house more than she wanted to admit to anyone, least of all her fickle mother Poppy or her grandmother. Lillian wanted something from her, and Sophia knew deep in her gut that she would probably give in and do whatever her grandmother wanted her to. As she took the staircase steps, two at a time, to the second floor, Lillian was coming out of the master suite, dressed in a crisp dark green dress that swished around her calves. Her silver hair had been freshly combed and sprayed, and her favorite Prince Machabelli perfume wafted in the air. She looked like a television commercial, the epitome of a Texas oil company owner with a few million in the bank, although Sophia really had no idea what the estate was actually worth. Good afternoon, Granny, she said, hurrying to get to the shower. Lillian lifted an eyebrow at her rough appearance. Mr. Gentry is due to arrive at any moment. I thought you'd be ready and waiting. I lost track of time. You know how much I've missed my rides on Star. Her grandmother's frown turned to a thin smile. She ran a tight ship and hated for meetings to begin even five minutes late. Star and Oscar have missed you too. It was another small dig to pressure Sophia into staying at Ambrose forever. Don't guilt me, Granny. I hope you will be ready to meet Mr. Gentry at the door, Sophia. I shall be in the drawing room. Once in her bedroom, Sophia threw off her dirty shirt, slithered out of her jeans, and peeled off her socks, shoving them down into the laundry basket. The hot shower felt heavenly, especially washing the dust from her hair. It only took a quick blow-dry with a good hairbrush to frame her hair around her face with wispy bangs, while the rest draped in waves below her shoulders. Face powder, mascara, and a light pink lipstick would have to do. Gold studs in her ears paired with gray slacks and a red blouse worked nicely. It would be great to go clothes shopping with her best friend Janine, a miracle worker when it came to fashion. It had been too long since she had added anything new to her wardrobe. Sophia descended the stairs, just as the housekeeper, Mrs. Beatrice O'Connor, was coming through from the kitchen. Hey, Mrs. B., how are you? Last time I was home, you were in Alabama visiting your grandchildren. The woman had worked for her grandmother ever since Lillian's husband, Sophia's grandfather, had died in a peculiar drowning accident at the age of 40 while fishing trout in the stream way back in 1971. Lillian had once told Sophia that Richard Jacob Millet had inexplicably fallen into the creek when his line caught under the boulders during the spring high-water levels and he was trapped under the rocks. The story always gave Sophia shudders. Good afternoon, Miss Sophia, Mrs. B said in her soft southern lilt. I've got a tray of pastries and a service of tea for the lawyer meeting. I was bringing it in for you to serve, but your grandmother asked if I would attend the meeting. I don't understand why a mere housekeeper should be with the family during a lawyer meeting. If I'm in error, please set me straight. Granny does want you there, Sophia confirmed. She told me herself this morning. Mrs. B. tisked her tongue. I'm just a housekeeper. Doesn't make a lick of sense. Sophia gave her a gentle smile and a quick hug. You're much more than a housekeeper. You're part of the family. So many times you were like a mother to all of us girls when Poppy was off getting married for the fourth or fifth time. Don't be talking bad about your mama. Mrs. B. said sternly. 
She's still your mother and deserves respect. Sophia widened her eyes and stuck her hands on her hips. Don't give me any sass now, young lady. I see that look of rebellion in your eyes. You see, Sophia said, my sisters and I needed you, and we all love you. The housekeeper shook her head and wiped her hands down her house dress. Don't get me started, Miss Sophia, or I'll be blubbering the rest of the day. But I am thinking of making myself scarce during the meeting. That will get us both in trouble. We'll soon know the mysteries of Ambrose Estate, she joked. Or should we think of it as granny secrets? Mr. Max and Mr. Cold are already in the drawing room, per Mrs. Ambrose's request, the housekeeper said. I made them clean their boots and change into good shirts. Perfect, Sophia said, inwardly wondering why the estate foreman and their head ranch hand had also been summoned to this meeting. Sometimes her grandmother could be so mysterious. Were long-lost cousins going to appear through the front door next? It turned out that Mrs. B and the ranch hands weren't the only ones from Ambrose Estate who had been invited. When Sophia entered the stately, old-fashioned drawing room, she shook hands with Mr. Blair Score, the tall and imposing head of the board of Ambrose Oil Company. Off to one side, almost hiding behind the double doors, was her grandmother's chauffeur, William Shelton. Hello, Shelton. Isn't it your day off? Sophia asked with a smile. When Lillian Ambrose calls, Shelton said, leaving the statement unfinished as he returned her smile with a grin of his own. It was a long-running joke between Sophia and her sisters and the household staff. We all come running. Not two seconds later, Lillian was at Sophia's elbow, dragging a good-looking man in his late thirties with her. Sophia, may I present Mr. Daniel Gentry, our solicitor? Mr. Gentry's brown eyes rested on Sophia's face, his haircut obviously done by a good barber, and his gray suit immaculately pressed. It's a pleasure to meet you, Miss Ambrose, he said. I've heard so much about you from your grandmother. I bet you have, Sophia said, knowing her grandmother only too well. Daniel Gentry was not their 65-year-old lawyer of the last 40 years. Please excuse the grime under my fingernails, I'm practically one of the ranch hands around here. Mr. Gentry chuckled. <laughs> you must ride then. Yep. And I have the calluses to prove it. She heard her grandmother harumph next to her, probably annoyed by her unladylike vocabulary. What happened to your old lawyer? She teased her grandmother. Did you fire him? Sophia wouldn't put it past her. Of course not. He finally retired and Daniel is his nephew. He's been part of the firm for the last five years. You're not home enough to know these things. Sophia lifted her eyes to Daniel Gentry's and found his gaze focused on her face. A tiny tingle shot up her spine. It had been a long time since a man close to her age had spent more than 30 seconds giving her an admiring look. How long have you worked for your uncle, she asked. Ever since law school. Our office is located in the woodlands, he said referring to the beautiful suburb of Houston. Sophia nodded, silently mourning over the vet clinic she wanted to purchase located in the same city. Yes, I drove up from there yesterday. Perhaps Daniel Gentry didn't realize she'd grown up here. Sophia decided to give him a pass and refrained from making a sardonic comment. Not that she liked being snarky, but sometimes the words just flew out of her mouth before she could stop them. Her sister Lauren liked to accuse Sophia of purposefully being ornery in order to put men off from getting too interested, that she was afraid of dating or men in general, which was completely silly and unwarranted. Serious involvement with a man meant death, as Lauren was well aware. You're one to talk, Sophia had once told her. I've watched you run from every man within a hundred miles. No, she amended. You don't run from them until they're head over heels in love with you, and then you drop them like a hot potato, as if Lauren was trying to hurt every man who showed an interest in her. Sophia had immediately apologized. It wasn't a fair accusation because male relationships were the same for all the Ambrose sisters, even Emma and Amelia, except their twin sisters, Kendra and Caitlin, who never took the curse very seriously so far across the country. 
Those two had just turned 23 and recently spent their spring break jet-setting with all the party animals of the world in Cancun. When Sophia glanced up again, she found the lawyer studying her curiously. She really needed to stop going off on wild tangents in her mind. Maybe she'd been single for too long and was turning into a spinster with awkward social habits. Sophia had been single in every possible way, ever since Brett Anderson, whom she'd dated during grad school, had been killed. Sophia's guilt was so intense, she couldn't even look Brett's mother in the eye at his funeral. Chapter 2 Blinking back the sting of emotion in the back of her throat, Sophia forced herself to smile. Are we ready to begin? She asked Mr. Gentry and her grandmother. I think you've gathered a room full of deadly, curious people today. This will be very simple and straightforward, Lillian assured her, straightening her shoulders. Sophia lowered her voice. Granny, did you invite my sisters to this? It seems like we should all be here if this is truly your official will that is being read and witnessed. Of course, I sent them personal invitations, but all five declined for various reasons. Sophia figured they would. The Ambrose women were not big into family reunions. And my mother? Your mother should have arrived an hour ago, but as usual, she is tardy. We shall begin without her, Mr. Gentry. Her grandmother took the lawyer's proffered arm, and they made their way up the rows of plushy chairs lined in front of an oak table that Max and Shelton had arranged in the drawing room for the meeting. Mr. Gentry seated Lillian in the wing chair next to the table, and the rest of the attendees shuffled awkwardly into seats, questions in their eyes. Mrs. B gave Sophia a smile of encouragement when they caught eyes, although the housekeeper remained in a chair in the back row. The refreshments had been laid out on a table in the rear of the drawing room. Before the lawyer could begin, the sounds of commotion came through the open doors leading into the foyer. A high-pitched woman's voice echoed in the air, along with the front door slamming open and closed. Then came the distinctive sound of luggage rolling across the glazed marble foyer floor. Even the crystal teardrops from the chandelier tinkled from the crash of the front door. Seconds later, the sound of a car engine roared to life its wheels grinding against the gravel driveway before speeding away. The bay windows were open at the front of the house, so everyone in the drawing room could hear every single sound. Lillian shot a pointed look at Sophia, who rose to her feet to ward off any unwanted visitors, but she was too late. Her mother, Poppy Ambrose, burst into the drawing room. Am I late? she cried. Are all the Ambrose secrets revealed? What did the will say? Sophia cringed as her mother, wearing a tight red dress that showed way too much cleavage, spread out her arms and gave a series of dazzling smiles to the occupants of the room. Oh dear, Brennan and Fitton, you're still at Ambrose Estate. How darling of you and so loyal. Sophia grimaced. Poppy sounded so condescending. She was her mother, but she had called her Poppy since she was thirteen when her mother married that awful Harold man, who pinched her cheeks and brought her a box of dolls, dolls she had stopped playing with at least a year earlier. Plus, the man smelled like vodka. That marriage lasted only a year, Poppy Ambrose's shortest marriage of them all, but perhaps all those brief marriages saved the lives of the husbands who had never had children with Poppy, which meant they had never lived at Ambrose Estate either. Sophia, darling, Poppy cried, throwing her arms around her eldest daughter's neck in a tight embrace. I've missed you so much, sweetheart. You simply must come and visit us in Maui. We have the most beautiful bungalow, 4,000 square feet with a waterfall in the backyard and a mere 10 yards to the most perfect beach you ever sank your toes into. Is that where you live now? Sophia asked. Poppy swatted her hand. You know perfectly well where Gordon and I live. I've sent you oodles of invitations over the past two years. Sophia remembered exactly one. Right after her mother and her fifth husband had been married in New Zealand by a tribal chief. I wasn't going to fly over to Maui while you were on your honeymoon, mother. Poppy's soft arms wrapped around her daughter again. You called me mother. 
You haven't called me that in at least a decade. Sophia disentangled Poppy's arms, hissing in a low voice. Let's talk later. We have a room full of people staring at us and waiting for the meeting to begin. You're right, sweetheart. You're always right. So smart. I get overcome with love when I see my beautiful girls. Let's stay up tonight and talk all night. Sure, Poppy. It was better to placate her than protest. Her mother would drink her favorite nightcap and be snoozing by 10 p.m. Sidling away while Poppy went to clutch her most recent husband and cuddle in an armchair with him, Sophia took a seat in the back row next to Mrs. B. How convenient that she shows up today of all days, Sophia muttered under her breath. Poppy always played the curse safe by staying away, except today she had come to collect her millions. Don't speak ill of your mother, sweetheart, said Mrs. B in a whisper. Sophia covered her mouth with one hand to smother the chirp of laughter that threatened to escape. Mrs. B was loyal to a fault. She and Poppy had a long history together, too. Mrs. B squeezed Sophia's hand with her warm one, and Sophia knew she understood all of her frustrations over her mother. Yes, ma'am, she said like a proper southern lady. She birthed six babies at great risk to herself. Say your prayers and forgive her. Is that admonishment scripturally based? Sophia murmured under her breath. Mrs. B stifled a chortle. You are bad, Miss Sophia. Now mind your manners. Mr. Gentry is standing up. When Daniel Gentry rose to his feet behind the big oak table, Sophia had to admit that the man looked nice in his sharply pressed suit. Once again, Sophia wondered if her grandmother was hiding some kind of terminal illness. This meeting seemed odd, and the timing was completely off. Sophia got the strangest feeling that they were all play-acting a role for her grandmother, as if the meeting had been staged. Doesn't the reading of one's will occur after a person dies? She muttered behind her hand. Quick, say a prayer, or the good Lord will take Mrs. Ambrose tonight. Mrs. B, I'm not superstitious. The woman lifted her eyebrows, giving Sophia a look that spoke volumes. Okay, okay, Sophia admitted. We're all superstitious, to a fault. Daniel Gentry's eyes suddenly caught hers, and Sophia's heart jumped into her throat. But the man slid his gaze off her face almost as quickly. Perhaps she'd imagined it. Mr. Gentry was the right age, tall enough, handsome enough, it had been too long since she'd seen a man like Daniel Gentry in her immediate sphere. Most were either too young, too old, or altogether not her type. What was her type? She had never really figured that out because she eventually pushed every interested man away, terrified that on the next nightly news, a tragic accident, fatal flu, or hurricane would have snuffed out the man's life. When the room settled into quiet, Mr. Gentry pulled out a black leather folder which contained a neat stack of papers. My name is Daniel Gentry, and I'm with Gentry and Lowman Attorneys at Law. As Mrs. Lillian Ambrose's lawyer, I'm here today at her request regarding Ambrose's estate and her final will and wishes regarding the final settlement of the estate. You are her family and closest friends or estate personnel. I knew it. Sophia heard Poppy hiss in a whisper to her husband. Sophia shifted while Colt ran a finger under his collar, looking quite uncomfortable. A blush rose up Max's young face. Mrs. B sat quietly, but she was twisting her fingers together. Even if Granny had known these people for decades and trusted them implicitly, it might not have been the best idea to have them here at her will reading. Wills were so very private especially when Granny was healthy as a horse. She was healthy as a horse, wasn't she? Sophia tried to catch her grandmother's eye, but Lillian didn't see her, or she was ignoring her granddaughter. Sophia wouldn't put it past her. Holding herself still, she tried to focus, gazing at the pretty blue handkerchief in Mr. Gentry's front suit pocket. He cleared his throat, and his eyes latched onto hers again. I could bore you with lots of legalese and details, but I'm going to make this very short and simple per Mrs. Ambrose's request. Lillian spoke up from her chair. It's better to have it all out in the open. 
I hate secrets, and I detest families who fight and argue or litigate a will. I strictly forbid you all from that. I decided that before I'm ill and incapacitated or drop dead one day, I would have Mr. Gentry and his father draw up the final documents. They have been signed, witnessed, and notarized, and the will is in the process of being filed with the state of Texas. Poppy said, Now, Mother, you won't drop dead. You're being silly. Everyone has to die sometime, Lillian said without batting an eyelash. Mr. Gentry took a breath, as if deciding whether to comment on the matriarch's proclamation, then decided not to. Daniel Gentry went up a notch in Sophia's estimation, despite the dread rising in her stomach. Mr. Gentry raised his voice to speak in an authoritative tone. Very good. There will be time for questions at the end if anything is unclear. The Ambrose Estate Trust and Holdings Company will continue with standard procedures. The board and trustees of Ambrose Oil Company will also continue as per current Texas state law and federal corporate laws, including those exclusionary ones reserved for oil companies. Mrs. Poppy Ambrose Miller and her six daughters, Sophia, Lauren, Emma, Amelia, Kendra, and Caitlin Ambrose, will each have their monthly stipends raised from $3,000 apiece to $5,000 apiece with the remaining bulk of Lillian Ambrose's current personal holdings to be divided evenly among the seven upon her death. The exact amount at this time is confidential. Mrs. Ambrose has also deemed to bestow gifts to her employees as well. To Mrs. Beatrice O'Connor, who has been with Mrs. Ambrose for nearly 50 years, the sum of $500,000 pay out to begin in monthly increments immediately. Oh, Mrs. Ambrose, I never, Mrs. B stammered. It was the first time Sophia had ever heard her at a loss for words. Lillian rose to her feet, placing a steadying hand on the table. Think of it this way. I've been adding to your 401k all these years. You deserve it, and more. Being a part of all your lives has been one of the greatest joys and blessings of my life. The housekeeper wiped at her eyes with a handkerchief. Sophia reached out to press a hand against the woman's arm, and Mrs. B added, You are a darling, sweet Sophia. You all are. My sisters and I wouldn't have grown up half as well without you. Mr. Gentry continued, To Mr. William Shelton, the sum of $300,000, pay out to begin in monthly increments immediately with a lump sum at the passing of Mrs. Lillian Ambrose. To Mr. Colt Brennan, and Mr. Max Fenton, the sum of $200,000, pay out the same as the previous annuities. The other seasonal ranch hands will each receive sums of $10,000. Identical sums are also bequeathed to the household maid and the part-time cook currently employed. The biggest change is hereby announced, Mr. Gentry said, pausing for a moment to let that sink in while Sophia gulped and tightened her fists against the seat of her chair. Mrs. Lillian Ambrose is relinquishing her role on the board of directors of Ambrose Oil Company and appointing her eldest granddaughter, Sophia Isabella Ambrose, in her stead. Sophia Isabella Ambrose will also inherit the Ambrose Estate land holdings, the cattle stock, the Ambrose Estate manor house, as well as the authority to make decisions about the current oil wells and any future wells or holdings. There was a sudden ringing in Sophia's ears. The drawing room spun as if she were drunk while a thousand thoughts bombarded her brain. A feat to be sure, since she didn't drink at all. This couldn't be happening. Please, no. Her grandmother was giving her everything. Not her mother, not any of her sisters, Not even Emma, who was an archaeologist and adored old houses and wills and family drama. Sophia's lips opened to speak, to protest. But nothing came out, only a weak series of mewlings. Mrs. B placed a warm arm around her shoulders. You are the perfect choice, sweetheart. You were raised here while your sisters weren't. You love this place. I predict that you will run Ambrose's state magnificently. 
Sophia gave the older woman a weak smile while her brain shrieked protests and her ears roared as if the world had just exploded. Mr. Gentry was speaking again, but she was having a hard time comprehending what he was saying. Of course, there are many small details. Small? Sophia thought incredulously. That was the word he chose to use. And many questions, I'm sure. For now, there's nothing for any of you to worry about. Over the next few months, I'll be drawing up all the legal paperwork and meeting with Mrs. Ambrose, as well as Miss Sophia, to sign over the ownership of Ambrose Estate. A smattering of applause broke out around the room, and Sophia lifted her head, certain she looked like a deer in the headlights. This was real. She had no control of her own destiny any longer. As much as she loved Ambrose Estate, she would be stuck here for the rest of her life, which meant that if she lived to be 90 years old, that was 60 years from now. It was nice to know her grandmother trusted her so completely, but Sophia also knew, deep in her gut, that she was wholly and irrevocably stuck at Ambrose for the rest of her life. Chapter 3 The refreshments were served a few minutes later, and Sophia played hostess while her grandmother smiled approvingly. Lillian Ambrose was getting exactly what she wanted. Sophia wagged a finger at her from across the room, giving her an outraged glare, a glare she had perfected during her freshman year in high school, whenever Granny was being especially obnoxious or outrageously strict. Sophia wanted to burst into laughter and then burst into tears. Taking over the running of the estate would assure that she was isolated. What did she know about being a CEO of a large corporation either? Pretty much nothing, even with an MBA in her pocket. Across the room, her mother, Poppy, burst into a gale of silly laughter. She hung onto Gordon's arm like a teenager while he gazed down at her adoringly. Two 60-year-old people in love was enough to make her gag a little, mostly because it was her mother. Seriously, five marriages? It was infuriating while none of her daughters had a single husband among them. What about us? Sophia growled under her breath while she fixed a small plate of the little cakes and hors d'oeuvres Mrs. B had prepared. The silver platters were nearly empty now. Being stuck out here would mean her chances to marry and raise a family had dropped drastically, if not completely. Except, Sophia had been avoiding men for years. Oh, she met friends when country dancing flirted, a few dates here and there, a few kisses on the doorstep, but eventually her evasive personality affected any potential relationship. The family curse was always lurking in the back of her mind. Watch out, Mrs. B muttered in Sophia's ear. Here comes that handsome lawyer fellow. What? Sophia whirled. Daniel Gentry was on his way back for more food. Didn't have lunch today. Can I beg for another one of those amazing sandwiches? He asked with a disarming grin. She loaded up his plate again. I'm sorry my grandmother caused you to miss one of your three square meals today. My own fault. Got behind in my work. Actually, I'm perpetually behind. <laughs> Probably comes with the territory of a busy law firm. He popped a ham and cheese croissant bite into his mouth. Did you make these? They're delicious. Nope. The amazing Mrs. B did. Please take the last of them with you. I couldn't. Yes, you could, Mrs. B told him, bustling off to get a takeaway bag for him. Have another cookie, Sophia said, while she topped off his glass of lemonade. Thank you. Now I can get back to the office and work another couple of hours. Sounds brutal, Mr. Gentry. Isn't five o'clock quitting time? He laughed and then added, <laughs> Please call me Daniel. Mr. Gentry sounds like my father. So, Sophia, you seem pretty calm about today's meeting. I suppose your grandmother prepared you for it? Sophia laughed with the irony of his assumption. <laughs> uh, not at all. Lillian Ambrose can be quite secretive. I had no idea until this morning that lawyers were showing up today. At least there's only one of me, he said with a smile. I'm staggered by the will. I hadn't given the fate of Ambrose's estate much thought. I've been busy setting up my own business. 
My sisters and I have always said that our grandmother will live to celebrate her hundredth birthday, so her will, bequeathing her assets, and all of that was a million miles away from today. I apologize for the sudden shock. Be assured that I will help you through the transition. I'll attend the first board of directors meeting with you as your representative, once it's all official. Signed, sealed, and delivered, Sophia said, trying to make light of her whirling brain. You got it, Daniel said, smiling down at her again. His eyes never left hers, even when Mrs. B handed him his crisp white lunch bag of the leftover refreshments. Thank you, Sophia said, realizing a moment later that the drawing room had emptied and it was only herself and Daniel Gentry still standing inside. Had everyone left them alone on purpose? I'll be in touch soon, he said warmly, his pleasant smile even warmer. May I call you if I have questions? Sophia gave him a sidelong look. I don't know if I can answer them, but I'll try, considering I'm the one with a thousand questions. The attorney shook her hand with a firm, dry grip. He was nice, and despite her weakness for cowboys on horses, a sharp suit on a tall man always caught her eye. When Sophia let him out the front door, she was more convinced than ever that Mr. Daniel Gentry had definitely been flirting with her. The rest of the afternoon, she spent fuming while her grandmother took a nap. Poppy and Gordon took off in their rented BMW for dinner. Sophia was glad, since she didn't think she could make small talk. At the moment, she wanted to strangle both her grandmother and her mother. Surely Poppy knew that Lillian was going to bestow the entire estate on her daughter and approved of it. Those two can sure keep a secret, she muttered. Mrs. B came around the corner of the upper hallway as Sophia descended the stairs. Miss Sophia, your grandmother is asked to dine in her room tonight. I've got a hot plate of food for you in the kitchen. She's afraid I'm going to yell at her, right? Now, now, you don't know that. Mrs. B chided gently. She's a bit tuckered out from the day. She did say that she'd see you after dinner in the den. The sun was low on the horizon when Sophia took her dinner out to the lounge chairs next to the swimming pool. She should jump in and cool herself off, literally and mentally. Mostly she was numb, unable to fully process the sudden changes in her life. Splashes of oranges and reds blazed underneath low-hanging clouds as the sun set. When she returned to the house, she washed off her plate and cutlery before stowing them in the dishwasher. The lights in the house were now dimmed, rooms dark while the exterior lights blazed across the grounds outdoors. Sophia wandered the parlor and the library, looking at it in an entirely new light. She would live here for the rest of her life, well... That probably wasn't an absolute requirement, but the Ambrose Mansion was something she'd never fully get away from. Even if she ran away to Europe and lived in a chic apartment and ate foie gras with suave Frenchmen while they drank bottles of wine at cute little cafes, why hadn't she protested in the drawing room? Why hadn't she stood up to her grandmother and refused? Because Sophia didn't do scenes. She was too well-mannered too obedient as the oldest granddaughter. Granny had put her into a corner without any hint of warning. Where's my Texas backbone for crying out loud? Sophia sputtered when she charged through the main house and entered the hallway that connected to the older part of the mansion. This was the house her great-great-grandfather had originally built when he bought the property more than a hundred years ago. She hadn't been here in a long time, but now that she was the owner... Sophia wanted to see if anything had changed since she was in high school. Her memories were of old, creaky floors and shadowy rooms, parlors and a music room, a lovely library, and even a small ballroom for parties and dances, wardrobes and bureaus, and antique Victorian furniture in every room, while heavy velvet drapes puddled on the floor to show off a family's wealth in the Victorian era. Sophia didn't plan to explore all the various rooms tonight although she needed to take stock of what was there if she officially owned the entire house now. She should hire a contractor to give her a report on the stability of the old house, the foundation, plumbing, electricity, as well as the roof. She wasn't sure Lillian had done much to it in a couple of decades. 
Then there was the oil field in the middle of the ranch. What was the current production? How old were the wells? Were they drilling new ones? The number of things she needed to learn was overwhelming. When she halted a few feet inside the door that connected both the old and new houses, Sophia said, I'll think about that tomorrow, feeling like Scarlett O'Hara. Standing there, her skin began to tingle from the atmosphere. There was only one problem with getting from the newer part of the house into the far reaches of the original house. She had to walk through the musty high ceilinged corridor called the Hall of the Dead, named by Lauren and herself when they were kids. The original marble floors lay dusty and scuffed. The walls of the hallway were paneled in carved mahogany, and the ceiling rose twelve feet high with a row of high windows that let in daylight. When it was daylight... At night, the Hall of the Dead felt like a tomb despite the scattered starlight seen through the glass windows above. Even though this part of the mansion received little use or attention, Mrs. B never neglected to light the fat candles along the walls of the hallway every night, as per Lillian's orders. At least, that's what Poppy had once told her daughters in a morbid tone of voice. Sophia studied the flames flickering in their bronze sconces between the framed family portraits and photographs. When she and Lauren were in their early teens, they'd invite their friends to the old part of the mansion for slumber parties. Curled up with blankets and pillows, they'd tell spooky stories in front of the old parlor fireplace until they all ran back to the bright lights of the main house, screaming their heads off like silly twelve-year-olds. Goosebumps ran down Sophia's neck, like a thousand cold chills. You're not a kid any longer, she chided herself, trying to ward off the eerie feeling of the hallway. Stepping forward, she peered into the first grouping of portraits. Every picture and painting were of Ambrose family members who had already died. The pictures were a timeline through the centuries. Her great-great-grandfather and great-great-grandmother, George Frederick Ambrose II, and Margaret Florence Ambrose, gazed at Sophia wearing sober expressions neither frowning or smiling, which seemed to be the style of that era. Margaret was wearing full corsets and a long black dress, perhaps deep blue. Her hair in the fashion of the Gibson girl, thick locks swept around her face in a romantic style, tendrils of hair falling on either side of her high cheekbones and pretty mouth. Her great-great-grandmother was beautiful, and George Frederick quite a handsome rogue, too, a twinkle sparkled in his eyes along with a tiny lift of his lips and a smile he might have been attempting to tamp down, because there was a look of trepidation in Margaret's face. Sophia wished she could know what their thoughts were when they hired a photographer to come all the way out to the property to take professional photographs in the parlor of the Ambrose mansion. Next was a collection of George and Margaret's children, Lillian's parents, Walter Charles Burton and Helen Elizabeth Ambrose, in the late 1920s, although Helen hadn't succumbed to the popular bobbed hair quite yet. The next portrait had been done by a commissioned artist, and it was one of Sophia's favorites, her grandparents, Lillian Marie Ambrose and Richard Jacob Millay, on their wedding day in 1952. Granny was stunning in a satin dress with a six-foot train, high collar, and jeweled veil, her dark hair shiny in a style reminiscent of World War II. Sophia was reasonably sure her grandfather had served in the Marines during the end of World War II. He survived the war, only to die 19 years later, at the age of 40 when Poppy was 12. A bevy of photographs featuring Poppy took up the next several feet of wall space, all at various ages, including high school proms and formal college dances, her arm tucked into the elbow of a different boy in each one. Sophia's mother was a player, even back then, her mother's specialty was dazzling every male within ten feet. With a few years of experience behind her, Sophia studied her mother and realized how attractive she was, a big flirt and a free spirit of the 1960s and 70s. No wonder she'd been married five times. Sophia's steps slowed as she came to the hardest part of the Hall of the Dead. The next photographs were of her Uncle Roger, Poppy's older brother, who had died of a sudden stroke at the age of 28 while visiting the estate. His widow, who was pregnant at the time, went back to Austin and never returned. Thankfully, she had borne a daughter. Of course, there was no documented curse, but too many Ambrose men had died over the decades. Too many sons and uncles and husbands, 
all of them, before they should have. Which was another point scored for Poppy's current husband, Gordon. Perhaps the man needed to leave Ambrose as fast as he could if he wanted to stay alive. She certainly did not want to be in charge of a funeral over the course of the next week. Her favorite collection of photographs was Sophia's father, Randall Aaron Chambers, who hailed from Baton Rouge. Poppy had met him in college and fell madly in love with the dashing Navy pilot. Randall became a Blue Angels pilot, his dream, until he died tragically in a mid-air crash during an air show in Houston when Sophia was six years old, Lauren three, and Emma a toddler. Sophia's memories of him were just as shadowy as the Hall of the Dead. She could only recall a tall, dashing man in his uniform, laden with hanging medals, who teased and swung them around the backyard. Sophia still had the doll he'd given her from one of his layovers in Germany. Emotion choked her throat. It wasn't fair not to have a father, especially when her mother spent the rest of Sophia's childhood entering into serial marriages. After Randall's funeral, Poppy left Ambrose's estate and rarely returned. She went on to marry again and again, bearing three more daughters but rarely visiting the estate, although Lauren and Emma remained with her mother while Sophia wanted to continue living with Granny. The other two handsome men with collections of photographs were Amelia's father and the father of Kendra and Caitlin on their wedding days with Poppy. She and Lauren and Emma were bridesmaids and flower girls. Those days felt a little surreal now. A flash of lightning suddenly illuminated the corridor, followed by a crack of thunder that rolled across the night sky. Where did that come from? Sophia burst out loud, reaching out a hand to steady herself on the wall. Staring through the upper windows, she could see that a storm had moved in with a swiftness and ferocity that was surprising. Black clouds rolled across the sky in a typical Texas spring storm. Lightning and thunder were quickly followed by rain and hail jangling against the roof, making an ungodly racket for about three minutes and then ceasing as fast as it had all begun. The thunder and lightning continued its rampage north. Not three seconds later, her grandmother's voice spoke behind her. He was a handsome devil, wasn't he? Sophia's heart leaped into her throat. Granny, don't sneak up on me like that. I assumed you heard the door creak. Not with all that thunder and lightning going on. When I was younger, I vowed never to come to the Hall of the Dead at night or during a storm. Sophia paused. Now that I think about it, you did give me warning. I can usually smell your perfume from across the house. Don't be impertinent, young lady. And for your information, the corridor is named the Hall of Memory. Lillian's blonde hair was now silvery gray, but she still wore it in her signature chignon twist, coiffed to perfection. At the moment, she was wearing a flowing robe, ready to retire for the night. But the woman would never be caught dead wearing only a nightgown. So, you found your way here, her grandmother mused. It didn't take long. This is only your second day back home. Sophia gave a short laugh. <sighs> and what a stunning couple of days it's been, Granny. There's nothing like getting smacked in the face by a brick. That comment makes absolutely no sense. I gave you everything, my dear. Granny, you've basically doomed me to this estate forevermore. All my dreams are gone. What dreams, darling? Sophia blinked. Her grandmother's dismissal of her feelings made her ire rise even further. Don't pretend like you don't know nothing about my university degrees. The vet clinic I was about to purchase. Of course I know all about it. I'm not senile yet. You have plenty of money now if you still want to open a vet clinic. You could build your own building, in fact. I suppose you could also hire other doctors and technicians to help because you will need to be at Ambrose at least a few times a week, as well as the oil company offices. You just made my point, Granny. You have no empathy for what you've done to me. You didn't even warn me. You didn't even ask if I wanted all of this. Of course you want it, my dear. You love Ambrose Estate. You always have. You love this place more than anyone else I know. You grew up here with me. It's your home. Fresh words burst from Sophia's lips. Maybe that was a mistake. Perhaps 
Poppy should have insisted I stay with her instead of letting you take me away from her. It was her grandmother's turn to suck in a breath, but her expression didn't change. Not much rattled Lillian Ambrose. Sophia, I love you as if you were my own child. After your father's death, you mourned him dreadfully. Most of your memories with him were in this house, since he and your mother spent their married years right here in the North Wing with you and Lauren and Emma. But mother had a house in town. One she bought after Randall died. Why would she do that? She was grieving, struggling with depression. And then she and I had a falling out over where to send you girls to school and where to live. She and I always had a bit of a volatile relationship. She was such a rebellious teenager and young adult. No kidding, Sophia said dryly. She bought that small house in town with her monthly royalties and covered the mortgage and took you and your sisters away from me. We had a terrible argument about it. I didn't think she could handle going back to work, even if it was part-time, and three small daughters who were lost and missing their daddy. A traitorous tear rolled down Sophia's face and she brushed it away. She didn't remember a lot about her father, but she always remembered the love between them, the picnics and outings to the naval base. Staring at his picture now, she realized how handsome he was with his broad shoulders and black hair. Her grandmother's voice softened. You begged me to come back home, to your real bedroom, your real home. I can still hear your voice in my head. Lauren was so much younger that she just wanted her mommy. I offered to take you to ease her burden. Plus, I missed you girls dreadfully. My only grandchildren. When Randall died, I didn't think I'd ever have any more. The portraits and photographs up and down the hallway pressed on Sophia's chest, as if squeezing her heart into a hard knot that never went away. All of the Ambrose women were damaged by grief and loss. You have more grandchildren than just me and Lauren and Emma? Yes, in that I was fortunate. And I love all you girls. Was Lillian's voice quivering a little? Sophia stared at her in the flickering candlelight, wishing she could know her grandmother's thoughts. <clears throat> Even if your sisters don't come home very often. Lillian cleared her throat, assuming her role as matriarch of Ambrose Estate once more. Firm and resolute. You are the only one that's fully capable, with your MBA, I might add, to handle the ranch with the oil company and the contents of this old house. And you are the eldest grandchild. And you're the only one that actually grew up right here. So your ties are even stronger. All of her points were valid, but Sophia didn't want to admit that she was right. She was currently in shock and rethinking her entire life's plan. It's not fair, she added, feeling like a sullen six-year-old again. It's your destiny. I feel it in my bones, her grandmother said soberly. There are secrets this old house has been keeping for more than a century, and you are the one who needs to find them and figure them out. What is that supposed to mean? I've always felt it, my dear, and you have too. The secrets are unspoken, but we all know about them. Like the elephant in the room everybody ignores. We don't talk about all the deaths, only male deaths, but there has to be a reason for them. Now you're talking superstitions, Sophia said, but her voice was weak. The fight was going out of her, and she was tired. It had been a long couple of days. All of the Ambrose deaths have reasons and explanations. Illness, accidents, nothing macabre or weird. Her grandmother lifted her shoulders in a small shrug. Perhaps. But why then? Have none of you six girls married? We haven't found the right man yet. You and Lauren are in your thirties now. The clock is ticking. And from what your mother has told me, you've all pushed away potentially good men, men with successful careers that come from good Texas families. Poppy doesn't know anything. She's filling your head with nonsense. Her grandmother abruptly changed gears. Mr. Daniel Gentry is a very nice man, 
the right age, handsome, well-educated. Granny, stop. Just stop. Is that why you had him come do the will today instead of his uncle? Are you trying to set me up? Is that what all of this is about? I cannot believe you. I'm so embarrassed. Give him a chance, sweetheart. Just stop, Sophia broke off. She had never disrespected her grandmother, and she didn't intend to start. But if she wasn't careful, her grandmother would run right over her. Lillian was good at railroading people. Please, Granny, she continued in a softer voice. I'm the one who is always expected to sacrifice, to live close to Ambrose, give up my career and life, never go off and travel, never live across the country like Lauren in California or the twins back east. My sisters are living their own lives, the lives they want to live. They aren't stuck here like I am, forever. Chapter 4 A hotbed of emotion streamed through her when Sophia spun on her heels and charged down the Hall of the Dead, leaving her grandmother behind while she raced back to the main house, up the curving staircase of the large foyer, past the two hallways branching off into the bedrooms and guest rooms. Next, she charged through the upstairs sitting room to a connecting reading room with soft sofas and deep armchairs. At the far end of the reading room was a narrow circular staircase. At the top of the stairs, there was a cupola with a door that opened outward to a lookout on the roof. The lookout was paved with bricks and enclosed by a wrought iron fence and entirely open to the sky overhead. The viewpoint had always reminded Sophia of the rooftop in Mary Poppins, where Admiral Boom kept his spyglass and cannon, wreaking havoc on the neighborhood with his hourly booms. At the Ambrose Mansion, there were only two chairs and a lounger for sunbathing when she and her sisters were teenagers. It was a place to have a private conversation, a place to get away from the house and collect oneself after an argument, or a place to have a good cry. Sophia hadn't been here in years. The last time she'd run up to the lookout was when she needed a good cry, Jag, after she broke up with Gary Fillmore the summer after her first year of college. They were getting too serious, and Gary had begun to hint that he wanted to meet her mother to propose. Sophia knew she was too young and had her own educational ambitions. Besides, Gary deserved a normal family, not her weird, rich oil family, not a family where every male died. Poppy sometimes mentioned the depression Lillian had gone through after losing her husband and son. The Ambrose matriarch had retreated from public life for at least a year. Then, two decades later, when her daughter lost her husband, Lillian reinforced her backbone of steel to help Poppy and her granddaughters through the tragic loss. No love was worth that kind of pain, nor could Sophia in good faith do that to someone if she truly loved them. Gary had been confused and hurt, of course. Sophia knew that her excuses sounded lame and stupid, but it was too hard to explain, and he wouldn't have believed her even if she tried. Sophia despised the Ambrose curse, hated it with a passion, that made her want to run to a deserted island and never come back. Would the curse go away if the house burned down? She was entertaining crazy thoughts, but it was a strange and intriguing question. Now she leaned back against the damp lounge chair and lifted her chin to the sky, which was now clearing from the sudden brief storm. Shallow puddles of rain lay in cracks and dips of the terrace bricks, while a silver crescent of moon fought to appear behind the black clouds. A cool breeze lifted the hair from her face. Closing her eyes, she tried to relax and put away all the worries and demands of Granny's will. And Daniel Gentry, and her fickle mother, and the life she was tied to forever. The strings like a noose around her neck. Sophia usually loved coming up here to get away for an hour or two, and the stone terrace with its cozy furniture and wraparound pretty fence made a perfect escape. She could get some perspective on her problems, but tonight, her escape didn't seem to be working. Her grandfather had built the lookout decades ago, and even though she had never known him, it made her feel closer to him, as if they had a little something in common to get away from bossy Lillian Ambrose. Perhaps her grandfather's and her uncle's and her father's spirits weren't really that far away, 
lay to rest as they were in the Ambrose family cemetery on the edge of the mansion grounds. Sophia had planned to visit the cemetery today, but her grandmother's will, with all its heavy burdens, was still too fresh and raw. Finally, she wrenched herself to a sitting position. I should go to bed. She had a lot to contend with tomorrow, least of all the deal she was in the middle of with the vet clinic. For the moment, she needed to call it off. For the next year, she had a thousand things to learn and decisions to make. That goal had to be suspended, perhaps permanently. Her tears had dried, but the weird burning sensation in her throat remained. That was strange. The burning sensation wasn't tears at all. There was a slight burning smell wafting on the air. She wondered if Mrs. B had burned something in the kitchen and had opened the windows down below her. More likely, one of their neighbors had been burning leaves on their property and the storm's wind had brought it this direction. It had to be that, because there was no sign of anything else. The next morning, Sophia woke early, suddenly, as if someone had shaken her out of a dreamless stupor. Jerking her eyes open, she sat up, but nobody was in her bedroom. Striding across the floor, she checked the door, still locked, as she'd left it when she returned from the Hall of the Dead and the rooftop lookout. The room was stuffy and turning warm already. Sophia lifted the window to let in fresh air and then gathered her things for a shower. Peeling off her summer nightgown, she suddenly smelled that burning odor again. Is the Hamilton family at it again? She said in exasperation, digging out her shampoo from her toiletry bag. She gave her luggage a smirk. I suppose I need to officially unpack now that I'm going to be here longer than a few days. Parting the curtains, she glanced out again. The morning was still and quiet. No nodding flowers or rustling grass. The Hamilton property was much too far away to smell piles of burning leaves. After breakfast, she had asked Shelton and Colt if the two men had seen anything unusual in the neighboring ranches. No, she couldn't ask Colt. The foreman was actually moving cattle today to fresh pastures off the ranch for the next week. Once she was dressed in jeans and sneakers, Sophia climbed the stairs to the lookout, turning in a slow circle to view ten miles in each direction. She couldn't see much past the trees along the stream, but strangely, the sky held the faintest haze of smoke. A burning tang made her cough, her throat closing up. That does it, she snapped. If the Hamiltons are burning refuse on our property line, I'm going to have to talk to them. Oh, the joys of ownership. Two minutes later, she had grabbed the pair of binoculars she had kept in the bureau for years and hurried back to the cupola once more. Sweeping the binoculars in every direction, Sophia spent a full five minutes studying the horizon. There was definitely smoke in the air, but closer to the eastern quarter of the property, which butted up against their northern neighbors, the Franklin Ranch. Saddling Star and searching on horseback would take too much time. Sophia grabbed the keys to her truck and took the stairs down to the kitchen, keeping hold of the binoculars and tucking her cell phone in the back pocket of her jeans. After sending a quick message to Max that she would be out riding the ranch this morning and to watch for her, her grandmother came out of the downstairs sitting room. Where are you going? I didn't even know you were up yet. Come have some breakfast. Besides, you can't go into town dressed in jeans. You're the owner of Ambrose Estate. You must look the part. Granny, Sophia said, trying not to laugh. This isn't the 1940s or 50s any longer, where women wore skirts and hats to go grocery shopping. Besides, I'm not going into town. I'm getting the truck and going out to drive the ranch, at least along the property lines. Have you noticed the burning smell outside? I keep my windows closed. Allergies, dear. Lillian Ambrose headed toward the kitchen, a menu in her hand for Mrs. B. When she turned around again, what burning smell are you talking about? It's stronger this morning. Plus, there's a bit of smoky haze on the skyline. Open the drapes in the house and see for yourself. I shall do that. If you aren't mistaken that the smell is from our very own kitchen. That's what I thought at first. But it's definitely outside. I'm not sure which direction. When Sophia opened the front door, her grandmother's voice stopped her again. I am glad you're speaking to me this morning, my girl. Why wouldn't I speak to you? I'll probably be miffed about the whole reading of the will yesterday for a long time to come and the rug you pulled out from underneath me. But it doesn't mean I don't care about Ambrose's estate or you. 
Her grandmother's expression turned into a smile. I knew I chose wisely. Sophia rolled her eyes. Go have your breakfast and save me some bacon. I plan to take a jaunt around the property and make sure there isn't any illegal burning going on in the vicinity. Jumping into the cab of her four-wheel drive Ford, Sophia revved the engine and backed out of the garage. She glanced at her Lexus in the next stall longingly. Maybe she would drive back home later. The round trip would take most of the day, but she hadn't packed much, thinking she was only here for two or three days. The roads were jutted and bumpy after the winter and spring storms. She'd have to get Colt to get some graders out here. Start making a list, she sang out loud. Heading east first, she stared at the Hamilton Ranch property line. No sign of anybody, let alone stacks of burning brush. Stopping briefly, she used the binoculars to check every mile or so. Nothing along the east or south. Shifting gears, she headed west, breaking hard when she came upon Max riding his horse. Dust clouded the window when she rolled it down and shouted to him. Max pulled up next to her when she spotted the cattle up ahead running, like running crazily across the meadows. Cows and steers rarely ran in such a frenzied manner. They were mostly lazy and stood around in small groups, eating or sleeping. What's happening? She shouted through the window. They're spooked by something, Max called back. I've called Colt. He's going to grab his sons and help me round them up and get them calmed down. At least they're headed to the creek. Water and shade will be good for them. We'll keep them down there while you finish inspecting the estate. Good idea, thanks. Here's Colt now, Max said, pointing behind her. Sophia hadn't even noticed the foreman behind her until now. He was catching up to her idling truck on horseback with two adult men beside him. Sophia couldn't remember Colt's son's names. It had been too many years since she'd met them. Sticking her arm out the window, she waved and then took the curve around the west side of the ranch. She'd call if she saw anything unusual. Maybe somebody had been camping on the property to the west and forgotten a campfire. Ranch work could be long and frustrating at times, but everything needed to be checked out. Her stomach growled. She should have grabbed a granola bar. Oh, this is my favorite part, Sophia sighed as she drove through the row of cottonwoods that formed a tunnel when she turned to head further north. This was the prettiest part of Ambrose Estate. The cottonwoods and elms and willows were huge now, more prominent than she remembered, 200 feet in the air with gnarly branches and wide trunks. The leaves of the trees touched the neighboring trees, as if linking arms to create a vibrant green corridor. Granny had told her that Sophia's great-great-grandfather had planted the Isle of Trees a hundred years earlier when they first bought the ranch. When Sophia emerged from the tree tunnel, the smoke in the air was definitely thicker, hovering now like a blanket across the horizon. And that's when she saw it. Oh no, Sophia cried, slamming on her brakes. The truck jerked her forward while she stared in shock. A mile to the north lay the sprawling Ambrose oil well field. One of the whales had caught fire and blown sky high, probably sometime last night. Angry red flames roared out of the well, spewing a furnace of orange 200 feet into the air. It was clearly out of control. In fact, Sophia could feel the heat blasting against the truck, and she flipped on the air conditioning, cranking it up high. The fire was burning up gallons of crude oil every second. It had probably been going on all night. How, Sophia said, getting out of the truck to watch for a moment. Vandalism? Nope, she said, answering her own question immediately. Lightning last night. She held one arm against her forehead, trying not to panic. Ambrose Estate had never had an oil fire in all these decades. Quickly, she punched the number for Colt. Brennan, she said, speaking loud over the fire's roar, even though it was still more than a mile ahead of her. Hear that? Yeah, I hear you, Miss Sophia, came the man's voice. The noise of agitated cattle was loud in the background. Getting these steers down to the water, wonder what spooked them. I know exactly what spooked them, Sophia said, nearly shouting into the phone. We got us an oil well fire, Colt, a big one. Chapter 5 Outskirts of Mosul, Iraq, near the Syrian border the phone rang in Gavin's makeshift desert office. His secretary was out getting lunch for his team, so he answered it. Besides, 
He was curious to get a long-distance call that had a United States code on the face of the satellite phone, and he recognized the state area code. Spencer Oil Fire Specialist, he said, glad it connected so quickly without having to go through a local switchboard out here in the boonies. My name is Sophia Ambrose, said the woman's voice, and I want to hire you. Uh, do you know who you're calling? Gavin said, leaning back in his squeaky desk chair. Frowning, he wondered how a woman from Texas got through. That you're calling a location in Iraq? I'm aware of that. Your answering service informed me and put me through. How soon can you be back in the United States? I have an emergency. My oil field is on fire. Gavin cocked his head and tried to hide his annoyance. This woman, whoever she was, was very demanding. Most people usually asked a long string of questions about Spencer oil fire specialists first, and then asked for help. He was leery of demanding customers, although he eventually showed up to help them out. There weren't that many companies who had the skill and specialized equipment to put out oil well fires. How did you get this number again? Gavin asked, frowning as he jotted a few notes with a pen. From your main office in Houston, the woman said calmly. She certainly cut the chatter and went straight to the point without hedging. He had to admit that he liked that. Where are you located? Gavin asked. Exactly. North of Houston, or is my Texas accent not strong enough? This woman was feisty. Are you with Shell, Conoco, Exxon, BP? I need a little more information, to put it mildly. We're a family-owned outfit. Ambrose Oil Company, north of the Woodlands, if you know where that is. Gavin tried not to roll his eyes at her insinuation and kept his cool. He was hot, sweaty, stinky, and hadn't showered in two days. The fires here in Iraq had been much more than the government had let on when his team agreed to fly over to the Middle East a month ago. Not to mention that ISIS fighters were lighting up rigs almost as fast as his company could put them out. And, not to mention... There were snipers in the hills that surrounded the oil fields. Getting killed while putting out a fire was not something he and his team had signed on for. Of course, some oil well fighters were killed while on the job. Putting out an oil fire was rated as one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Miss, whoever you are, I don't have time for your innuendo or sarcasm. My team is the best in the world, and we're out here fighting fires daily for the past month. But I don't have to explain that to you because we're not due to be home for another two weeks. Two weeks? That's not what your main office in Houston told me. If I wait two weeks, I may lose my entire field and my family's income. It was a story Gavin heard a lot, although privately owned family companies didn't often have big blazes. What did you say your name was? Sophia Ambrose. I'm the owner of Ambrose Estate, an oil company. If you're unavailable, perhaps you can direct me to another company who is a little more open to business. Gavin covered the phone's receiver and let out a low, irritated whistle. Mrs. Ambrose's personality had ratcheted up a notch on the scale of demanding and gutsy. She was now in irritating territory. Lady, he stopped, not wanting to be rude in how he addressed her. Mrs. Ambrose, I mean. You may call me Miss, she snapped. I assumed I was speaking with the owner of the company. If not, please put him on the line. Ah, oh, Gavin thought. A perpetually peeved spinster. It wasn't very charitable of him to think these things about someone he'd never met, but she was really getting on his nerves now. He took a breath and started again. I'm the owner and founder. We're the biggest and most successful oil firefighting company in the world. Now he was boasting, but there was something about her that made him want to show off his skills, both physically and mentally as far as shrewdness and success were concerned. The other oil firefighter companies are scattered around the country, he went on. You can call one of them, although you'll have to pay extra to get them to Texas. So why aren't they in Iraq fighting these fires? Why your company? Because I'm the best. And that's not bragging, ma'am, just a fact. When you've got as many fires out here as we've got, it's a massive undertaking. During the Gulf War in the early 90s, there were hundreds of oil rigs purposefully lit on fire by Al-Qaeda 
and it took two years to put them out with multiple teams working round the clock. That's impressive, Miss Ambrose said grudgingly. Are you telling me that you worked those fires 30 years ago? You've been in the business a long time now. I didn't personally work the Gulf War fires. My father did while working for one of the big oil companies. He brought his experience back home and started his own outfit. Later, he trained me. Been in business about more than 15 years now. Look, I'm swamped, and you happen to catch me in the office. I'm headed back out. Did you want to do a tentative retainer for when we get back? Mr. Spencer, I'm not sure you heard me correctly, Miss Ambrose said crisply. If I wait a month for you, all my oil is gone. We may be small, but my grandfather started Ambrose Oil Company in the 1950s. We have shareholders and a board that I have to consider. Over the last decade, we've been losing our oil field due to drying up wells. We can't afford to lose the rest of the rigs to fires. We're nothing like Exxon or BP. Gavin heard her take a deep breath, but let her get it all out of her system. He figured that was probably faster in the long run. Sir, I'm not sure who you are, but my oil field is in trouble and I'm getting desperate. Can you get your father on the line, please? I need to speak with someone who's in charge. I don't have time for this. It took all of Gavin's willpower not to slam the phone down. I am the boss. He said slowly and distinctly, I run the business now. My father has been gone five years. There was silence on the other end of the line, and Gavin wondered if she'd hung up. So, she had a board with shareholders. This wasn't a one-off that could wait or a well that could be redrilled. He changed tactics. Do you have an idea how the fire started? Lightning, last night, um, Sophia Ambrose paused, and Gavin thought there was a sudden hesitancy to her tone now. Mr. Spencer, I think we may have gotten off on the wrong foot, but it's difficult to discover that you're not 200 miles away, but thousands on the other side of the world. I'm not panicking yet, but getting close and I have 500 head of cattle to consider, too. Okay, you're a ranch as well as an oil company, Gavin stated with a sigh. Give me your number, and I'll talk to my team and see what we can do. I'll get back to you in a few days. Sophia Ambrose rattled off her number, impatience in her voice. If Gavin was correct, she probably had never seen an oil fire before. It usually scared the bejeebies out of people the first time. Oil fires were like a fire-breathing dragon shooting liquid flame straight into the sky. Gavin hoped the broken well wasn't close to the main house, but he didn't ask. He didn't want to panic her even further. After saying goodbye, he clicked off the phone just as she began to say something else, but it was too late. The connection was gone. Staring down at the paperwork on his desk, impatient to get back on site, the phone rang again. It was her again. Gavin let it ring three times before picking it up again. Yes, he practically barked. Mr. Spencer, Sophia Ambrose said, I don't know what your price range is or how you determine a price tag on your work, but I'll pay you what you're worth. I'm fair, and I know this won't be easy for either of us. What was that supposed to mean? Perhaps she didn't care for Gavin either after their tense telephone conversation. We don't come cheap, not by a long shot. But if I take the job, I'll do right by you. Meanwhile, can you email a few pictures to me of the rig that's on fire? I can better estimate what we're up against. Certainly, you'll have them within the hour. Gavin ran his hands through his hair. Sighing, he added his signature to the current paperwork. So, he was going to take a job from a prima donna, a rich Texan who complained a lot and probably never got her hands dirty. Most likely... This Sophia woman was 60 years old and criticized everything. Her oil field was perhaps her baby, and she had no children of her own. Well, Gavin didn't either. He wasn't married, never had been, and not even close. Who could meet women in a job like this? In his line of work, he could go weeks without even stumbling across a woman, except occasionally in a restaurant sitting with her husband or boyfriend. Ambrose estate, he said aloud, shaking his head. Sounds posh and haughty. 
Why did I agree to see her pictures and give her a bid? You're a fool, he told himself. And then, feeling guilty for being too judgmental, Gavin checked the caller ID and dialed her number. Miss Ambrose, he said when she picked up, I meant to give you a warning. Don't go near the fire. Stay at least half a mile away, or better yet, a couple of miles. No animals, no vehicles. A single spark can ignite another fire, or make the current one worse. An explosion could blow everyone and everything within a quarter of a mile into the atmosphere. Am I scaring you? Are you trying to frighten me? She asked heatedly. Yes. In fact, it's best if you evacuate your home until the fire can be put out. Evacuate, she echoed. That sounds extreme. How big is your property? 10,000 acres. The house is almost 10 miles from the oil fields. Oh, good. You should be fine. But stay away. I'll move the herd and warn my foreman, Sophia said, then cut off the connection. Fifteen minutes after hanging up the phone, Gavin heard his computer email ping. Sophia Ambrose had sent pictures, five of them, probably from her cell phone. The rig fire was gushing flames close to 200 feet in the air. Her concern was warranted. Sophia, S-O-F-I-A. He liked how she spelled her name, not the typical S-O-P-H-I-A spelling. She was probably from the same era as Sophia Loren, his mother's favorite actress. Gavin pictured Miss Ambrose with gray hair, thick hairspray and designer clothes that cost hundreds of dollars for a single silk blouse, designer handbags, ears dripping diamonds. It was easy to picture rich Texas women. They all had a look with their thick, picture-perfect makeup, and Sophia Ambrose was probably no exception. Still, Gavin couldn't let a fellow Texan family burn out, not if he could help it. And there were the Ambrose employees and shareholders to think about, too. Many families depended on a producing oil field. He shot back an email with a quote, Guess you'll get your wish, Miss Sophia Ambrose, if you and I can survive each other, he added dryly. Before he could rise from his desk, another email pinged from Sophia Ambrose. That's an outrageous amount of money, she stated in her note. Gavin typed quickly and hit send. It takes an outrageous amount of money and equipment to shut down a fire like the one you've got. Sophia made a counteroffer. Gavin shot back. The quote is firm, non-negotiable. Ten seconds later, she phoned again. I do believe you are a mercenary, sir. I don't negotiate with my men's lives, he said firmly. This is the most dangerous job in the world, besides being on the front lines. You are free to go elsewhere, ma'am. Gavin could only imagine the outrage on the other side of the world, from Miss Ambrose's mansion on a hill. Perhaps I'll do just that, came the quick reply. I'll get back to you. Gavin slammed his chair back and paced the floor. Suit yourself, lady. But you won't find another outfit within a thousand miles that knows what they're doing. He hung up before she could say another word. Three seconds later, the office door opened. Lunch is here. Don Brody, his office manager, announced, banging through the front door and carrying a box filled with lunches packed in paper sacks. He'd had to drive 20 miles into the outskirts of town for food with two bodyguards. Hungry? Starving, Gavin said, forcing a quick smile. I'll go get the gas. Shoving his chair across the worn linoleum of the office trailer, he headed back outside to face the current inferno and let his men know that they were going home for a few weeks. He let the European company take over for a little while. None of his men had seen their families in two months. Besides, he knew he shouldn't have been so grumpy with Miss Ambrose over the phone. He'd actually gotten a call yesterday about another fire over the border in Louisiana, too. He'd be able to do both jobs and then get back to Mosul to finish this one once and for all. Later that night, a final email came from Miss Sophia Ambrose. Okay, Mr. Spencer, you're right. There's nobody else. I'll pay your price, but I don't have to like it. Gavin shook his head. This was going to be a tough job, not because of the fire necessarily, but because of ornery Sophia Ambrose. He and his men would get in and get out and collect the paycheck, 
and not look back. Chapter 6 Sophia slammed the house phone down. She had been trying to reach her five sisters with no luck. They were all conveniently busy. If they didn't know about Granny's will soon, they'd all be madder than hornets when they learned that Sophia had been given it all. Well, not all. Every heir would soon be receiving more than their usual monthly stipends, but she could imagine that there might be wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth. Poppy hadn't said much yet. She and Gordon had disappeared, and Sophia wasn't sure where they had ended up today, probably avoiding the curse on purpose. Gavin Spencer had put her in a foul mood. He was an arrogant, short-tempered man but maybe she should cut him some slack. After all, being in Iraq for two months with ISIS surrounding them sounded stressful and dangerous, in addition to the oil fires. Marching outside while it was still relatively cool, she muttered, His company in Houston is a mere two hours away, and yet he's not in the country to help his fellow citizens, but halfway across the world. Sophia knew she was in an anxious mood because she was worried. What if a spark set off a second rig into flames? What a mess. Even so, Gavin Spencer's quote wasn't as high as she had feared. It was in her blood to negotiate hard. She'd also forgotten to ask how long it would take to get a team here and how long it took to put out an oil well fire. The two of them had been speaking over one another and misunderstanding each other during that long-distance phone call. She probably should have kept a more even temper especially if she was going to be running things from now on. She couldn't get upset over every little thing. The board would kick her out if she treated vendors and employees as she did today on the phone. Granny would spit nails. She'd be so angry. Still, an oil fire wasn't a little thing at all, far from it. But while stomping across the yard to the gate of the cemetery, Sophia came to the realization that she had been rude. From Mr. Spencer's perspective, She was a total stranger making demands. The man didn't know her from Adam. Well, Eve, she supposed, her lips quirking into a smile. Pushing open the gate, Sophia entered the Ambrose family cemetery. It was situated on a quarter of an acre, under a cluster of weeping willows and flowering crabapple trees. Most oil families didn't have family cemeteries. Death came frequently and tragically to the Ambrose family, and it colored everything. Sophia's steps slowly crunched along the narrow gravel path. A month ago, the spring winds had blazed piles of dead cottonwood leaves everywhere, but they were gone now. Max had probably cleaned them up. The flower beds along the perimeter were blooming honeysuckle and daisies and rose bushes. The grass was freshly mowed and trimmed around the headstones. When Sophia reached her father's grave, She sank to her knees while her breath hitched in her chest. Hey, Daddy, she whispered. Guess you probably heard the news. I'm now head honcho, the boss, with a capital B. And I wish I could run away. Life sure likes to throw curveballs. You got one of the worst curves ever. I know that everything would be different if you were here. Poppy... Mother, wouldn't be marrying men right and left. Instead, the both of you could be running things and enjoying the fruits of Ambrose's thick, rich, wonderful oil. She ran a finger over the letters in his name and along the birth and death dates of his life. Loved by all who knew him, especially his daughters, Sophia, Lauren, and Emma. Seeing the familiar words was difficult, but comforting, too. He was real. He had lived, despite her hazy memories. She laid a small bunch of the daisies, pansies, and hollyhocks she'd picked from the flower garden onto the grass near his headstone. Aren't these pretty flowers, Daddy? And I love the inscription. It's so true. A rustle in the grass behind her made Sophia jump to her feet. You do have a knack for sneaking up on me lately, Granny. Lillian stuck her cane into the sloping ground to keep her balance. She never used a cane indoors, only when she was outdoors on uneven ground. It was me, actually, her grandmother said now. 
Sophia frowned, not understanding. You what? I had the words added to Randall's headstone. Your mother was a bit of a mess, as you can understand. Your father's death was such a horrible tragedy. I've always been a little bit mad at him, actually. Your mother was, too. Sophia nodded slowly. I can see that. She ran away far from us, from here, from everything. Poppy continues to run. She's trying to find happiness like we all do. Are you becoming nostalgic, Granny? Espousing wisdom in your old age? Bah, her grandmother said. Who said I was old? I'm stating facts. Slowly, her grandmother walked the perimeter of the cemetery, inspecting the other graves and headstones, including her husband, son, brother, parents, and grandparents. Finally, she paused along the bright white picket fence, freshly painted by Max, most likely. Sophia watched her gaze across the property, the rolling grasses and meadows, the distant cottonwoods. Pretty as a picture in the spring, isn't it? Lillian said. Always my favorite time of the year. Sophia nodded, emotion clouding her eyes. Do you still have the necklace I gave to all of you girls when you turned 16? The question took Sophia by surprise. When she tugged it out from under her blouse, the silver chain and amethyst birthstone winked under the bright sunlight. She read the words on the back that matched her sister's pendants. Together we are strong. Although each sister's necklace was decorated with their own individual birthstone in the center. Lillian gave a faint smile. I'm glad. I've always hoped it would protect you girls from the pains of the world. Six necklace pendants for all six of my granddaughters. They bind you together and keep you close, even when you're far away from each other. It's a beautiful necklace, especially with each of our birthstones and engraved with all of our names. But I'm 32 now, and it feels a little silly to put such store into a necklace, as if it will keep the curse at bay. Maybe we're all a bunch of silly women and not protected at all, just as vulnerable as anybody in this world. Her grandmother shrugged. Perhaps, but I think it gives us all hope and a stronger bond no matter where we are at any given time in the world. I'm sorry my sisters didn't come for the reading of your will and the annual cemetery ceremony. It's not an actual ceremony, her grandmother said, practically spluttering when she said the words. Lillian Ambrose was not one to splutter, and she managed to hide her own fear superbly well. But I do like to make an official yearly visit and remember and honor our loved ones, especially those that died much too young. They were all good men, honorable, hardworking, and implicitly loved. Your great-grandmothers are obviously gone now, too, dying in their old age. I wish you girls could have known them, too. I'd like to be buried by Richard when my time comes, Sophia. Of course, Granny, Sophia said. There's no other place you should be. Then she turned back to her father's grave and whispered, Rest in peace, Daddy. I hope you're happy and dancing in the clouds with those who have gone to the other side. I loved you all dearly and keep you close in my heart, her grandmother added, her hands lifting, as if spreading her words across each and every grave of the lost Ambrose family members. Your memories are a gift and a comfort when times are hard and lonely. Amen, Sophia found herself saying as she held the necklace's amethyst in her palm before placing it back under her blouse. After a few moments of quiet, Lillian turned toward the gate that would take her back to the house. She sniffed the air and frowned. Did you find someone to come out and stop our fire? Yes, Sophia replied, following her. Spencer's oil fire specialists. Their motto is, any fire, any time, anywhere. I'm taking him, uh, Gavin Spencer, up on his offer, even though his team is currently in Iraq, putting out a few dozen oil field fires. Iraq? Indeed. I didn't expect that. How soon can they be here? This weekend. It's only Tuesday. 
which means that while we wait, all of our future assets are burned out. Mr. Spencer said it wouldn't burn everything, although it depends on how much oil is left in any particular well. Hmm, her grandmother said, pursing her lips. He also said that sparks from the fire could ignite other wells in our field. That doesn't sound good. Not good at all. I'm wondering if we should get Colt and Max to set up the irrigation pipeline and keep the perimeter watered to stop any stray flame bursts or sparks. Did Mr. Spencer suggest that? No, Sophia shook her head. But it's an idea for keeping it under control and might assuage the constant worry. I'm not sleeping well lately, and she turned to look directly at Lillian. I put the blame squarely on you, Granny. The sky is getting cloudy with smoke as the day goes on, her grandmother said, ignoring the accusation. I don't want to risk our employees, and it bothers me that you drove so close to it. How tall is the main funnel of the fire spouting? At least 200 feet, by my estimate. Lillian let out a sudden whistle, and Sophia burst out laughing. I didn't know you could whistle, Granny. Your father taught me, actually. It slips out in times of distress. Nothing much surprises me anymore, but I hate to see you and your sister's inheritance disappearing before our eyes. We have to hope that Mr. Spencer's firefighters are as good as their online reputation is, and that Mr. Spencer himself isn't too much of a bear to work with. Hmm, her grandmother said again, giving Sophia a sideways look. Speaking of our deceased progenitors, I was hoping I could enlist your help in one more project this summer, my dear. One more? I think you've already given me about a hundred projects already, Granny. Well, besides the estate and oil company. Is that all? Such a piece of cake. I could do it in my sleep, Sophia interjected, trying to give her grandmother a hard time. Lillian gave her a sober gaze. Knowing you, by the end of the summer, you'll be running everything in your sleep. You're quite capable, my dear, and I have every confidence that the next several decades will be good ones for all of you, which helps me sleep at night. Sophia smoothed her hand along the cool grass in front of her father's gravestone. Decades without grandsons-in-law or great-grandchildren, she said quietly. You do realize that? I can't believe in this, this curse, Lillian said firmly. It's all in our heads. Then why the necklaces? Why do we have a hall of the dead? <laughs> Family pictures adorn every household in the world. Sophia finally got to her feet. Why are you suddenly denying what's happened over the last 12 decades? Maybe longer than that, for all we know, Sophia added. The idea had never occurred to her before, and now the thought gripped her so badly, her chest grew tight from the stress. She lifted her eyes to stare at her grandmother. Her grandmother said, Now you're becoming hysterical. Sophia snorted. <laughs> if that's what you want to believe, then believe it. But none of this is coincidental. I feel it in my bones. Granny gave a laugh. <laughs> Your bones aren't old enough to feel premonitions or portend the future. What about the past? This house has been here a very long time. It has spooky corridors and doors that open onto walls. All of those things can be explained. You will need to get over your fears, because that's your other project this summer. I'm listening. It's time to open up the doors and bedrooms of the old house and find out what's there. Like what? Granny shrugged, waving her hands about, as if flustered, which was completely unlike her. Papers, documents, pictures, genealogy charts, letters, diaries. It's time we knew our past, so we can figure out the future of you and your sisters. Chapter 7 Sophia's fingers curled into fists as she tried to take in what her grandmother was telling her. Do you know something that you're keeping a secret from us? I wish I had answers, but I don't. I merely believe it's important to know where we came from. I knew my own parents and very little of my grandparents. 
and that only takes my personal memory back to the 1940s, once I was out of childhood. We were in the middle of the war during my early teens, and nobody talked about anything else. Sophia pursed her lips. The house is older than that. Yes, it is. It was old when I was a child. The original Ambrose family built this estate, and it's time you and your sisters learned more about where you came from. And with that, I'm going upstairs for my afternoon nap. All right, Granny, go disappear and leave it all to me. Her grandmother gave her a serene smile. Speaking of your sisters, did you get a hold of any of them since the reading of the will yesterday? Not yet. Where's Mother and Gordon, anyway? In town, having lunch, but they're leaving in a few hours to fly back to Hawaii. They want me to keep you here so they can say goodbye. Sophia's phone rang in her back pocket, and she pulled it out. Speak of the devil. It's Emma. Talk to your sister. Then come into the house for lunch. Sophia punched at her phone. Hey, sis, where are you? Egypt? The Valley of the Queens, to be exact. What's with the Middle East today? Sophia said, laughing at the coincidence of Mr. Spencer in Iraq and now Emma in Egypt. You sound like you're just down the road. I would never have guessed. Didn't I tell you I was going to dig over here? May is the last month for any good excavation work. It's already over a hundred degrees out here. In the shade, no less. Whose tomb are you digging up now? A minor queen. Probably a concubine you never heard of. It was discovered last year, and it's smallish, but we got into the first room last week. Great stuff. Gold beds and candle operas and jewelry. The wall paintings are practically perfect, untouched. It's quite a find since most everything has been found. When are you going to excavate here at home? Um, Sophia, there's nothing to excavate in the States. Nobody's been dead long enough or was rich enough, and we weren't lucky enough to keep our royalty. I know, I was merely teasing you. Plus, I miss you. I heard there was a big family powwow. Where did you hear that? From Granny. She invited all of us. In fact, I got this fancy engraved card, all official, as if I was being summoned. Sophia let out a splutter. Wouldn't you know that Granny would send you all an official invitation, but with me, I got a phone call telling me to come now or else. That's Granny for you. Besides, you only live two hours away. Hey, is the family meeting being rescheduled since the rest of us are nowhere near a thousand miles of Texas? That's why I called. It happened. The meeting, that is. Oh, that's nice, Emma said, sounding distracted now. I'm relieved to miss it, frankly. Listen, Emma, Granny had the reading of her will. I think you should know. Her will? The invitation said nothing about her will. What are you saying? Is Granny sick? Did she suddenly die? No. I wish somebody had said something. Why didn't Mother call? I can get a leave of absence for a week or so. Emma, stop. Granny is fine. But she's pushing 90 and wanted to get her ducks in a row, as they say. Besides, I think she wants to train her heir, or rather heiress. Sophia finished lamely. Does that mean she gave everything to Poppy? Our mother will sell it all and buy a caravan of rubies or another husband or something obnoxious. Sophia realized that she was holding her breath. No, Granny knows better than that. Well, she's not seen all yet, then. Spill it, big sister. What's the scoop? Everybody gets their monthly royalties. In fact... The monthly will increase because Granny has been squirreling away her millions, and the interest alone is phenomenal, and there will be a large flat sum on her death. But go on, I need to get back to work. Emma, I'm sorry, but Granny ended up giving everything to me. I mean, the estate house, the ranch. I get to run it all, and I'll be on the board of the company. Her sister began to laugh. <laughs> 
You're kidding, right? How utterly horrid of Granny to sell you with all of it. I thought for sure we'd sell it all and split it seven ways. You mean you'd want to sell the house and never visit our childhood home again? It was never my childhood home, remember? You're the oldest grandchild, so it makes sense Granny would give it to you. She's always loved you best. Sophia tried to protest. Oh, shut up. Don't pretend it's not true. Honestly, I'm completely relieved. But I'm sorry for you, Sophia, she added sadly. But maybe you're happy? You always liked Ambrose Estate, horses, cows, riding along the creek, all that kind of thing. I'm a big city girl, you know. Give me New York or London or Paris. I even adore Cairo with all its insanity and traffic accidents and sweltering heat. No, you just like digging in the dirt, Sophia shot back with a laugh. I do feel spoiled, Emma confided. I'm deliriously happy that I get an inheritance in my monthly allowance. It allows me to do whatever I want. Because I make pennies in the archaeology business. I have to discover my own tomb or rare relic to get museum grants or any sort of renown. It's a cutthroat business. Most of us are just the help, and the Egyptian Ministry of State for Antiquities can be very overbearing when it comes to a find. There are so many rules, it's ridiculous. Come home sometime, Emma, Sophia told her. I miss you. Me too. Maybe in August when nobody works over here. At least us foreigners don't dig when it's 120 degrees. Sophia sighed. Fingers crossed we still have an inheritance to look forward to. What's that supposed to mean? Are you confessing to a sinister plot to embezzle from your dearest sisters? Of course not. We have an oil rig fire. It's bad. But it will all be fine. I have to keep telling myself that. Be careful. I will, Sophia promised gaily. She hadn't meant to bring that up at all. So, any new men in your life? I'll bet Egyptian men are intriguing. They are, but any flirting or going out for drinks is all just fun and games. I wouldn't be surprised if any of us sisters never marry. Maybe the twins will. They're the most removed from Ambrose Estate. Please don't say that. I want nieces and nephews. You'll have to adopt some, or find your own man and pop out some kiddos yourself. <laughs> The phone went silent as Sophia and Emma dropped the topic, knowing exactly what the other was thinking. Your mind hasn't changed? Emma finally asked softly into the receiver. I'm in the most dangerous position of all, Sophia said, her throat tight. All of you have a chance, but I don't. Not anymore. Granny made sure of that with her darn will in throwing Ambrose's estate at me. It's like a noose around my neck forevermore. I'd spit out a few curse words, but I won't burn your ears. I'm sorry, I really am, Emma said, sympathy in her voice. Call me again sometime. I really do have to go. Go find some amazing gold crowns to show off in the foyer, Sophia told her and then clicked off the phone. Now, to attempt to call her other sisters but none of them answered their phones or text messages. Hopefully, they wouldn't have a heart attack when the papers from Mr. Gentry arrived in their mailbox. Or maybe the increased royalty payout and future inheritance was enough to satisfy any hunger for a hefty inheritance they might be harboring. It was really time for a family reunion. The only problem was getting everybody in the same location at the same time. Chapter 8 when Sophia came inside the house to change into her riding clothes, her mother and Gordon were coming down the elegant staircase. Behind them, Max carried their luggage. Quite a lot of luggage for only a two-day stay, Sophia observed, but that was poppy for you. A different outfit for every hour of the day, including a backup ensemble in case she changed her mind. Mother, Sophia said, biting at her lips. She hadn't seen her mother since the reading of the will. Her mother had trilled with laughter and small talk with the staff and Daniel Gentry, but hadn't said very much to her eldest daughter. Gordon and I are leaving, Poppy said bluntly, 
her heels clicking across the marble floor. Will you load the car with the bags, Fenton? She said to the ranch hand. Thank you. Gordon ran a hand through his thinning gray hair and began to follow Max out the door, pausing to say goodbye to Sophia. We're off to San Francisco for a few days before heading back to our little piece of heaven on Maui, he said jovially. I see, Sophia said, cringing a little. Their little piece of heaven was not something she cared to think about, actually. That sounds nice, she added, trying to be friendly. Eat a loaf of sourdough French bread for me. After all, Gordon had only been husband number five for a short time. She really should give her mother's husbands more of a chance, she supposed. I'll eat too, Sophia, Gordon said with a smile. Take care. Come visit us in Hawaii sometime. You're always welcome. Thank you for the invitation, Sophia said noncommittally. The front door closed behind him, along with the luggage in tow. Poppy turned to her daughter. I see that you have ingratiated yourself with your granny very nicely, Sophia blinked. The rancor in her mother's tone was startling. What is that supposed to mean? I assume you're referring to granny's will? Lillian gave you everything. What a coup. Poppy. To say Sophia was shocked was an understatement. Her mother paced the foyer, one hand on her hip. I wish you would stop calling me by my first name. I've always hated it. You're my daughter. Maybe if you acted more like a mother, I would. As soon as the words were out, Sophia apologized. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. But you're coming at me as if I'd planned all this myself. That is unfair. Besides, Granny isn't even dead yet. Not even a smidgen of illness. This came out of the blue for all of us. My sisters couldn't even be bothered to show up. Not that Sophia wanted to denigrate her sisters, but her mother was singling her out as if there was an underhanded scheme going on. I'm Lillian's daughter. Sophia tried to remain calm. Why don't you ask her? I'm sure she'll tell you the truth. Granny doesn't beat around the bush. Perhaps I will, Poppy said with a small puff of indignation. If I was vindictive, I'd say that you've been planning this ever since your father died, and you refused to move to town with Lauren and me. I wonder if you stayed out here on the ranch with your grandmother on purpose. Tears smarted and Sophia's voice shook. Is that what you think of me? That I was scheming since I was a little girl? I don't even know what to say, except that perhaps you should look in the mirror, Mom. You didn't try very hard to get me back. You were content to leave me here because it was easier for you. So you could marry again and again and again, Poppy gasped. Don't you dare disrespect my decisions. You have no idea what I've been through. Sophia wasn't going down that path. Mother, you took Lauren and Emma away from me. This house is plenty big enough for all of us. Granny wanted us all to be here with her. Poppy's face hardened. She had never liked to be blamed for anything, let alone her own shortcomings at motherhood. I let you stay because you threw a tantrum over leaving your horse. Oh, mother, really? You're going to blame a six-year-old. Honestly, her mother had some emotional issues, big ones, including a good dose of greed. Is this how all of her sisters were going to look at Sophia? A money-grubbing schemer who had ingratiated herself with her grandmother since she was barely out of kindergarten? I did not ask for the ranch, Sophia said. I certainly don't want the responsibility. I had a life of my own, and good things were happening that I now have to cancel. If I could, I'd gladly give all the work and accountability to you. In truth, Sophia didn't want to let any of them down. She wanted the rest of her family to live comfortably without worry or crushing debt. But she also didn't want to let herself down either. Within the past 24 hours, she had determined to do the best job she possibly could. Her grandmother expected it of her. She had put her trust in Sophia. Deep down, 
Sophia knew that she was the best choice to be executor of the state. Poppy wasn't going to give up her life to live here and manage the ranch and the oil company. Perhaps Mother is going senile, Poppy said now, her red lips pursed and indignant. As her immediate heir, I could contest the will. If that would make you feel any better, go right ahead, Sophia said, giving a shrug. But I don't think you'll get very far. Don't spend the money you receive every month on a lawsuit and lawyers and court time. If you need more to live on, then let me know, and perhaps we can negotiate the royalty stipend. The words were meant to appease Poppy. The board of directors would be the ones to make the final decision. I'll write a letter to the board then. Perhaps request a meeting. Poppy's lips worked as though she was trying to figure out how to exit with dignity, as well as that attorney, Mr. Gentry. Please do. Sophia was determined not to let her mother get a rise out of her. But it hurt to know her own mother resented her. I suppose, Poppy said airily, moving toward the front door, even if our formidable Ambrose matriarch had given me everything, I would never be able to live out here in the middle of nowhere. I'd have to find a mansion in the woodlands, and even that is nearly a one hour's drive. Besides, you like your horses and the cows, although I cannot see the appeal. I suppose this life suits you. Poppy had to get the last dig in to make herself feel better. Sophia bit her tongue and figured it was easier to let her mother say her piece. Then she'd go off with Gordon to marital bliss, whatever that was. She didn't even see that Sophia was giving up her own life, the chance to run away with a true love of her own, a love she'd never have. But would running to the ends of the earth protect her from the family curse? So far, Poppy had lost three husbands to death. After that, a divorce, and now Gordon. Her mother had also lost her own father barely out of childhood. No matter how many men loved her, it would never be quite enough to heal her. Chapter 9 Four days later, Sophia got a phone call from Gavin Spencer. Her stomach tightened, nervous for some inexplicable reason, when she recognized his voice. She was worried about the fire burning out of control, but didn't want the man to aggravate her so badly she blew up at him. What if he reneged on her offer and let all of her oil wells burn to the ground? She'd be back to square one. Still, he actually had a very nice voice over the phone. Deep without being gravelly, smooth without being glib, and charming in an edgy way. Of course, when she met the man in person, he would probably be a controlling, cocky, 60-year-old with a paunchy beer belly and bossy as all get out. Miss Ambrose, he said without preamble, we're back in the States, just arrived in Houston. Good, Sophia said. She should be relieved, not nervous. Great, she added. We're eager to get you, your team, here, and hopefully have good news. That Ambrose Oil Company isn't suddenly going to have to file bankruptcy. She kept her voice friendly, an attempt at light conversation, but Gavin Spencer sounded like he was in a rush. We're about to arrive at my office headquarters, but it will take the rest of the day to assemble our equipment, load it up and fill water tanks. We should see you tomorrow morning bright and early, if that works on your end. Of course, I'm up early. We all are. It's summer in Texas. Who can sleep in this heat and humidity, right? Good grief. She was babbling now. The man made her nervous as a teenager on a first date for some reason. His manner was so completely no-nonsense, his voice so deep and masculine, she was turning into a silly woman. Straightening her spine, Sophia assumed an air of professionalism. We will see you in the morning, then. Goodbye for now, Mr. Spencer. She jabbed the off button on her cell phone and collapsed under the air conditioner in the drawing room. Running Ambrose estate was more stressful than Sophia had imagined. It was the worry more than anything, the burden of responsibility, thinking of all the people she needed to take care of, like the Ambrose Ranch and household staff who relied on their salaries to pay mortgages and feed their families. Mrs. B walked into the room with an ice-cold lemonade. 
Miss Sophia, you thirsty darling. Sophia swung her legs around and sat up straight as if she'd been caught like a kid on the furniture. Oh, yes, please. Thank you. It's blazing hot, isn't it? It was too hot to keep babbling, but babble she did. Sophia rolled her eyes at herself and took the frosty glass from the housekeeper, sipping at the refreshing drink. Did I hear the telephone ring? Mrs. B asked. I could have answered it for you. I'll do anything to help out, Miss Sophia. I know things are hard right now. It was Gavin. I mean, Mr. Spencer. The company of oil firefighters. Sophia ran a hand through her hair, trying to act nonchalant. They'll be here in the morning, but having that oil rig burning like Hades, where my cows want to roam, is getting on my nerves. It's quite worrisome, the housekeeper agreed. We've had to transport the cattle closer to the creek, which is good because it's closer to water, but the problem is that they're used to roaming wherever they want to. Colt and Max have hired a couple more ranch hands to deal with it until the fire is out. That sounds like a good solution, Mrs. B said. Colt told me when the animals neared the flames, the sight of it, and the intense heat made them very upset. They started running in all directions, bawling as if the entire world was on fire. It's a regular inferno. I drove out there to take lunches to the ranch hands. Shocking to see oil light up like that. I didn't even get within two miles of it. The neighbors have been calling, too, and the oil company board is beginning to sweat more than normal. Sophia's own patience was beginning to wear thin. The fire and smoke and haze in the air was making the entire household on edge. She had caught Reggie, the gardener, with his assistants and the pool specialist, whispering and gossiping. She wished she could allay their worries, but didn't have enough facts to assuage the raw fear, and she couldn't lie to them to make them feel better. Pacing the floor, Sophia took another sip of her lemonade. At the exact moment, a sudden violent shudder ran through the floor under her feet. Her chin shot up to stare at Mrs. B, whose eyes widened. Did you feel that? Sophia asked, holding her hand out to watch the lemonade shaking in her fist. The house trembled, as if there had been an earthquake, and then it stopped almost as suddenly as it had begun. Yes, ma'am, I felt that all right, the older woman said firmly. Should we get out or crawl under the table? Never felt an earthquake in my life, not even a little tremor when I visited my daughter in San Francisco. Sophia's eyes met Mrs. B's gaze. That wasn't an earthquake. She shoved the glass of lemonade into the housekeeper's hands. I'll be back. Don't worry. I have an inkling as to what might have happened, although I sure hope not. Go lie down and rest in this heat. Anything to keep your mind off all of this. The housekeeper lifted her hands in a gesture of surrender, as if I could stop my thoughts from flying around the room like a whirly gig. Sophia pressed Mrs. B's hand, then grabbed her truck keys from the entryway table and hurried out the front door. After jumping into the Ford, she mashed her foot on the gas pedal as Colt and Max came running from the barns. She rolled down her window, choking on the dust the truck had stirred up. I'll be back, she shouted. Every second was an agony. Every minute, an hour long, as Sophia bumped over the rough ranch road, finally heading straight to the oil fields that covered several miles. She knew exactly what had happened when she got within the last mile. The inferno geyser was higher than the tallest cottonwoods, the orange and red flames looking as if the trees were on fire. When she cleared the cottonwood grove, she parked and climbed out of her truck to stare at the disaster. A second wellfire next to the first one, was gushing a wall of fire that scorched her face, despite the distance of more than a half mile. Sophia cursed under her breath, wanting to scream. Shielding her eyes, she stared at the angry column of whipping, raging fire that billowed clouds of black, angry smoke into the blue sky. What happened? She spit out. Sparks? Heat? Old equipment? And curse you, Gavin Spencer, for being out of the country when a fellow Texan needs you. She knew she wasn't being fair, but it was hard not to stomp her feet as she climbed back into the truck and slowly circled the two enormous fires, pausing every few seconds to snap fresh photos. Before heading back to the house, she put the truck into gear and stomped on the emergency brake to punch the numbers for Spencer Oil Fire Specialists. Miss Ambrose, what do you need? Gavin's voice said on the other end. There was no greeting, but he didn't sound angry, mostly resigned. 
which didn't make Sophia feel any better. She didn't care if she was a pest. This was out of control and unacceptable. I sent you a few more pictures about 30 seconds ago. We have a second fire. The well only half a mile from the first one. I'm not sure if you've been taking me seriously enough. Ambrose Estate is in emergency mode now, in case you weren't fully aware of the magnitude of this. I'm fully aware. I've fought several at once before, but even if I left Houston right now, I wouldn't get there until dark. There's not much I can do before sunrise. I felt this explosion inside my house, which is ten miles away. Yep, that sometimes happens. The man paused as if flipping through the photos on his phone, and then he asked, How close were you when you took these? At least half a mile away. Where are you right now? I circled the two fires to get a clearer look and take the pictures. Where are you right now? This very moment. I'm sitting in my truck watching them. How far? Quarter of a mile, maybe less. You are a fool. Get the hell out of there. Are you crazy? The sparks from your truck could set a fireball in motion that will blow you all the way into the next county. I didn't think I... Obviously. Do not drive parallel to the fires. Turn around and drive the opposite direction back to the house. Now, go and back up 500 feet first so your tailpipe doesn't send any sparks in the direction of the flames. Going, going, Sophia yelled. Her fingers were shaking as she jammed the truck into reverse and drove backward. Her cell phone fell to the floor as the truck bumped backward over the uneven terrain. She hit a small trench at one point and slammed her head into the car's roof, biting her tongue until she tasted blood. She cursed again, not caring if Gavin Spencer heard her on her phone that was jerking around on the truck's floorboard. Once she'd gone far enough, she did a three-point turn and then slammed the vehicle into drive to hightail it back to the house. My phone's still on, she muttered once she was a mile away from the rigs. Coming to a stop, she reached down to grab it where it had rolled under the passenger seat. The connection was still on. Mr. Spencer, she said tentatively, hoping he had hung up. Miss Ambrose, Gavin said immediately, and Sophia's face burned knowing he'd been listening to her mutterings while she jerked the car in and out of gear. Thought you might have hung up by now, she told him. I stayed on the line because I wanted you to know that a couple of my team members and I are driving up to you right now. I don't trust any of you up there. But I thought you couldn't do anything tonight. Things have changed. There are two flaming wells and an owner who doesn't know when to stay away for her own safety. We're going to at least get the water trucks going tonight. It will be easier to assess in the morning anyway, when it's daylight. You're coming tonight? Sophia breathed. We'll see you in three hours, Tops. Do not let anybody out there. Nobody, do you understand? And be ready to sign a fat contract, so make sure you got your fancy ink pen filled and ready. Got that, Sophia? You are a rude man, Sophia blurted out, then realized he had already clicked off. She sat for a minute, breathing hard from the adrenaline of the last 30 minutes. Then she realized that Gavin Spencer had called her Sophia, not Miss Sophia or Miss Ambrose like he normally did. The memory of his enigmatic voice saying her name made her tremble a little. And then Sophia found herself glancing in the rearview mirror, her hair sweaty and her blouse askew. She was hot and steaming mad. Cranking up the truck's AC, she put the vehicle back in gear and drove home knowing that she was going to take a shower and change her clothes before she met Mr. Gavin Spencer in person. She'd hoped to have the night to get herself emotionally ready for a battle of wills between them, but he was coming now. Now! She was at once happy that the two fires would get some immediate attention while her stomach shot into her throat at the thought of meeting Gavin Spencer in the flesh. A tiny thrill ran up her back, spreading across her neck and face. She really was an idiot to react this way to someone she'd never met before. He was probably the age of somebody who could be her father. She really needed to stop acting like a total fool. Two hours later, she was showered, dressed, had eaten a quick dinner, and was ready for whatever was going to happen out there with Spencer Oil Fire Specialists. When Sophia stepped off the staircase into the foyer, she snapped on the overhead chandelier for light, including the outdoor porch lights. 
Mrs. B came in from the kitchen. How nice you look all dressed up. Are you going somewhere besides out to the fires with the firemen? I'm not dressed up. I'm wearing slacks, not an evening dress. Thought you'd just be in jeans and a sweatshirt, that's all, the housekeeper observed, eyeing Sophia. Since I'm the owner of the estate, I think I need to look the part. Professional, that's all, she said, repeating her grandmother's own words. Your hair looks especially good tonight. I love it when you fix your hair like that. Like what? Sophia made a face. Never mind, don't answer that. How I look means nothing. I cleaned up from the day is all. You're just used to me with dirt on my knees and my hair sweaty from riding star in the wind. Mrs. B gave her a sideways look. Uh-huh, sweetheart, if you say so. Chapter 10 Those water trucks filled and ready to pull out of the warehouse, Gavin asked Jake Spaulding when he put down the phone after agreeing to head to Ambrose Estate. He probably shouldn't have called her Sophia. The older woman would probably be affronted and disrespected. There were times when Miss Ambrose sounded like a southern gentlewoman in her distinct diction and manner, and he should have watched himself more carefully before they had a tug of war over every little aspect of the Ambrose fires. He had already yelled at her too much, and he needed to watch himself more carefully. Oil fires were twenty times more dangerous than any of the house fires he had fought as a new fireman for the Houston Fire Department when he got started in this crazy business eighteen years ago. He needed total focus on a job, not somebody hovering and criticizing every move he made. Yeah, why? Earl Cardle asked, wiping his hands on a rag after oiling tools and wrenches since their arrival back from the Middle East that morning. We're almost ready. What time do you want to leave? 6 a.m.? Nope. The three of us are going right now, tonight. Jake and Earl glanced at one another, puzzled. A second well just blew, Gavin told them. The owner is out there gawking and determined to blow herself up next. Within 30 minutes, Gavin and his two employees had the flatbed trailer loaded with basic supplies and tools and hitched to the biggest truck they owned. Two water tank trucks were filled with extra hoses and gaskets. Grab our fire suits, too, Gavin said, just in case. After a few minutes of good-natured complaining about having to drive to Ambrose Estate, Twelve hours before the original plan, Gavin promised his two right-hand men dinner out. Jake was a young man, a newlywed at that, and didn't like leaving his bride very much. Who could blame him? Especially after the three months they had spent in Iraq, Gavin double-checked what they needed to get started tonight. He'd return for his other heavy equipment tomorrow. Being there tonight, when the Ambrose family wasn't to be trusted not to do something stupid, would give him some measure of calmness so he could get a good night's sleep. They were all still jet-lagged. By the time they arrived, Miss Ambrose might have already gone to bed, and he wouldn't have to deal with her until tomorrow. One could only hope. We're ready, boys, he called to Jake and Earl. Let's move out. The wide doors of their facility opened. Gavin revved the engine of the truck he was hauling with the flatbed while his own two men drove the water tanks. The roar of the engines was familiar and comforting as the warehouse doors opened and they pulled out onto the frontage road of Highway 45 to head north. A little over two hours later, Gavin and his crew drove through the quiet streets of the little town of Ambrose, established 1900. They were only ten miles now from the estate. Sophia's ancestors must have settled the town. Sheesh, he said into the ham radio he shared with his team members. These people are so rich and uppity, they even named the town after themselves. Jake laughed through the receiver. Don't you know that most small towns in Texas are named after some rich family from the 1800s? I try not to think about it, Gavin shot back. At least it's not quite dark yet, Earl said. Sun's lowering, though. Gavin glanced at the clock on its dash. Eight o'clock. We got 45 minutes before it's pitch black. Let's step on it, boys. Hope somebody remembered the spotlights. We're gonna need them. They're behind you, boss, Jake said. On the flatbed. That thing that's been following you for the last hundred miles. Oh, that thing, Gavin chuckled. He was fortunate to find good men to hire. 
men who knew their stuff and were fearless and smart, as well as possessing a sense of humor. They worked well together, including his other two men, who would come tomorrow morning. Look up ahead. I think we're nearing the place. He double-checked the route address. And sure enough, they were on Ambrose Road heading northwest. They had already passed several big properties, but when he reached the entrance to Ambrose, he didn't have to guess. The name Ambrose Estate Ranch and Oil Company was crafted on an enormous iron gate that spanned the opening from the fence line. Up ahead about half a mile was a tree-lined drive and a white-painted three-story mansion with impressive landscaping. Ten bucks, we're here, Gavin said. I'll see your ten bucks and raise you twenty, Earl said. Right behind you, boss. Gavin pulled the flatbed into a dirt parking area on the opposite side of the wide concrete driveway while Earl and Jake pulled in behind him. Wait here, Gavin told them as he slid out of the driver's seat of his truck. Shouldn't take more than a few minutes to get directions out to the fires. He rubbed his hands along the length of his thighs. Jeans and a cotton button-down shirt were his standard issue uniform. It didn't matter what he wore, since he spent most of his time in his firefighter gear, which consisted of heavy pants, heavy coat, heavy boots, and a heavy hard hat. He was smiling a little when he rang the doorbell. Despite the dusk of the evening, he could appreciate the flowers and brick pathways, the perfect emerald lawn and flowering trees in full blossom. The property was pretty darn magnificent and well-kept. Lights were on in the house, glowing behind the drapes of enormous picture windows, but there was a funny scent in the air. It was the fire. He could always tell when an oil fire was nearby. It was in his blood now. He'd probably die with that smell in his nose. The place was so quiet. Gavin almost rang the bell a second time when the door suddenly opened. A young woman with soft, wavy hair spilling over her shoulders stood silhouetted against a marble entryway, a stunning chandelier overhead. Gavin was speechless for a moment, and then the woman snapped on the outside porch lights that lit up the exterior of the house. The glow of the lights lit up the woman's pale porcelain skin, and her eyes were the deepest, prettiest blue Gavin had ever seen. Her brunette hair was streaked with blonde strands, woven imperfectly, and her hair was a complete contrast to her skin. She was so lovely, stunning in fact, that she seemed almost too perfectly beautiful. But then he noticed a light smattering of freckles across her nose and upper cheeks. The charming freckles didn't mar her beauty. They only made her more real, and those freckles told him she liked the outdoors. Of course, she was wearing slacks and a maroon blouse that fluttered around her body in the evening breeze, showing off all the right curves he liked on a woman. Gavin blinked. What the heck was wrong with him, ogling the stranger like this? This was probably Sophia Ambrose's granddaughter, or a cousin, or a maid. I'm Gavin Spencer, he introduced himself. I'm sorry to bother you this late in the evening, but I need directions out to the locations of the fires. Did Miss Ambrose leave any written instructions for me? The woman didn't speak for a moment, and Gavin realized she was staring at him as if she'd seen a ghost. Your voice, she said. It's, I mean, I recognized it right away. Okay, that sounded weird. A confused expression crossed her face. When you said Miss Ambrose just now, did you mean Lillian Ambrose? No, I've been communicating with Miss Sophia Ambrose. I'm not sure who Lillian is. Lillian is my grandmother. I'm Sophia Ambrose, actually. Gavin's throat went dry, and he gawked at her even harder, if that was possible. A peculiar sensation ran up his throat. So, you're the Sophia I've been talking to over the phone the last few days? The one and only. They stared at each other for another few seconds, and then Gavin quickly stuck out his hand. I'm Gavin Spencer with Spencer Oil Fire Specialists. Pleased to meet you, Miss Ambrose. No need to be formal. Call me Sophia. You're allowed to drop the miss anytime you'd like. She gave him a tentative smile and reached out to shake his hand. Thank you for coming tonight. You could probably tell over the phone I've been fairly frantic. Completely normal. 
Most well owners freak out a little when they have a blowout or a well catches fire. That's why we're here. And you can really put it out? Sophia asked uncertainly. It's so enormous. Gavin paused, uncertain if she was questioning his ability or was merely expressing her own worries. He decided to give her the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, we really can. Been doing it for a whole lot of years. How did you get trained in something like oil rig fires? It seems such a specialty. It is a specialty. I used to be with the Houston Fire Department, and then my father and I started this company. Well, he did first. And three years later, I joined him. Gavin wasn't used to being scrutinized as Sophia Ambrose appeared to be examining him. Her eyes were latched onto his, and Gavin felt the power of her gaze in a way he'd never quite felt before. He wished he knew what she was thinking, or if she was upset about their testy phone calls. Not that they had actually argued, but she was fiery, and now she appeared to be thoughtful and casual, and more beautiful than he had expected in a million years. Um, Sophia finally said, blinking as she suddenly shook her head. How do we proceed? Is there paperwork or a contract to sign? Uh, yeah. I mean, no. I didn't bring it with me tonight. I'll have it tomorrow when the rest of my team gets here. Don't worry about it right now. Okay, she said, watching him with those striking blue eyes. At the moment, I need to get out there and see what we're dealing with. I'm concerned about that second rig blowing. You and me both, Sophia said lightly, although there was definitely an undercurrent of real worry in her tone. I've got three big vehicles with me and two other men. Is there someone who can tell us how to get to the site? Oh, right. I was going to give you a map, but I changed my mind. I'm going with you. There's a couple of twisty forks in the road, and in the dark, it can be hard to explain. Besides, I want to see what you're going to do out there. I'm very curious. Gavin's eyebrows raised. I've never known a woman that wanted to tag along. Sorry, he added quickly. That probably sounded sexist. I didn't mean it that way. I spend 95% of my time with rough guys out in the middle of nowhere, fighting fires in 100-degree weather. We get pretty filthy, physically, that is, and uncivilized at times, so my manners probably aren't up to par. I understand. I'm sure the work is dangerous. He lifted an eyebrow with a grin. You have no idea. Let me get a light jacket and the keys to my truck. You can follow me. Gavin cleared his throat. Do you mind riding with me instead? I'd prefer to keep the vehicles to a minimum right now, until I know what I'm dealing with. Safety precautions. Oh, right. Makes sense. Sophia's long hair swayed below her shoulders. It looked so soft and glossy, like one of those shampoo commercials where the woman tosses her perfect shiny hair around for the cameras. And Gavin was curious to reach out and touch it. Inwardly, he rolled his eyes. What was wrong with him? This was the woman he'd wanted to strangle through the phone all week. I'll be 30 seconds, Sophia said. She stepped into the house about 10 feet while Gavin crossed the porch with its hanging flowers and luxurious outdoor furniture to step back down to the driveway. He heard Sophia call to someone, figuring she might be more like five minutes, but true to her word, she appeared behind him a windbreaker and a cell phone clutched in her hand. I had to tell Granny that I was heading out with you. He nodded, unsure what to say, but opened the passenger side door for her when they reached his truck. Thanks, she said, climbing into his truck. Once he closed the door, he signaled to Jake and Earl to follow him. After climbing into the driver's seat, he started the engine and placed his right arm along the back of his seat to get a better view of where to back up in the evening's deep twilight. Um. Head west from the driveway, and then take that dirt road up there about 500 yards, Sophia instructed. Gavin nodded, and within a minute, he was driving further north, away from the mansion's landscaping and stone fence lines toward empty ranch land. There were long minutes of silence as he drove the darkened roads, and Gavin kept thinking he should say something, but he wasn't sure what exactly. He was still in shock. 
Sophia Ambrose was decades younger than he expected, soft-spoken in real life and pretty as a picture. Chapter 11 By the time Sophia gave him two more instructions at a couple of forks in the road that wound west and then north again, Gavin realized that he was actually a little nervous around her. He didn't want to be rude, but he wanted to live up to Sophia's expectations, especially after bragging on the phone that his company was the best in the United States. If he was honest with himself, he hoped to impress the woman. It was like some kind of weird switch went off in his mind now that he knew she really wasn't a grouchy old woman who only wanted to make demands and argue with him. It's really getting dark now, Sophia said, leaning forward to peer through the windshield as evening stars began to appear above them. How will you see anything on the lower rig itself when we get to the oil field? It's going to be pitch black. We have spotlights. Big ones. Oh, that makes sense. Gavin took a breath, deciding to take the plunge. He had to clear the air. He didn't want an uncomfortable feeling to continue between them. Miss Ambrose, he began. She turned in her seat to look at him, and Gavin could feel her eyes on his face. He wished he'd shaved. He had a week's growth from the last hectic week in Iraq, plus the travel back home. In and out of airports and sleeping overnight in a small plane seat where his elbows often knocked into the passenger next to him. Call me Sophia. I'm not your superior or your doctor or your elderly neighbor. <laughs> You're definitely not that he said with a low chuckle. Her lips lifted into a smile at that, and Gavin wished he could take his eyes off the road to stare at her oval-shaped face with her tiny sprinkle of freckles and a mouth he wanted to check out more thoroughly, not to mention he couldn't stop thinking about falling into those deep blue ocean eyes of hers. Oh, she suddenly started as if daydreaming herself. At the bottom of this slope, follow the curve around to the left. Gavin nodded. Okay, I'll call you Sophia but I'd like to clear the air after our tense phone calls. I hope you don't think I'm the rudest person you've ever met. Not so far, Mr. Spencer. You're quite different in person, actually. I hope that's a good thing. She laughed. <laughs> yes, it is. I'm relieved, too. I wasn't sure whether I was going to punch you or ignore you. Gavin laughed. She actually had a sense of humor. A faint scent of evocative perfume filled the cab of the truck, subtle just like she was, but man, she smelled good. He closed his eyes for a second, ordering himself to get a grip. Maybe he was more attracted to her after being away from civilization in Iraq for so long, but then Gavin shook his head. No, that wasn't the only reason he was attracted to her. It was as if the world had suddenly tilted on its axis, he wanted to slide right into the perimeter of Sophia Ambrose's space, cup his hands around her face and touch every single freckle that the sun had kissed along her nose. If Jake knew what he was thinking right now, he'd bash Gavin over the head. He could hear his co-worker now. No falling for paying clients. Things were intense in Iraq the last couple of months. I think I took it out on you, so I apologize. I was probably too intense myself. This is our first oil fire, and it's pretty overwhelming. Before Gavin spent too much time daydreaming over the woman, he had to get a few answers. Your grandmother lives with you? I live with her, but I was born here and grew up here, although I've been away most of the last decade. Will your grandmother be signing the contracts, or your, your husband? Gavin had to ask before he burst with curiosity. Sophia's left hand was bare of any wedding ring, and she called herself Miss Ambrose, although rings didn't always tell you the full story, and using the term Miss was a Southern thing, even for older married women. Sorry for the personal questions. I'm only trying to get a handle on who is legally in charge, even though you were the one to call us. Um, I'm not married. Ever been married? The question came out of his mouth before Gavin could stop himself. Who wouldn't want to snatch this woman up? But it was a question he should never have spoken out loud. Sorry, scratch that question, he said quickly. It was rude and none of my business. No problem. 
nope, no divorces or annulments or child custody or splitting assets. How about you? Too busy keeping the business running and traveling all over the world for jobs. My grandmother has been the owner, proprietor, and legal custodian of Ambrose Estate, president and CEO of the oil company, although she formed a board of directors with shareholders more than 40 years ago when the wells were pumping at full capacity after my grandfather died. Is your grandmother infirm now? Not at all. She is 88, but healthy in every way. But, Sophia paused, things suddenly changed. Completely. Only about a week ago. Granny has a knack for doing the unexpected. She willed it all to me, the entire estate. I'm the oldest grandchild, so I guess I pulled the shortest straw by default. And I now have to move back here and run everything. Gavin turned on the truck's high beams when they neared the grove of cottonwoods, so he could see her better in the dark. Lucky you. Ha. Huh. Some people think so, but they don't know what they're talking about. They have no idea. She broke off, and Gavin wondered why. What about your parents? Wouldn't they be the ones to inherit? That's a long story. Sorry to pry. I didn't mean to. I get curious about rich Texans with oil estates. I should punch you for that, but I'll be a lady and restrain myself. I deserve that, Gavin told her even as Sophia gave a small laugh and ran a hand through her hair, spilling from her long fingers in the light from the truck's dash. My entire life turned upside down. My grandmother likes to be secretive and surprise people. I confess that I haven't been very happy about it. Probably the reason I was uptight on the phone with you. The fires happened later that same night after the reading of the will. Well, middle of the night. We had a bad thunderstorm. I guess a lightning storm was fitting after an afternoon with the lawyer and my mother and the household employees. Wow. Official wills and all. Bad timing, huh? I have so much to get a handle on. Mostly the oil company. We're losing all the wells that are older than 20 years. But hey, Sophia paused. You don't want to hear my woes. My rich girl problems are petty to you, I'm sure. When Gavin heard the edge of frustration in her voice, he felt sympathy for Sophia Ambrose. I confess that I thought that on the phone, but not so much anymore. I'll try to redeem myself, Sophia said dryly, but she laughed at herself, and Gavin once again saw her sense of humor. I had a life, though, a good one, she added softly. Not that I don't love Ambrose's estate, but I've been on my own for a while, and was about to purchase a vet clinic from a doctor who was retiring. My grandmother lured me here, the wicked woman. Gavin glanced at her. He couldn't help glancing at her over and over again. She was definitely intriguing and lovely in a unique way. Lord you, huh? That sounds suspiciously malevolent. Sophia covered her mouth to suppress another laugh. If you knew Lillian Ambrose, you would be on my side, Mr. Spencer. I am on your side. So, let's get your rigs fixed, and you'll be pumping oil again in no time. I've done this a thousand times now. You're optimistic, which is nice to hear. The fires are absolutely horrifying. I've never seen anything like it before. Gavin wanted to reach out and touch her arm as a gesture of reassurance, but of course, he held himself still and slowed the car across the uneven road. I can see the fire up ahead he said while driving through the corridor of Cottonwoods. It's lighting up the sky. I think it's a little creepy. The spurting oil from underground keeps the fire fed with enough fuel to create a living, breathing blowtorch. You can say that again, Sophia whispered as they entered the flat field of wells. The truck slowed as Gavin eased the vehicle to a stop, lifting his chin to stare through the windshield at the orange and red funnel of flames. The Ambrose oil rigs dotted the landscape for close to three miles, and right now they were silhouetted under a rising half-moon. You got yourself a full-blown doozy of an oil fire, Miss Ambrose, he said with a long, low whistle. Hey, that whistle sounded like you actually like freaking crazy wellfires. A grin spread across his face that he couldn't stop. 
I do admire it in a strange way. They are really something. Every time I see a new one, I get excited all over again. I'll bet you were a pyromaniac when you were a kid, Sophia accused, lighting matches and firecrackers for the fun of watching the flame and hearing them pop, over and over again. That's the first time I've been accused of that, but I'll confess that I stand rightly convicted. Gavin placed a hand over his heart in mock declaration. I used to watch a neighbor boy do that when we were kids on the 4th of July. For sure, I was one of those boys. Just then, you sounded like one of our Louisiana neighbors. You have a good ear. I lived near St. Martinville for a few years when I was growing up, on the banks of the Bayou Tesh while Dad was chief of the fire department in New Iberia. Fishing, hunting, riding bikes, teasing gators once in a while like foolish kids. Good memories, though. Turning in his seat, he gazed at her. Sophia's face bathed in the glow of the fire. Sophia was interesting, smart, and funny. The sound of her laughter was natural and easy when she wasn't restraining herself, as if she needed to watch her dignity and decorum. With every passing minute, he found her more and more attractive. Shall we go admire the Ambrose fires? He asked. Is it safe? You sure yelled at me on the phone a few hours ago about getting too close. I'm sorry about that. You scared me. Can't have my clients frying themselves. What a mercenary you are, Mr. Spencer. He made a grunting sound, not sure if she was making a joke or serious. They didn't know each other well enough yet. We're going to keep our distance from the fires until tomorrow when we have better daylight. When they climbed out of the truck, Jake and Earl joined them. For a couple of minutes, nobody spoke just stared at the enormous billowing cloud of flames and smoke spiraling into the night sky, like a nuclear bomb had gone off. Gavin studied the trajectory of the flames to estimate the height. He couldn't see the damage to the rig itself because it was too dark, of course. On the far side of the first fire, the second oil well that had burst was also flaming nearly as high, like a volcanic eruption that began in the ground which made sense when thousands of gallons of pure, crude fuel were bubbling out of the well because there was nothing to stop it from spurting up. The heat is intense, isn't it? Sophia said behind him. And we're still more than half a mile away. Gavin whirled, his heart leaping inside his chest. Get back, Miss Ambrose. Being this close will send your eyebrows and then your skin will start to melt. Jake moved closer, doing his own survey. Don't scare her, Gavin. I'm not frightened, Sophia insisted. Don't treat me as a delicate woman. Are you insured? Gavin asked. When the heat makes your body burst into flames. Sophia rolled her eyes at him. Really, Mr. Spencer? She asked, one hand on her hip. I'm joking, Sophia, he said, softening his voice, although it was hard with the roar of the fire. Any closer to the fires and they'd be yelling to be heard over the volume of the flames. But I'm deadly serious when I say that I do not want you hurt in any way. She bit at her lip and nodded, staring at the flaming rigs once more. Earl? Gavin turned to shout behind him at the circle of trucks. The spotlights. Getting them off the flatbed and hooked up now, Earl called back. Minutes later, two enormous spotlights were shining huge beams of white light onto the fires. Gavin noticed Sophia standing back while they moved the trucks, then pulled on their heat-proof uniforms over their regular clothes. Flicking on her cell phone light, Sophia moved the beam across the ground. Surely you're not working tonight, are you? Gavin shook his head. We'll set up the two water trucks, one at each fire, to hose down the rigs all night. The water will help diminish the flames so we can have a better look in the morning. Plus, it cools down the broken steel rig and us too so we can get closer to the fire. You mean you work under the spray of water? That's right. Sorry to keep you out here for so long. Don't worry about me. I expected this. We need to move the water trucks closer and get the hoses hooked up. Then I'll take you back to the house. An hour later, the trucks were in position, the hoses attached and clamped. Let it rip, Gavin shouted to his guys. Ten seconds later, the valves were cranked and a hard stream of water shot up into the air, falling straight onto the flames, causing them to billow and writhe. He watched for a couple of minutes, then walked back to the flatbed where the generators for the spotlights were running. 
With Jake's help, he unhooked the flatbed from the truck to leave it at the fireside. Tomorrow, they would return with a second flatbed and two more water trucks while these were refilled. Sophia was leaning against the grill of the truck when he returned. She snapped off her flashlight app, and Gavin watched the flames flicker across her face, making her skin glow and her eyes sparkle. A light breeze lifted her long hair, causing it to stream across her cheeks. He shook his head at the sight of her. Sophia was stunning. I can tell the heat has decreased now that the water's on, Sophia commented. Water's good stuff, Gavin said, unable to keep from smiling at her. Tomorrow we'll get more equipment in here and analyze what it's going to take to fix your wells. Gotta figure out what made them blow. I suppose knowing that would be helpful, Sophia said, a smile crossing her face when she caught Gavin's eye. She was teasing him. What a little smarty pants. A woman who could actually keep up with his wisecracks and dish them back. A woman that actually wanted to be out here on an oil fire. That was a first, and she might be the last. Without a doubt, Gavin would be dreaming about Miss Sophia Ambrose tonight when his head hit the pillow. Chapter 12 Can I offer you a guest room at the house tonight? Sophia asked when Gavin pulled his truck onto the gravel driveway. It's going on 11 now, and Jake and Earl are snoring in the back of your truck. Those two can sleep anywhere, Gavin said in a low voice. Even when we had sniper fire near Mosul. Seriously? Sophia whispered, a chill coming over her at the thought of death so close. That sounds frightening. Some nights it was, but we had the Marines to keep them at bay. She stared at him in the dark of the truck's cab, then quietly opened the door and slid out, her feet crunching on the gravel. I have no idea what to say to that, she said. It sounds so unreal. Hard to focus if you're always looking over your shoulder. Are you glad to be back home in the good old USA? That goes without saying, he replied, lifting an eyebrow. There's no place like home. You're not driving back to Houston tonight, are you? Seriously, we have six guest rooms. You're welcome to them. Thank you, but we need to get back to the warehouse for the rest of our equipment. In the future... If you or your team ever want to avoid the long drive, the offer stands. I appreciate that, Miss Ambrose. Really? We're back to formality? If you call me that again, I'll be tempted to deck you with my right hook. I had the feeling you might say that. I'm forewarned then. Be careful driving. It will be at least noon before you see us. Oh, you're going to be lazy and sleep in, huh? Uh, very funny, miss. I'm sorry. Sophia. That was a close one, Gavin, she said with a sly look. He chuckled, and a shot of warmth spread up Sophia's body at the sound of his low laughter. You'll see a whole lot more than a couple of water trucks tomorrow. Look forward to an interesting day, Sophia said, turning to walk up a narrow path that led to a side door of the house. Good night, then. She felt Gavin's eyes on her back as she crossed the expanse of driveway and passed the garages. Outdoor lights blazed like a beacon, the pathways and trees glittering with light flooding all around the mansion. Sophia personally loved the mansion's evening landscape, but Mr. Spencer's piercing eyes made her feel hot and dizzy, knowing he was watching her. Good grief. How long had it been since a man had gazed at her like he did? His eyes had definitely admired her in the truck, and while they stood discussing the fire from a safe distance. A strong vibe had throbbed between them, and the idea of it was completely disconcerting. Strangest of all, they had talked nonstop all the way out to the oil field. Who would have thought Gavin Spencer would turn out to be the complete opposite of all her assumptions? Even so, she wasn't quite sure what to make of him. He could be hard-headed and mulish, but then so could she. Sophia had the feeling there would be further battles of wills between them before the oil fires were fixed. With light steps, Sophia ran across the stone walkways to the side door and slipped inside. After locking it, she leaned against it while she breathed several slow breaths. I never expected that, she murmured aloud. 
The six decades she had assumed was the age of Mr. Spencer had turned into only three plus. He couldn't be much more than 35. The man was broad and muscular. Of course he was in his line of work, but not bulky. Trim and tall with a chiseled jawline, including a partial beard that made her want to run her finger along his chin. Best of all were those deep green eyes. A mesmerizing color, but not too intense. The man spoke his mind and didn't seem to have a single iota of self-consciousness about him. He was genuine and had teased her several times, too. Gavin Spencer was the same person on the phone, and yet not the same. Much more funny and charming. And that voice. Egads, she could listen to him talk all day long. And yet, he wasn't some kind of smooth operator. Quite the opposite. Gavin Spencer was real and honest with a streak of straightforward Texas candor. Tingles ran up her neck, and Sophia shook her head. After checking the doors, Sophia took one last peek through the stained glass side windows of the entry hall. Mr. Spencer's truck was gone, his red taillights growing smaller on the road back to the highway. She took the stairs quickly and let herself into her room. Yawning at the late hour and busy day, she pulled on a lightweight summer nightgown and sprawled on her bed. A handwritten note lay on her nightstand that hadn't been there earlier, from her grandmother. Remember that in the morning we have an appointment to assess the attic's contents. I also have a hair appointment in town at one o'clock. Good night, sweetheart. G. Sophia's to-do list was growing like crazy. It couldn't be helped. An inventory of the contents of this house was decades overdue. Hopefully she could burn most of it, the ancient files and papers, and give away all the old furniture and clothing stored up in the attic. Or, perhaps, they could go to the Ambrose Historical Society. She didn't relish fighting cobwebs and potential death critters lurking in the corners. Letting out a sudden sigh, Sophia stared at Granny's note while crickets chirped through the open windows. She had actually fibbed to Gavin about her great life, her vet clinic, her great condo, and social life. She had fibbed to everyone, including herself, for a long time. Deep down, she was lonely with no prospects for a family of her own. None of it matters anymore. She berated herself as she stared in the bathroom mirror, putting toothpaste on her brush. Ambrose Estate is your life now, so get over it. She would never put herself in a situation to make a horrible mistake like she did with Brett Anderson again. The seventh anniversary was coming up this autumn, but Sophia would never forgive herself for endangering the man she had thought she might marry someday. Chapter 13 Sophia slept fitfully. As soon as the sun broke the horizon, she pulled on jeans and a t-shirt, downed a bowl of cereal, and was on her way out the door to ride Star. She needed a good hard ride, galloping her horse around the ranch to get her head back on straight. Thirty minutes later, Max came to find her in the barn as she was pulling her saddle off the shelf. Got a visitor, ma'am, he said, tipping his cowboy hat. The firefighters are already here? Mr. Spencer said it would be later. No, it's the lawyer. Sorry, but I can't remember his name. Daniel Gentry is here? That was unexpected. This early? Well, the nerve, huh? I might have still been in bed. Max gave her a grin, taking charge of the saddle and bridle while Sophia jammed her cowboy hat back on her head and emerged from the barn into the slanting morning sun. I'll take care of your tack, ma'am. This shouldn't take very long, but maybe you could ride Star for me today? I was hoping to sneak away before Granny dragged me up to the attic, but I guess duty is calling. I'll have no time after I see Mr. Gentry. Duty has a way of doing that, don't it? You can say that again, Sophia concurred. Thanks, Max. Hopefully I can take an evening ride when it's cooler. Sophia was out of sorts this morning. She'd even dreamed about Gavin Spencer last night, her brain filled with images of their time together on the oil field, his body silhouetted in the glow of the fire. The man was mysterious, quick-witted, charming, and Sophia had a peculiar tug in her chest, almost like she couldn't quite catch her breath. The person she hadn't thought about much since the reading of Granny's will was Daniel Gentry, 
despite his eyes following her around the drawing room and flirting with her over hors d'oeuvres and lemonade. That day seemed like a month ago, even though it was barely a week. So much had happened since then. She gritted her teeth, ran a hand through her hair, and glanced down at her attire. She definitely did not look like the owner of a manor house. Too bad she didn't have time to change and look like the heiress of Manderley. Oops, make that Ambrose estate. There were days she wished she was walking the gardens at Manderley on the Cornwall coast of England. Waves crashing below the cliffs, a long skirt squishing through the grasses and wildflowers. Sophia wanted to deliver puppies in a sterile vet office in her white lab coat and deliver a gangly, adorable filly at the ranch down the road. Instead, she had a mountain full of paperwork with the lawyer, two oil rigs burning up all of the family assets, and one creaky, dusty, ancient attic to tackle at her grandmother's insistent request. There had been another direct hint that morning when her grandmother came down the stairs, just as Sophia was heading out to the barns. Why, oh why, Granny? She muttered as she hiked back to the house from the horse stalls. Why now? Couldn't you have waited until I was at least 50 years old to heap all this on me? Except her grandmother wouldn't be around when Sophia arrived at the ripe old age of half a century. She tried not to take her grandmother for granted. Lillian Ambrose had always been a rock, unwavering with complete love and devotion for her granddaughters. Mr. Gentry, she said smoothly when she entered the morning room where Mrs. B. had put the lawyer. Golden sunshine slanted through the windows, bathing the room in a cheerful glow. This is a surprise. You're out early this morning. I apologize for arriving at the stroke of eight. I know it's not very considerate, although it looks like you've been out riding already. I'm an early riser, but the ride didn't actually happen yet. Then I apologize for intruding on your horse's time. Star will get over it, Sophia assured him. Is there something urgent going on with the estate? No, but I promise these contracts and reports for you to peruse. And unfortunately, I'm leaving for Houston to fly out tomorrow for a conference that my uncle is sending me to. Any place exciting? Phoenix, which hit 110 degrees yesterday. Why the conference is located there baffles me. The organizers must have gotten a good hotel rate, he added with a chuckle. Most likely, Sophia agreed. How long will you be gone? A week. That's why I didn't want to make you wait any longer, in case you needed some fascinating reading material to fill your evenings. Oh, I can hardly wait. That was meant facetiously, of course. Sophia gave him a gracious smile. Yes, that's how I took it. Right, Daniel said, trying to cover up the fluster in his voice. May we set up an appointment upon my return to go over any questions and get a few things signed? Mostly the Ambrose Oil Board documents, making you an official member. I'm pretty flexible right now. Have your secretary call me, and I'll jot it on my calendar. I was thinking, shall we make it lunch, too? Suppressing an inward smile, Sophia said, sure. Daniel Gentry was clumsily hitting on her, and it was endearing, if not a little artless. Weirdly enough, Sophia kept picturing Gavin Spencer's face on the lawyer's shoulders, despite the perfectly pressed suit and dark blue tie. When Daniel handed over a thick packet, he gazed down at Sophia intensely. Their fingers brushed and Sophia took it from him, quipping, That's a heavy folder. Sorry. Transfers of estates and companies get complicated. There's more coming too, so be forewarned. Oh, goody. Sophia said, and Daniel laughed, his eyes crinkling at the corners. We might have to make it two lunches over the next few weeks. I see what you did there, Mr. Gentry, Sophia said, laughing out loud when she shot him a look from the corner of her eye. Please, call me Daniel. The Mr. Tag feels too formal for the time we'll be spending together over the next year. Sophia bit at her lower lip trying to suppress her amusement while Daniel's eyes traveled to her mouth for the briefest of seconds. Okay, Daniel. Have a good trip in Phoenix. 
use the hotel swimming pool to cool off. Uh, Good advice. It should be an interesting conference, all about wills and estates, which is quickly becoming my specialty. Sounds perfect. I'm sorry to make you rush off, but I have a few things I need to do this morning before the firefighters arrive. Daniel frowned. I heard that there's a well on fire. That's a blow with the current estate transfer. Lightning, right? That's what we assume. It was the night of the storm. The board will have to assess how this affects the rest of the oil field. We might have to do some creative budget spreadsheets to make sure everyone gets their regular monthly royalties. Ugh, spreadsheets, Sophia said. I'm glad my grandmother has you and your uncle to figure all that out. I personally hate numbers, despite my business degree. That's why we have accountants and tax lawyers, so the rest of us can do the fun stuff with our businesses. Although, oil isn't exactly fun. Daniel laughed softly. (laughs) The fun part of an oil field is the profit statements. Sophia burst out a genuine laugh. The man had a dry sense of humor after all. Perhaps he wasn't as hopeless as he first appeared. I understand you're an animal person, Daniel went on. Your grandmother said that you were in the middle of purchasing a vet clinic in Houston. Is someone else running that for you while you're here for the next few weeks? No, it was still in negotiations. But this past week has changed everything. I'm sorry, but perhaps you'll enjoy being a part of the company board. I hear the meetings often get quite lively with arguments flying back and forth. I'll let you know on that point. Well, Daniel said finally, planes don't wait. I'll call you when I get back. Email or text if you have any questions, though. I'm always available. Sophia thanked him and showed him to the door. She watched Mr. Gentry slide into his Honda Sentra and back out of the driveway as she leaned against the front door. I have a date with a lawyer. Never saw that one coming. How nice, her grandmother said, coming into the foyer from the drawing room. Granny, you gave me a start. Were you across the hall all this time? I find the armchairs in the drawing room quite comfortable, and I was reading. She held up a worn copy of My Cousin Rachel by Daphne du Maurier. At least you have good taste in your novel reading, Sophia said. Just an hour ago, I was thinking about Manderley by the Sea. Too bad we don't live there. The summers are much more pleasant, and there aren't sick cattle or fires eating up all of one's bank account. Her grandmother arched an eyebrow. Instead, there are boats at the bottom of the ocean in the cove, and dead women shot by their husbands. Well, Sophia drawled, there's that. Now, come, dear, let's head on over to the other side of the house and see what we're dealing with. I confess I have sorely neglected it for far too long. I may not have another decade to examine the history of Ambrose Estate and the generations that came before us. We could toss it all into the oil fire. It would be gone in three seconds, I promise. Very funny, Sophia. Now, take my arm. Sophia took her grandmother's book and set it on the foyer table near the centerpiece of fresh flowers Mrs. B arranged every day. Then her grandmother tucked her arm into Sophia's, and they walked through the hallways until they reached the Hall of the Dead. I refuse to work in the dark, Granny, Sophia said, lighting every lamp and overhead fixture as they passed the family pictures and official portraits. She opened the door at the end of the hallway, and they spent a few minutes perusing the rooms of the original house built by Lillian's grandparents at the turn of the 20th century. There were two sitting rooms, one in the west side of the house and a morning room on the east side, a large drawing room, a library, a music room, and a series of bedrooms on the second floor draped with dozens of dust cloths covering the furniture. Why has all of this been left here to rot and mold? Sophia said, a note of frustration in her voice. We probably should have just torn it all down, Lillian admitted. But we actually used the guest rooms and the music room up until about 15 years ago. Fifteen years? Has it been that long? I guess Lauren, Emma, and I used to roam about this old place and play hide-and-seek when we were young, dare each other to run through the Hall of the Dead in the dark. 
for goodness sake, Sophia, is called the Hall of Memories. You can't blame us for naming it what we did. I mean, there are two actual silver urns with ashes of your brother and my grandfather. We thought it was most gruesome and frightful. Lillian brushed a hand through the air. An old wives' tale. (laughs) There aren't any old wives' tales when it's your own home, Granny, she retorted with a laugh. Still, fifteen years is more than half my sister's ages. Only about one-eighth of my life, Lillian reminded her. Once Poppy left for good with her third husband, or maybe it was her fourth, that horse jockey who broke his neck during his last race, we didn't need to keep so much house open when it wasn't used anymore. But how could I bear tearing it down? It was my grandfather who built it, and it was a grand old place in its heyday. I've always imagined it was a very grand house. The structure is solid, and the woodwork and wainscoting is superb. George, Frederick, and Margaret, my grandparents, held parties and balls and soirees in the music room, catered dinners and intellectuals who came to give lectures in the drawing room. It was quite the place back in the early 20th century. A good long drive, too. Mostly they came from other estates in the vicinity and the town of Ambrose, but this was before radio or television, so having events was their entertainment and a chance to socialize. At first people came in carriages, then it was cars. Sophia gazed into her grandmother's face, and then it was the Depression and the war. Let's not talk about those days. That's when the lack of money took a toll on the Ambrose Manor House. Until the oil my father suspected was under the ground turned into the real thing, we began to drill five months after V.E. Day in May of 45. I was 14 years old. He's the one who began the oil company. His name was Walter Charles Burton. Sophia gazed at her grandmother's sober expression as her dear old granny looked about the rooms when they walked through and discussed each one, including the possibility of remodeling the house to bring it back to its original grandeur. It would probably take a couple of million to do the work that needs to be done, Lillian said thoughtfully. Memories and melancholy were etched into the lines of her face, and her gray eyes held pride and loss. A great project for us, though, don't you think? Sophia gazed at her grandmother with a thoughtful smile. Perhaps they should. And throw the biggest event of the last hundred years to celebrate and show it off. Open it up to the public. It would take several years to restore it all, including the furniture. But perhaps it was long overdue and needed to be done. After all, it was a historical home now, especially for the town of Ambrose. Were any ledgers of the ranch kept from back then? Sophia asked now. Or the deed to the estate? It would be fascinating to read the originals. It might help me know the history of my own family better. To know more about the founding of Ambrose Estate and the old company and the town. Of course, my dear. That's the second most important reason why I wanted you back home with me. To keep the Ambrose Estate running for many decades to come for you and your sisters and future Ambrose generations. Sophia's breath burned in her throat as she held back sudden tears. She placed a hand along the marble fireplace mantel in the drawing room, as if it would help to keep her voice steady. But Granny, there won't be any future generations. You do know that, right? My sisters and I were doomed before we were born. Chapter 14 Lillian reached out to grasp Sophia's hand in an iron grip. Her grandmother was stronger than Sophia realized, despite the tremble in her voice. I don't believe that. I can't believe it. The last few years... Try the last few decades, Granny, Sophia interrupted. Okay, young lady, you win. But I can't give up hope of seeing you all happily married with children running through the halls of Ambrose Estate once more. I think you'll be dreaming until your deathbed. Her grandmother harumphed. <laughs> well, I'm not there yet. 
Sophia turned on her heels, biting at her lips. I'm sorry for being unkind. Some days, it feels like it will never happen. Every single one of us pushes away the men who start to get too serious. We're afraid. Only Ambrose women ever lived to old age. Not a single man did. I don't understand your morose attitude, Sophia. Poppy has six beautiful and talented daughters, and this is the 21st century. Surely you can't believe in a silly old curse. It's only ever been rumors and gossip. Then why did you give us all this pendant when we were 16? Sophia asked, pulling out the necklace with a hard tug in the dim light of a dusty window. It was my way to give you girls strength. I wanted you to be proud of your family and the Ambrose heritage. Perhaps I thought the pendants would keep any silly curse away, banish the ghosts, so to speak, expel the rumors and gossip of so many decades. I guess you don't remember Brett Anderson, then. Lillian reached out to squeeze Sophia's hands. I haven't forgotten. But fate often deals us horribly ugly things. Maybe it really was an accident. It doesn't mean life will always be like that. There can be happiness amongst the sad. If you say so, Granny, Sophia said finally. Sometimes it was easier not to belabor a point. Lillian Ambrose was a master at arguments. Let's begin with the office and the library. I know there are photograph albums and ledgers from the newly minted oil company and invoices and maps of the oil field. All sorts of things. I'm not sure where they ended up. Let's go exploring then, Sophia said. One room at a time. You explore. I'll tag along behind to keep you company, my dear. Thank goodness I had Mrs. B clean two weeks ago, so we don't sneeze our heads off. We even hired two extra girls from town to help when I decided it was time to go through the old house. For the next two hours, Sophia created piles. At one point, she fetched a stack of cardboard boxes from the storage cabinet in the kitchen pantry and taped the flaps together. The office desk had stacks of Ambrose Oil Company ledgers and file folders with yellowing invoices and bank statements and lists and scribbles. Whose handwriting is this, she asked at one point, noting that there were three different sets of penmanship. Lillian studied the samples of all three and then laid them down. These ledgers here are the oldest and written in my grandfather's hand. These over here are my father's. He used to write me notes to tuck into my school lunches when I was a girl. And these are my husband's. Those are the easy ones to recognize. I still have the love letters Richard and I sent to each other when he served with the army in Korea. Now those I want to read, Sophia teased. So romantic. Not until I'm dead and buried, young lady. Okay, okay. Maybe I should just burn them. Oh, please no, Granny. I'll bet they're lovely and sweet. And they chronicle a time that has already disappeared into the archives of history. Richard was a very kind man, Lillian said, moisture in her eyes. It's astonishing how much I still miss him after 48 years. Sophia slipped an arm around her grandmother's stooped shoulders. I'm sorry you've had to do everything alone for so long. Oh, don't be sorry for me. When he passed, I was as robust and healthy as you are now. And when tragedy happens... There's only so many days you can lie in bed weeping and moping. Then you realize that your entire life will fall apart forever if you keep lying in bed. Besides, she added with a glint of sass in her eyes, after a few weeks, it becomes very boring. The library only held books, old leather tomes about the early days of Texas and land grants and early settlers including some fascinating accounts of the shootout at the Alamo, 60 years before her great-great-grandfather was granted the land for the ranch, sometime in the 1890s. Sophia thumbed quickly through the shelves full of dusty novels and etiquette books, historical and philosophical books that creaked when Sophia opened them. Where to next, she asked. A quick look through the bureaus and tables in the bedrooms, but most likely anything else will be in the attic. 
her grandmother was correct. Sophia perused the bookshelves in each of the bedrooms, but they were mostly novels, old Bibles, and a set of books about the Renaissance era. At the end of the upstairs hallway, past empty bedrooms and bathrooms, there was a pull-down set of stairs that led to the attic. I believe the attic extends across most of the house, Lillian said as they made their way up the rickety steps. Are you sure you want to come up? Sophia asked, testing each step before she put her weight on it. And is there any light up here? There should be a couple of hanging lights with a switch on the wall near the door. The attic was finished off, although I can't vouch for its cleanliness or lack of spiders. <laughs> How comforting, Granny, Sophia chuckled as she fumbled for the switch. Immediately, two lights hanging from either end of the attic spilled bright light into the shadowy corners as they slowly walked past the doorway. Not too bad, her grandmother said. The light bulbs are fairly new and in working order. Lillian stood in the center of the long rectangular room with its old wooden floorboards and dingy paint-peeling walls. The ceiling was low, but not too bad. My cousins and I used to play up here during family reunions, back during the Depression and the war years, when money was scarce and we had to make up our own games and sew our own dolls out of scraps and yarn. Happy times, actually. I love to look out these dormer windows and pretend I was a princess locked in a tower. Sophia joined her at the window that looked out over the grounds of the rear of the house. The swimming pool sparkled under the morning sun. This part of the house has a lot of memories for you, doesn't it? She had noticed that her grandmother avoided the old master bedroom that she had shared with her husband. They had inspected a few of the guest rooms in the old nursery-slash-playroom, but her grandmother made an about-face at the end of the hall. Now her grandmother moved about the attic, leaving fingerprints in the dust on the old furniture and trunks and boxes. Goodness, there's that old sewing dummy. I'd forgotten about it. It looks like it's out of an old movie. My grandmother and my mother sewed all of our clothes and their own. That was typical for those days, they taught me, but I gave up after sewing little pinafores for Poppy when she was young. I'd much rather be out riding my horse or getting into trouble with the cows. I suppose I'm more like you than I realized, Sophia told her. Well, don't sound so depressed about it, Lillian said, giving her granddaughter a feigned look of outrage. Oh, Granny, I'm just surprised to finally realize it at the ripe old age of 32. Oh, to be 55 years younger. I'd give the other Texas oil families a run for their money. Who says you didn't? And that I won't, Sophia said, speaking words she never thought would come out of her mouth. You took over the oil company at only 40 years of age, and now there's a few million in shares and stocks and savings. Her grandmother sucked in a breath. There's the spirit I knew you had within you, she said. You are the right choice for Ambrose Estate. We're losing money fast right now, though, Sophia shot back. There's a lot to figure out. I'm not worried, but I must get downstairs. I need to have a bite to eat before my hair appointment. You're deserting me to this mess? Give it an hour of your time to assess what's here before your firefighters arrive. My firefighters? Lillian blinked coyly placing a benign smile on her face. Mrs. B's voice called from the bottom of the attic staircase. Are you ladies up there? I've been searching the house for 20 minutes. We're here, Sophia said, peeking down the stairs at the housekeeper who stood in the hallway below. I guess I should have told you where we were going. I finally figured it out, Miss Sophia. It was the only place left to look. Granny's coming down now. Let me help you down the stairs, Miss Lillian. Mrs. B said affectionately, holding out a hand. I have your lunch ready, and Shelton is already looking for you to leave for town. We have plenty of time, if I eat quickly, Lillian said, glancing at her watch. Have fun, Granny. Oh, yes, a perm and a cut is so enjoyable, her grandmother said with a bite of sarcasm. I always get a crick in my neck lying back on the sink basin. Once her grandmother was gone... Sophia turned back to the attic. There was so much here that it was overwhelming. Yet at the same time, 
It felt like she was on an expedition to uncover the history of her ancestors. She had never played in the attic. The newer part of the house was built during Poppy's time, and that's the only place Sophia had ever known. She had her own bedroom and her own playroom, including her own spiral staircase that led up to the lookout. None of her other friends had anything so cool. Emma should be here with me, Sophia suddenly said, plopping down onto the swivel desk chair. She's the excavator, the archaeologist who loves old things. Even so, a sense of adventure shot through her stomach. Since she didn't have much time before Gavin, uh, the Spencer oil specialist, arrived, she'd figure out what was most important. The furniture was just that. Couches and bed frames and old armchairs, including a scratched dining room table missing its matching chairs. All this furniture is completely unusable, she mused aloud. I should get Shelton to haul it all to the dump. Maybe an antique store, if someone had the skill and the time to refinish them. Or let Granny pick out her favorites to preserve, and I'll hire someone to do them. At the far end of the attic sat an old desk. Beside it, a trunk and wooden filing cabinet. This was where Sophia figured she would find Ambrose Estate's beginnings. First, she opened all the drawers and cubby holes at the massive oak desk. Most were empty, save for a few faded invoices from the 1940s and 50s, or rusted paper clips, dried up pens and pencils worn to nubs. Another drawer held construction paper and glue and scissors, perhaps from her mother's childhood in the 60s. Stacks of life magazines with pages ripped out for collages, better homes and gardens, and eight copies of McCall's with paper dolls to cut out. Although, mostly, it was the empty cutouts where the dolls and their dresses, shoes, and coats used to be. The filing cabinet was stuffed with corporate files and the original land tract sold to her great-great-grandfather from 1895 in fancy, old-fashioned handwriting. Sophia paused to stare at the documents with his name beautifully written with real ink in a fine hand. 1895. So that's when the Ambrose family purchased it. There were also documents about the land acreage and water rights and mineral rights. George Frederick Ambrose III had the foresight to keep the mineral rights instead of selling them, which was important when oil was discovered almost 50 years later. More invoices, hundreds of them, typed with uneven lettering on old typewriters from decades ago, fast-fading and hard to read, cattle sales and branding, the purchase of horses with pedigrees, Scrawled receipts from one of her ancestors selling produce in the farmer's market at Ambrose Village. They were certainly industrious, Sophia mused, thumbing through the stacks of papers as she was rolling back the last hundred years. Then came the oil well records and ledgers. Oil was struck while digging a well for water, out on the far acreage for cattle that had grown to a couple of thousand. Oil spurted up instead of water. There were a lot of expense receipts with that, of course the drilling, pumping, and purchase of equipment to establish an entire oil field spanning 200 acres. Often, people went broke drilling, only to find out that there wasn't much oil below the earth at all. The Ambrose family was fortunate. Sophia noticed that the tall stacks of cardboard file boxes stacked beside the desk and filing cabinet were marked with annual dates in ascending order from the establishment of the Ambrose Oil Company. A brief glance told her that she wasn't going to get lost in itemized receipts from 80 years ago. She wanted to find something more personal. Were there more photographs of her great-great-grandparents, or baby clothes, or party gowns? It was time to tackle the messy pile of trunks with leather straps and padlocks, if the locks weren't permanently rusted. They weren't, not even fully latched, when Sophia knelt on the floorboards and lifted the lid. A strong, musty odor rose up like an ancient, swirling mist. Dried roses and blue periwinkle petals lay in lace sachet bags. Bingo, Sophia whispered, lifting up delicate lace shawls, petticoats, parasols, mufflers, and fine silk stockings, along with tiny waisted taffeta dresses. A second held baby clothes, bonnets, and mittens. A third trunk held hat boxes with finely milled and stylish hats and several colors of velvet with ribbons and feathers galore, although they had become crushed and delicate with time and age. 
The clothing was definitely a style from the late 19th century. There were even two bustles of the 1890s variety. How uncomfortable it would have been to wear these during hot Texas summers. Sophia figured they must have belonged to Margaret Florence Thorne Ambrose, who married George Frederick Ambrose II. What was their story? How long had they been in the country, and where did they come from? How did they end up in Texas, of all places, instead of the east or west coast? Her stomach rumbled. She was famished. What time was it? Rising to her feet to stand at one of the windows she had cracked open for fresh air, Sophia checked her cell phone. It was after one o'clock. Not a word from Spencer Oil Fire Specialists. Where were they? She was losing revenue every single minute. The shareholders were soon going to be complaining. Oh, she blurted out. The sound of her phone was down. She had received a text from Gavin Spencer an hour ago while she was poring over all this old stuff. Sophia, we will arrive about two. Had to hunt down some equipment. See you then. Brief and to the point. She glanced down at herself. Her clothes were covered in dust, and she needed to eat lunch before they arrived. It was time to pack this up for now. Sorry, Granny. I'll have to do all of this after we get our well working again. Since I'm stuck here for the next 60 years, I think I'll have plenty of time, she added facetiously. Returning to the boxes and trunks, Sophia kneeled down to close up the trunks, taking another quick peek at a fourth one. Such fancy clothes. She wanted to shake them out and take a better look. Maybe tomorrow. But this was interesting. A fifth trunk held only black clothing. Black dresses, black shawls, black petticoats, black stockings and shoes. Layers and layers of them packed tightly and pressed down. These are morning clothes, Sophia said, the fact striking her. So many morning clothes. Someone must have grieved for years. The style was the same as the other old trunks, full of late 19th century and early 20th century styles and dress lengths. These had to be Margaret's, too. How long had she mourned her husband? Or were there other instances of grief that Sophia was unaware of? Sophia folded the black dresses and petticoats back into the trunk, but it was difficult due to the sheer amount. After taking them out, they weren't folding back into the same space very well. Then her hand hit something hard. Well, not exactly hard like a book, but more like a cardboard box. Reaching down to the bottom, Sophia's fingers curled around the box, and she brought it to the surface, setting it in her lap. It was a cardboard box, with curved flaps, black and square and homemade it appeared. The box was flimsy with age, but it had been tied with string several times over, as if the person who had put it in the trunk hadn't wanted anyone to get into it very easily. Untying the string, well, actually more the thick cord, Sophia finally worked out all the tight knots and opened the lid. She let out a small gasp, her heart in her throat. Personal mementos lay inside, Small family photographs, framed in cherry wood, several pieces of jewelry, a stunning ivory brooch, an entire stack of small square letters with no names on the front of the envelopes. Last of all was a small notebook. Sophia cracked the cover and discovered that it was filled with the perfect penmanship of a female hand, although the ink was fading a bit. On the inside fly it read, Margaret Florence Thorne Ambrose. The first page had the date of January 9th, 1893, written at the top. She quickly flipped to the very end of the book. The date was August 31st, 1912. Oh my gosh, Sophia whispered hoarsely. This is the journal of my great-great-grandmother. She had kept the diary for 19 years, but it wasn't thick enough to hold old entries for so many years. As Sophia thumbed through to assess the contents, she saw that there were months, even years, without any entries. Margaret Ambrose had recorded events sporadically until 1911 and 1912, when entries suddenly flooded the diary pages. Sophia rose with shaky legs and clutched the journal to her chest. This was the best find up here. She couldn't wait to begin reading it. Did her grandmother know about it? Had anyone besides Margaret ever read it? What secrets lay within its pages? 
Or was it merely a recording of mundane ranch details about crops and weather? Glancing inside the delicate cardboard box, Sophia found one last document, a thick paper with the names and dates of George and Margaret's family, like a genealogy chart. Okay, I'm taking this too, Sophia said, then quickly closed the trunk, turned off the lights to the attic, and ran downstairs. It felt like she had just stolen something, but if Ambrose's estate was hers now, everything belonged to her, and she desperately needed a few answers to a whole slew of questions. Chapter 15 When she got to her room, Sophia couldn't wait to peek at the first of the journal entries. They were mostly short and to the point, a recording of the major events in her life. The Life Recordings of Margaret Florence Thorne Ambrose April 23rd, 1893 Today I married George Frederick Ambrose II, the man I have loved since I was 16 years of age. In February, I turned 19, and father finally gave his permission. Mother wept behind her lace handkerchief, like the dainty lady she's always been. Our seamstress created a perfect pink satin gown, and George told me I looked like a princess, with my long hair dressed in ringlets and jeweled combs. It was a beautiful spring day, and after the wedding supper, we danced past midnight. Wedding guests numbered over one hundred, and the grounds were covered in buggies. All of our neighbors said it was the wedding of the decade. Father has bestowed a most generous wedding gift upon us of three thousand pounds. George has always wanted to immigrate to America, but I shall do my best to convince him to accept Father's offer of a position at his law firm in London. I am certain that we shall be most happy. Gavin Spencer arrived precisely at two o'clock. Sophia had stowed the journal and genealogy charts in her nightstand drawer, eaten a quick sandwich for lunch, and then opened the door when she heard the rumble of trucks entering the ranch gates. Astonished, she gazed at the convoy of equipment and personnel. It must take a large crew to put out a well fire. Good afternoon, Miss Ambrose, Gavin said, tipping his cowboy hat when she appeared at the front door. I thought we had agreed to Sophia for me and Gavin for you, Mr. Spencer she told him primly. I didn't want to appear too presumptuous. Okay, cowboy, cut out the formalities. This is Texas, remember? If you say so, ma'am. She stuck a hand on her hip and cocked her head. I am ten seconds away from punching you. He lifted his shoulders in an endearing shrug. His eyes honed in on hers. As I recall... Our first phone conversations were a little rough around the edges. I thought we declared a truce last night. The expression on his face was handsome and charming. Sophia felt a definite flutter in her stomach, waves of heat throbbing through every inch of her skin. She broke out into a light sweat and realized she had been holding her breath, too. When it's dark and late at night, people let down their guards, Gavin said now. I didn't know if your guard had gone back up this morning. I'm not that capricious, he nodded. Good to know. I think we'll have a good working relationship from now on then. I hope so too, Sophia said faintly. We'll head out to the oil fields right away, unless you have any new information to give us. Nope, Sophia shook her head. But I'd like to go with you. I've put aside the next day or two to be on site and watch the operation. It could take longer than that, depending on what we find out there, now that we're here during daylight hours. That long? Sophia stopped, hoping it didn't sound as though she was impatient for them to be gone. Actually, she could stand here and admire Gavin Spencer's amazing shoulders and melt under his magnetic voice all day. I mean, wow, there's a lot to it. I had no idea. Gavin's lips lifted into a smile, and Sophia had to clamp her teeth shut to keep from dropping her jaw. That smile was like a bolt of lightning striking at her gut. No, her heart. Maybe her soul. Good grief, what was wrong with her? Most people are surprised, he said. 
I'll come back and give you a report when we see what we're dealing with, but it may be a few hours. No report needed. I'm coming with you. It might be a little boring. Doesn't sound boring to me. I want to know for the future, you know, in case she stopped, not sure what she was trying to say. Do you plan on having more well fires? He asked, openly grinning at her now. Of course not. But if I'm in charge of, of everything, I mean, Ambrose estate now, there could be more oil fires, especially over the next 50 years. 50 years? Wow. I've never known anyone to plan out their life for that long before. He was openly teasing her now. Okay, you may shut up now, Mr. Spencer, she growled while laughing at the same time. I thought I was going to be Gavin, not Mr. Spencer. You'd better give me a list of the rules so I don't mess up. A burst of laughter exploded from Sophia's throat. Shall I make up a list of rules so we both know where we stand, Gavin? Deal. He reached out to shake her hand and Sophia moved forward. She didn't want to appear so eager, but she was eager to know what his hand felt like in hers, his skin against her own, and it was shockingly amazing, as if her entire being had been turned into a halo of light. Her reaction to Gavin Spencer was stronger and more exhilarating than any she had ever had before with a man, even Brett, the man she had almost married seven years ago before everything went so horribly wrong. Gavin held her hand in his for a few seconds longer than a normal handshake, and Sophia felt her insides quaking. Do you want to ride in my truck with me? Gavin said softly, opening the vehicle passenger door. Um, sure, she said, trying to strike a casual tone. Why not? When she climbed into his truck, Sophia told herself not to act like a complete 16-year-old idiot, since she was twice that age. This is what happened when a girl rarely dated. She became silly and tongue-tied around men. But there was something definitely different with Gavin. Opening her door and helping her into the passenger seat was not something a hired contractor would normally do. Once he jumped into his side of the cab, Gavin turned the key in the ignition, rolled down his window, and gestured to the convoy to follow them. Do you think the water trucks on the fires did the trick? Sophia asked as they bounced along the dirt roads. If it's a small one, maybe, sometimes. But you got yourself an enormous plume of fire and smoke. I'm guessing the fire column is bigger now than it was earlier this week. You're right, it is, Sophia said, relaxing into the leather bucket seat. Gavin had an unusually luxurious truck, considering it was a work truck. Seeing the fire against the dark sky is really overwhelming like something out of a movie. First time is the worst, but they can take your breath away. I'm thinking you're a blowout preventer, Blue. If your wells have blowout preventers on the pipes, do you know? I have no idea. It's a good question. Somebody from your oil company should be here. Quickly, Gavin added. I mean, besides you, of course. I didn't mean to diminish your role. No offense taken, I'm such a newbie. I have about a thousand things to learn. He shifted gears, slowly as they neared the cottonwood grove. Staring through the windshield, Gavin whistled at the writhing column of black smoke. That's an impressive cloud you got. Sophia let out a whistle of her own, and Gavin burst out laughing. What's so funny, Mr. Spencer? She said indignantly. I've never heard a woman whistle as fine as you just did. Uh, a boy at college taught me. Gavin glanced at her, as if sensing that he had touched on a nerve. You continue to amaze me, he told her, shaking his head. Wait until you hear me at a Texas A&M football game. Am I going to have the chance at that? Sophia grew flustered. I didn't mean anything by that. Hmm. Was all he said as he pulled into the flat clearing, making way for the trucks following. Wipe that silly grin off your face, Sophia ordered. You make me smile, in a good way, a very good way. I can see that my list of rules is going to grow exponentially. I look forward to going over it with you sometime. 
It's becoming obvious that you are going to be difficult, Sophia said, trying to strike a sardonic tone while she tried hard not to laugh. Or maybe the word is irredeemable. Kevin shut off the engine and jogged around the hood to open Sophia's door before she could. So, I have to redeem myself, huh? Maybe, Sophia said, lifting her chin to gaze up at him. The closeness of him was making her dizzy. She found herself getting lost in his eyes, but she liked it too much. After a moment, Sophia realized that Gavin was studying her face, his eyes roving over her features. I apologize for staring at you, he finally said. Why are you staring? I hope this doesn't sound too forward, Miss Sophia Ambrose, he began. But you are a very beautiful woman. Then again, you probably hear that a lot. Oh, at least a thousand times a day, she said, letting out a sharp laugh. Not. Confusion crossed his face. Are you making fun of me? Not at all. Sophia touched his arm, worried he might think she was laughing at him. I'm very flattered, actually. No, it's not something I hear very often. He made my day. His brow knit together. You're joking, right? I'm perfectly serious. That defies logic, Sophia Ambrose, Gavin said quietly. It was actually perfectly logical, but Gavin didn't know that Sophia didn't receive compliments very often. Ever since Brett, she had spent years avoiding men. Gavin glanced at the trucks and the equipment being hauled in. Perhaps, he said slowly, I can take you to dinner sometime and we can discuss this in more detail. Gavin was asking her to dinner? That defied logic, too. Did I hear you correctly? She asked, keeping her eyes on the trucks so she didn't melt from the heat in his eyes. Perhaps when this is all over and life returns to normal, Gavin said. Normal? I don't have a normal any longer. It will, he said. But let's not wait too long. I tend to get impatient. You do, huh? Don't get too eager, Mr. Spencer, Sophia teased. I can be a dangerous person to associate with. Let me be the judge of that. I'm pretty good at danger. Not this kind, I assure you. Very hazardous to your health. Huh, he said with a small grunt. That's pretty cryptic. Now I'm more curious than put off. Sophia bit at her lips. She was actually dying to have dinner with this intriguing man, but she had to squash the idea before she got her hopes up. Speaking of dangerous, Gavin said, do you want to come and watch your fire grow bigger? Sophia's head spun. What does that mean? First thing we need to do is gut that sucker, which means pulling down all that twisted broken metal off the rig so we can get to the pipes. Are you telling me that you work on the main oil pipe? while the fire is roaring all around you. You must have a death wish. Yeah, but I have magical clothes. Did you bring any binoculars? It's a guideline to keep observers more than a quarter mile away. I might fight you on that rule. Gavin touched her shoulder. I'm serious. Accidents do happen. I want you safely out of range of burning debris, toppling off the rig. Now. I'm going to go change into my magic suit. Can't wait to see that, Mr. Spencer. Sophia watched him stride off to a smaller trailer, pulled behind the black company truck, bearing the logo of Spencer Oil Fire Specialists. Stepping inside, Gavin disappeared from view. It was about the size of a camping trailer. A few minutes later, Gavin and Earl and Jake and several other men emerged one by one, wearing blue company jumpsuits with the name of the company and their own name stitched onto the front left pocket. From the supply truck, they pulled on a second set of silver-colored flame-retardant clothes, along with a face mask, gloves, and boots. The cranes and bulldozers were ready to go, and Sophia was mesmerized as Gavin directed his guys in taking down the grotesquely twisted steel rigging around the flaming well, using claws on the truck and the cranes. The well had been burning for nearly a week now and was a mangled mess. Between the roaring of the out-of-control fire and the heavy equipment engines, 
The place was incredibly noisy. Gavin's team were wearing earplugs, and he had given Sophia a pair, too. The water trucks were still blasting a strong spray, and three men stood behind body-length metal shields manning the hoses. Everything was soaking wet, the earth turning muddy while the men and equipment stood under a cloud of water misting in the air while Sophia's eyes watered from the acrid smoke. A new vehicle arrived on the scene, moving around the line of cottonwoods and into view. It was an ambulance, pulling up next to the water tanks, and she walked a little closer, worried that someone had been hurt. Gavin spotted her and left Earl directing the crane to jog over to her. Sophia, he shouted over the noise of the machinery. An ambulance just pulled up, she shouted back. Is someone hurt? Gavin shook his head. Merely a precaution. We always have an emergency vehicle and a couple of EMTs on standby. Sophia lifted an eyebrow. That's quite an expense. It is, but worth it. Accidents sometimes happen, and I don't want any of my guys having to travel an hour or two to the nearest hospital. Sophia stared at him behind the face mask and full set of fireproof clothing. He was dripping wet and carrying a shovel, and she couldn't stop herself from moving closer so she wouldn't have to shout as loud over the fire's noise. You really do have a dangerous job. I, I admire you, and I fear you might be a little crazy. She tried to make light of it, but deep down she was serious. Gavin touched her hand, his gloves grazing her skin. I've been doing this for 15 years. So far, we've never had any serious injuries, a few burns, sprained ankles. We take every precaution and go slow and careful. Now, stay back another hundred feet while this rig comes down, or I'm going to make you change into your own fireproof suit. Aye, aye, Captain Spencer, Sophia said, giving him a salute. You are a wily woman, he shot right back, jogging back to the rig as the crane pulled the last of the rigging off. The 200-foot-tall rigging fell to the ground in a mass of sizzling hot and twisted pieces. The bulldozers got to work, pushing it out of the way of the rest of the crew so they could move about the work site more easily and get closer to the pipe gushing the spout of fire. Jake came over, folding his arms over his chest. Enjoying the show? he asked. It's a much busier operation than I expected, but fascinating. Why are all the bulldozers moving the rigging so far away? Sophia shielded her eyes as they dragged the twisted metal at least a thousand feet away in the opposite direction. The whale's rigging was currently steaming under the cold, blasting water. The rigging is so hot, it could reignite the fire, even after we get it down to a single flame stream. Once the pipe is cut and the fire isn't out of control any longer, we can blow the fire out. What do you mean, blow it out? When it's this big of a fire that's been burning for so long, and our water is barely touching it, we use nitrogen to create an explosion. Sophia stared at him in disbelief. Wouldn't an explosion make things worse? No, ma'am. The explosion sucks the oxygen out of the fire. You'll see it disappear after the nitro takes it out. Then we're left with a single shooting spout of pure oil straight from the ground. Fascinating. How long will all this take? Another couple of days. Depends on how hard it is to get the broken blowout preventer off. At the moment... We're also waiting for the drilling contractor to re-rig his pumps and get us a new well cap. It's a pretty big piece, weighs more than 200 tons and 50 feet tall. It has to come out on a heavy semi with a crane that can handle the weight. But first, the new well cap has to be installed. Then we can put a brand new blowout preventer on after that. Will Gavin extinguish the fire today and then wait for the new well cap? Jake shook his head. We won't kill the fire until the well cap is here. It has to go on immediately, fast as possible. Why's that? So nothing new, a spark, the wind blowing stuff over from the other well fire, ignites it all over again. Once the fire is out, oil starts gushing up at the sky. Gallons per minute. That's a whole lot of raw fuel. Good grief, Sophia said, picturing what he was talking about. 
If a spark comes in on the wind, how fast will the fire start up again? Instantly, Jake turned sober eyes to her. The entire thing explodes all over again. If any of you are working on it at the time, Sophia grew cold at what Jake was saying. The entire crew would go up in flames and be killed instantly. I don't mean to scare you, Miss Ambrose. She shook her head, but her heart was pulsing in her throat. This was probably the reason they didn't want outside observers on the site. Thanks for all the information about the process. It's good to know for the future. Although, I hope these two fires are the only ones that ever happen on my land. Your wells are old. That's probably why they were vulnerable. That and a good crack of lightning. Mother Nature takes no prisoners, that's for sure. Looks like Gavin is ready for the next part. Cutting the pipe to the nub to stop the 50-foot wide fire. Chapter 16 Gavin's eyes were riveted to Sophia's slim body and long legs while she talked with Jake across the field. Today was not the day he thought he'd meet the girl he wanted to marry. That was a pretty crazy thought, but it was true. Since his dad's early retirement from the business, Gavin had spent so much time keeping it going and lucrative, he hadn't met a woman he was interested in for a couple of years. But meeting Sophia Ambrose was a shocking revelation. No other woman he'd known had such an emotional and physical effect on him like she did. Behind her beautiful feminine appearance was a tough and sharp woman with an amusing sense of humor. In addition to that, Sophia was dark and mysterious and sexy as sin. Gavin wanted to be in Sophia's orbit every single minute. There was an inexplicable zap in his gut when his eyes caught hers in that beautiful heart-shaped face. Took hours last night to fall asleep from thinking about her. Unfortunately, their relationship was a professional one, and he needed to keep it that way before his eyes betrayed the attraction he felt toward her, and she slapped him silly. I'm afraid the job is going to be delayed, he told her when she approached him and he took off his helmet and goggles. The well cap isn't here yet, but we're going to get the pipe cut before we leave here for the day. The fire won't be as wide and dangerous once we cut the pipe. That'll reduce the chance of sparks spreading on the wind to another rig. How dangerous is it to cut the pipe? Gavin gave her a grin. It's all dangerous, but I've done it before. If you say so, she said skeptically, shaking her head at him. So tell me, how much of your body will get singed while you stand smack dab in the middle of the flames? I'm a walking alien in my silver space suit. Untouchable. Are you referring to off-duty untouchable hours, too, or just on duty? Gavin sucked in a quick breath. Was she flirting with him? Her sparkling eyes and little laugh made him want to kiss that grin right off her face. She examined him. Hey, a minute ago, you were dripping water from the blast of the hoses. Now you're completely dry. You must be magic. The heat sucks up any moisture really quick. Stay out of here while we work on the pipes, okay? I'd feel better about you being on the scene if you remain by the ambulance and the equipment trucks. I won't move an inch, but please come back in one piece. I can guarantee that I would be extremely disappointed if I didn't. Sophia gave him a smile, despite the concern in her eyes. It was nice to know she was worried about him. After Gavin put his helmet back on and locked the face guard in place, he signaled Earl to help him do the cutting of the pipe. Using corrugated steel shields to move in towards the fire, he and Earl reached the main pipe. It was like walking into a volcano while red flames roared continuous fiery waves around them. The water trucks moved in closer, blasting Gavin and Earl with a shower of continuous water while they worked. Gavin was aware of Sophia watching him through the binoculars across the field, but he had to put her out of his mind to focus on the work at hand. Using steel cutters, he and Earl worked feverishly to remove the bolts of the damaged cap and blowout preventer. Next, 
They sawed the pipe off to make a clean cut to prevent the flames from continuing to spiral out of control. At last, it was done, and Gavin watched the fire change directions. At least it wasn't windy. The fire created its own wind, of course, but it was a hot, clear Texas day, and the cottonwood grove nearby made a nice windbreak as well. He and Earl backed up, making sure they held fast to their tools and watching as the billowing flames diminish into one upward stream of red and orange, reaching straight up to the sky. Too bad the water wasn't putting it out. Some of the oil fires in Iraq had been doused with salt water, but this one was too tall. Shedding his heavy flame retardant suit and helmet, Gavin breathed more easily despite the sweat dripping down his face. He high-fived Earl, who went to check to see how much nitro they had to create a blast. That's amazing what you and Earl did there, Sophia said, appearing beside him. Gavin spun around to face her. I never would have guessed you guys would actually stand inside the fire to bring it under control like that. She had walked forward, staring at the fire shooting straight up out of the pipe, and Gavin took her arm to move her farther away. I'm sorry, Sophia. I don't mean to manhandle you, but we're still a little too close for comfort. That's quite all right, she said with a shrug. It was incredible to watch you two cutting off the pipe. It really works, doesn't it? Making a clean stream of flame. Now what happens? I hope the water would bring it down so we could cap it, but it looks like we're going to have to nitro it. The problem is that we have your second well fire, not even half a mile from here. I'm hoping that if the new well caps both arrive tomorrow, we could nitro them at the same time. I need my entire crew here to perfectly time the explosion and cap and lock it all down. Is that possible? Yeah, we've done it before. A few times in Mosul. A few weeks ago. Just have to get everything timed right. He ran a hand through his sweaty hair and wished he didn't look like such a filthy schmuck in front of Sophia. She didn't seem to notice but she was probably too polite to say anything. Gavin yearned to get to know this woman, but she was hard to figure out, a little aloof, as if she had a hard inner core, but there was a vulnerability in her eyes that made him want to protect her. On the airplane back home from Iraq, he had done research on the Ambrose family. They were oil rich, and Sophia would, probably, never look at him if he looked at her. Jake ran up, holding his cell phone. Got a call, boss. Who is it? Barco manufacturer? Gavin held the phone up to his ear while Sophia wandered off to give him space. Yeah, this Don? The fabricator plant supervisor spoke in his ear. Hey, Mr. Spencer, I wanted you to know that we can get both well caps out to you tomorrow. What are the roads like out to where the fires are? I understand it's private property. Yes, Ambrose Ranch but the roads are decent, pretty passable. You should have no trouble, unless we get a big thunderstorm and there's mud and your heavy trucks like to sink, but I don't think rain is in the forecast. It's a long drive from South Houston, but we'll try to get there no later than 11 tomorrow. We need to blow these babies first, so 11 sounds good. You got cranes, right? Yep, we'll load first thing and get on the road no later than 8. When Gavin clicked off his phone, Sophia was watching him. For a few moments, he was self-conscious, wondering what she was thinking. You said your dad started the company, right? Did he retire, or is he at another job? Do you have multiple teams? I'm curious. No, we don't have multiple teams, Gavin said, knowing that he was deflecting her original question. Our equipment is expensive and we often have to get it specially made. We actually have equipment in all the major cities in the South. Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Lake Charles, Atlanta, Nashville, Charleston. That sounds pretty pricey. I don't understand why you keep expensive equipment in so many locations. We can't take time to transport. Most fires can't wait that long. Unless your name is Ambrose. Then you have to wait almost a week. Hey, that's not fair. I was 10,000 miles away. She was giving him a hard time, so he dished a little bit back to her. 
You could have called one of the other fire outfits in town. But I wanted the best Houston team. And you got it. As fast as I could get to you. I'm honored, she said with a grin. But I know your team and you must be tired and still getting used to a new time zone. Be careful. What you guys do is way too risky. Thanks for the warning, Gavin said, giving her a wink. Okay, I know you know that, but I had to say it. Thank you for your concern. Truly, I appreciate it. So, did your father retire already? Sophia hadn't forgotten her original question, although he was hoping she had. For sure, Gavin would like to forget. The muscles in his face twitched, and a wave of emotion ran through him. Sophia must have caught the expression on his face, including the delay in his answer, because she gave a small laugh to lighten the tension he was exhibiting. You don't have to answer. I'm not trying to pry. Goodness knows, my family has a lot of skeletons in our closets. It's okay, he said, knowing it wasn't right to keep her in the dark. This crazy career got to my father's head. He started drinking heavily. I finally had to kick him off jobs. He became a danger to everyone. He's now a full-blown alcoholic. Tried rehab a number of times but he fell off the wagon every time. It's been almost five years now. My mother lives in Atlanta, but I don't see her that often. And Dad doesn't like me around to remind him of how far he ruined his life. Fortunately, he turned over most of the business operations to me a couple of years before I fired him. I'm so sorry, Gavin. Honestly, I didn't mean to make you relive all that. If it's been that many years, you couldn't have been much more than 30 when you took over. What a huge responsibility. I admire you for it. Just like you, Sophia. You can't be much more than 30, and yet you got an entire estate and oil company dumped into your lap. We can empathize with each other. <laughs> or commiserate, Gavin paused, wanting to know her badly wanting to kiss those amazing lips of hers badly. But I don't go in too much for commiseration. I don't want to be praised or complain about the work. I'm just a guy who likes to get the job done well. I'm trying to prove to myself that I'm not my old man. I'd say that's a pretty safe bet, Sophia told him, shifting closer to him. I've only known you for a few days if you don't count our phone calls, she added with a laugh. But even those phone conversations make more sense now. I'm sure you didn't need a hysterical woman making demands on the other side of the world. You sounded a little spoiled over the phone, he admitted, chuckling when she let out an indignant noise and stuck her hands on her hips. Gavin had to stop himself from wiping the adorable frown from between her brows. I'm sure I was no Prince Charming. At least you don't have a mother like mine. He laughed. <laughs> what could possibly be wrong with your mother? Is she one of those Texas high society women? Only when she comes home from Maui, with a new husband in tow. Kevin's eyebrows shot up. Hmm, I'm almost afraid to ask. Sophia's eyes darted away. She's had five so far. My sisters and I often say that our mother took all the potential husbands and left her daughters in the lurch. So, go find yourself a husband, Gavin said, giving her a sideways smirk. Sophia made a face at him. Very funny. It's not that simple. Not by a long shot. She shooed him away. I'm not going to keep you any longer. Go back to work. Do you want to come with me? To the equipment compound over there? and watch us put the explosives together. Gavin was having a hard time tearing himself away from her. Her beautiful blue eyes widened. Are you serious? Now that's an offer I can't refuse. I'm pretty sure that if I'd had a brother, he and I would have been playing with matches and firecrackers all day long. Gavin inwardly smiled. The more he learned about Sophia Ambrose, the more he liked her and wanted to know her better. If only that didn't come from such distant worlds. Chapter 17 
The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose June 5th, 1894 A week ago, I gave birth to my first child, a beautiful son. We named him Matthias Thorne Ambrose. I shall call him Matty. He is healthy and strong, and nurses constantly. It has been an eventful year. George was more serious about going to America than I realized. We took father's wedding dowry and embarked on a ship six months ago before my confinement became apparent and finally landed in New York Harbor. I must admit that it was thrilling to see the Statue of Liberty coming into view. Unfortunately, I was sick most of the journey. I spent many days on deck in the fresh air. The Atlantic breezes helped keep the seasickness, or shall I say morning sickness, at bay. I could not bear to be without mother for the birth of my first child, so father sent her to me, and she intends to stay for the first year of Maddie's life. The journey is so very arduous and long, and I'm so glad for the company and help. George immediately hired a housekeeper and two maids and a cook. He's so good to me. We are living on Manhattan Island, but I'm not used to such an overcrowded city. The sanitation is not to be tolerated, and it has been difficult to make friends during my confinement. I would be dreadfully lonely without Mother. George has now promised that we will move to the country as soon as he can find a suitable home for us. He is becoming acquainted with the American gentry, obtained his law license, and has settled into happy employment. For that, I am very thankful. Sophia was up by dawn, early morning sun pouring through the windows when she pulled back the drapes. She loved mornings, and the air was cool, the skies a deep Texas blue. She had stayed up reading Margaret's journal and dove in again before breakfast, unable to keep herself from knowing how her ancestors had ended up in Texas. She had an hour before Gavin Spencer would be making an appearance, so she sneaked in another few journal entries. It seemed that during the years of 1894 through 1895, the young couple bought a home in a quiet east side neighborhood of Manhattan where Margaret began to make friends of her own, raising her son, keeping house, and attending various cultural events, such as the opera, ballet, and musical soirees, Margaret's particular joys. Then her new life turned upside down. The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose March 12, 1895 My George has informed me that he cannot spend another year in New York. He confessed that he is very unhappy. The law firm is not as ethical as he had hoped, and he is determined to pursue a real American dream, a dream he has kept secret from me all this time. I merely thought he enjoyed reading about the Western frontier, although he claims it's becoming more civilized all the time, and Houston is growing by leaps and bounds at a population of nearly 40,000. He is tempted by the cheap land prices which plummeted during the last decade, and now is the perfect time to invest. We are now the audacious and intrepid owners of a Texas ranch. Tis true, I am still in quite a shock. George took my inheritance and purchased an enormous ranch in the wilds of Texas, fifteen hundred further miles from my mother and father in our dear Edmonton, England. Shall I ever see them again? or my sisters, or my grandparents. I merely thought George enjoyed reading about the Wild West and Indian tribes, including the novels written by the man called Mark Twain. If only he had wanted to go to San Francisco or Los Angeles. I'm sure I could tolerate a bigger city much better with more cultural opportunities and good schools. Texas is selling tracts of ranch land for more reasonable prices. George said the weather is milder than the East Coast, and there aren't any alligators on the ranch land like other southern states. Alligators. As if we lived in Africa. Although George told me Africa has crocodiles 
not alligators. To me, that is not much of a difference. He told me that it has always been a secret dream of his. Why did he keep it a secret from me, his wife? Sometimes I cannot fathom men. I am packing the house and trying not to weep thinking about leaving my pretty home and friends here in Manhattan. At least I have my son. George says that Matthias will know the outdoors and good hard work and become a fine man in Texas country. I agree with the last two sentiments, but when did we ever need to do good hard work like a servant or a farm worker? George has become unfathomable. It's as if his Scottish roots have sprung up out of the blue and are now manifesting in inconceivable behaviors. I suppose I will make the best of it. I have pledged my heart and life to him, and I will try to become the best ranch wife that Texas has ever known. It was easy to feel sorry for Margaret. She had been a stranger in a new land and was now moving to a new state even farther away. Did George not consider his wife's peace of mind and happiness? Oh, drats! Sophia spotted the clock on her bureau and jumped up, showering in five minutes. Quickly she dressed in her favorite jeans, even as she denied to herself that she was dressing for Gavin Spencer's eyes. She put on a deep maroon shirt that was light and comfortable, perfect for spending a morning in the sun, although fluffy clouds scudded across the sky. Downing the eggs and bacon that Mrs. B wouldn't allow her to leave uneaten, she grabbed her boots in the mudroom and followed the stone pavers around the swimming pool to the horse barn. I promise we will go for a ride this evening, Star, she murmured to her horse, who snuffled at her hand where wedges of crisp apples lay in her palm. I'd ride out to the oil fire with you, but the noise and flames would scar you for life. It was a perfect late May morning one of the last, as June would bring heat indexes that tortured one's soul. Running her palm down the soft, velvety sides of her horse, Sophia laid her head against Star's warm back and ran her fingers through Star's mane. The previous evening after Spencer oil fire specialists had disappeared over the horizon in all their huge, loud trucks back to Houston, Sophia had brushed and curried Star and smoothed out all the tangles in her mane. Sophia held Star's face in her hand while the horse nibbled at her hair and nickered her impatience. Okay, girl, I will see you tonight. Max is going to run you through your exercises in the yard this morning. Be a good girl for me and obey Max. Are you a horse whisperer? A male voice said behind Sophia. She whirled to see Gavin standing there watching her. Her face flamed. He must have been listening to her talk to Star. Where did you come from? My truck is on the side yard. Your foreman told me you were back here, so I walked around. Is this pretty little mare yours? Sophia nodded. She's an old dear. I got her when I was 16. Broke her and trained her. We ride pretty much every day, even if it has to wait until after dinner. I missed her a lot while I was in and out over the last 10 years. We always lived right in the middle of Houston, so I never had more than a dog. You're lucky. I always wanted a horse, Gavin admitted. I shall teach you to ride, then. I have ridden. Friends and the occasional birthday party at a local stable. Where's the team? Waiting for us. I figured you were up for a good explosion or two. Absolutely. Thanks for waiting and finding me, or whatever you want to call it. Gavin's eyes were on her face. I call it wanting to spend time with you. Sophia tried not to blush. I see. Your coach is awaiting you. Then I'd better get a move on, she said lightly. I'm sure explosions wait for no one, except the boss himself, Gavin chuckled. <laughs> Something like that. But explosions are best done in the cool morning, when there's very little wind. Otherwise, we'd have a backdraft. It's the perfect day to blast out my oil rigs, then. The well site was a bevy of activity, the nitro explosions were in the process of being prepped, and the cutting of the pipe on the second fire had been finished. Both wells now had a single column of fire licking the blue sky. So how does one go about exploding the oxygen out of a fire? Sophia asked as she surveyed the site. A few cases of nitro are the easy part, Gavin told her. The hard part 
is getting it into the flame before it explodes and takes us all with it. It'll be like a nuclear bomb if the nitro explodes before the team can get to safety, Jake said, leading them to where the rest of the crew had dug out a berm to duck beneath for safety. It was also the spot where the detonator had been positioned. The plunger of the detonator was in position, and thick wires ran from it along the ground to where they would eventually be attached to the explosives. Honestly, that sounds terrifying, Sophia said. Are you sure you guys aren't a little crazy to do this for a living? I never said we weren't, Gavin said, his laugh a deep, warm sound. We're all a little bit nuts, Earl admitted, cracking a wry grin. When Gavin showed her how it all worked, Sophia noticed that the wrenches and tools were a little different. Is there a reason for brass tools? Why would you want to change them out? We use brass because it doesn't give off static electricity when we're placing the well cap, Gavin told her. Other tools might cause a spark, even after the explosives have put the fire out. There's still tons of gushing oil, and a single spark would light the whole thing up like Christmas all over again, and us with it. That was sobering, Sophia said. And you're all going to be dripping with oil when the fire is out and you're placing the new well cap, which means... Her voice trailed off as she realized that if that happened, they would all become walking balls of fire. No wonder they had emergency services on site every day. You catch on quick, Gavin told her with a sober nod. We should hire her, boss, Jake joked. No, thank you, Sophia burst out. This is hard enough to stand by and watch from afar. Maybe you'd better have two or three ambulances on site. For the next two hours, she watched them prepare the nitro explosives. First, Gavin and his team loaded the nitro into a large 20-pound drum. Then, they wrapped it in multiple layers of flame-retardant material similar to asbestos. Finally, they doused it in water to keep it from exploding prematurely. There were two cranes today one for each of the nitro drums, to place them into the flame tower of each well. Actually, there were four cranes because the two well caps had arrived on the bed of a semi-truck from Houston. The well caps were massive molded iron with a wheel for opening and closing the flow of the pumped oil, including heavy bolts that had been machined in a specialized shop. Shouting orders, Gavin divided his team into two groups, one for each of the wells. The team assigned to the furthest well-loaded tools jumped into a truck and took off, followed by a backhoe and a crane carrying nitro. Gavin jogged over to Sophia. You okay? he asked, concern in his eyes. Yeah, I'm good. Why? You looked sort of worried. I can have someone take you back up to the house if this is too much. Not on your life. I want to see the entire process. And my well's back in working order. It looks like you need every man on deck, too. That's true. Gavin reached out to take Sophia by the hand, surprising her. Her stomach shot clear to her throat, despite the fact that his hand was big and rough due to wearing heavy work gloves. Come with me, Sophia. We're headed to the embankment berm for safety. Don't your men need to stay on the trucks to hold the nitro drums in place? Where do they take cover? No way in he- Heck, pardon me. Gavin said apologetically. Nobody stays on the trucks when the nitro blows. Once the nitro drums are inside the fire column, everybody runs for their lives to the shelter. She nodded, a tremor of fear spreading through her gut. This next part is incredibly dangerous, isn't it? Mostly dangerous, Gavin said with a wink. But we've done it a few times before. He led Sophia to the embankment and helped her down. The explosive plunger sat on the ground, waiting for the final wires to be attached. I'll be back in 20 minutes, Gavin said. I need to make sure the wires are clean and navigate my guys moving the cranes and nitro into the flame spouts. Sophia watched him hurry away. There was shouting and instructions and men hurrying about at both well sites. And then, all at once, the crane trucks began to slowly move backward, maneuvering the nitro drums over the bouncing terrain, and closer to the raging columns of fire. She wrapped her arms around herself and winced when the nitro drums disappeared into the flames. Despite hundreds of gallons of water being doused on the drum the entire time it moved into position, 
The heat was intense. She prayed that the asbestos wrapped drum wouldn't be compromised and explode prematurely. Her palms were sweating, her mouth dry as she watched Gavin directing the operations as he stood under the two wells. Angry orange flames danced above his head. Back, back, Gavin shouted, waving the crane operator in closer and closer to the fire. There, the drum was finally in position. The driver put the crane into park and opened the door of the truck. Across the oil field, Earl waved his arms at Gavin to let him know that the second drum was also in place. Go! Go! yelled Gavin at the top of his lungs. The men who were manning the water trucks and the men operating the cranes immediately jumped out of their seats and took off running for the embankment. Sophia's heart was in her throat, her palms sweaty as the men jumped below the berm of dirt. Gavin and Earl quickly screwed the explosive wires into the correct locations on the detonator, while the last of the team leaped into the hollow below the berm. Gavin shouted to Jake, Ready to blast them? I'm giving you the honors to light them up. Yes, sir, Jake shouted back, dropping to his knees at the red box. Fire in the hole, Gavin yelled as he hurried over to Sophia, bending low so that his head stayed below the embankment. Instantly, his arms came around her in a protective gesture, holding her close. Without thinking, she leaned into him. His chest was hard and massively wide. Sophia gulped, her throat dry and her heart racing with anticipation of the bombs going off any second. But most of all, her heart was hammering against her ribs because of him. Cover your ears, Gavin shouted. Sophia clapped her palms over the sides of her head and pressed her face against his work shirt her body electrified at the nearness of him. The rest of the crew covered their heads with both arms, huddling as if there was an imminent threat of flying shrapnel. At the same moment, Jake took the plunger in both fists and pressed it down in one swift movement. Instantly, the nitro drums exploded in a fury of fire and smoke that sounded like an atomic bomb had gone off. Chapter 18 Is it over? Sophia asked when the smoke cleared a few seconds later. She lifted her head and her nose brushed against Gavin's throat and then grazed his chin. His mouth was so very, very close and he smelled like a very sexy musky cologne. She held herself still to keep from swooning and making a fool of herself. Look at that, Gavin said in a low, amazed voice that reverberated like music in Sophia's ears. He stared across the field. Look, Sophia. Is it good or bad? She asked, still gazing at the stubble scattered across his jawline. It's beautiful. That's what it is. Sophia rose and stared over the embankment. Both well fires were out, gone, wiped out completely. Instead of horrifying flames roiling in the air, thick black oil streamed straight up like a fresh geyser. Excited shouts came from Gavin's crew as they lifted their arms in euphoric triumph. Let's get those caps on! Pronto, men! Gavin shouted. Jumping over the dirt berm, they grabbed their wrenches and ran toward the wells. The trucks carrying the well caps were already moving in toward the two wells, ready to lower the caps onto the top of the pipe that was now shooting a spout of rich black oil a hundred feet into the air. There it is! Gavin shouted as the crane hovered the monstrous well cap and they centered it over the pipe. Lower, lower, got it. When it slid into place and smothered the spout, oil sprayed everywhere, soaking the men in thick black liquid. The crew worked feverishly to place the bolts into the well cap and tighten them up, locking the monstrous cap into place to stop the oil gush. Gavin's biceps flexed while he worked to get the bolts secure. The minute the oil stopped gushing, Sophia dropped the binoculars around her neck and ran forward. Gavin wiped at his face with the back of his arm. Done, he called out. Five seconds later, Sophia heard the sound of cheers from the second crew across the field, signaling their success. Taking a bandana from his back pocket, Gavin wiped at his face, smearing black oil all over his skin. He grinned at Sophia. Hear that? Hear what? she asked his smile infecting her with its happy glow. The sweet sound of silence. No more roaring fire or gushing oil. You're right. My ears are ringing instead, Sophia said with a laugh. 
best sound in the world. Congratulations, Miss Sophia Ambrose. Your wells are out of danger. Just have to clean this place up a bit, although the ground will soak up all the water and leftover oil, and the mud will disappear as soon as we get a 90-degree day. Is that all it needs? She said, sticking one hand on her hip. I'm afraid to tell you that Spencer firefighters leave their work area in disastrous shape. Tisk tisk. He continued to wipe at his hands and face as he moved toward her, shaking his head at her teasing. I've done my job. Now it's time for you to kick in. So make a list. Sophia widened her eyes at him and spluttered just as Gavin took his oil-stained fingers and wiped at her cheeks. Then they were both laughing at each other's dirty faces. Watch it, buddy, she threatened. I am, he said simply, staring at her with a look of approval. Oh, you, Sophia retorted helplessly. Then Gavin got back to business. First, you need a good inspection by your drilling company. Check your pumps and oil flow. Order a meeting with your board and shareholders and, well, you can probably think of a few other folks. My granny would probably like a personal tour. Think you can handle her? With pleasure, Gavin said. But before I take on the role of tour guide, I have a proposition for you. What's that? I'd like to invite you to come to New Orleans with me. Sophia let out a small gasp of surprise. Now, that is quite a proposition. You better define your terms, Mr. Spencer, before I slap your face. He held up his hands in an innocent gesture. My motives are strictly above board and purely gentlemanly. In that case, I'll listen to your proposition. I'm always up for a good adventure. That's my life right now. I never know what's coming from one day to the next. Gavin gave her a sly grin and wink. I don't know if you recall our very polite phone call last week while I was in Iraq. We had such a polite phone call, didn't we? She said sweetly. He shook his head at her impertinence. Best one I've had in ages, if you recall. I mentioned that I had a job in Louisiana to do. I almost made your oil rigs wait until I did that job, but I made an exception since you're so close to our headquarters. But now I need to take my plane to New Orleans and prep my equipment for that job. Your plane? echoed Sophia. I have a couple of Gulfstream G200s to transport my team. We can't spend days on the road getting to a job, and we already have a set of the big machinery and equipment in New Orleans. Flying is the next best thing. Sophia was mentally adding all this up in her head. Gavin's company had big-ticket items, big-ticket travel, and charged big-ticket prices. For all of Gavin's Texas drawl and casual appearance, the man had some serious money of his own. I can see the wheels in your brain moving, Miss Ambrose. They do that quite frequently. He moved closer, and Sophia's heart stuttered when he lowered his voice. I hope you'll come as my guest for a few days. You will have your own hotel suite, all expenses paid. You can come with me to the fireside if you'd like, or lie on a lounge by the hotel swimming pool with a margarita. Your choice. I'm not much for margaritas, and I rarely sunbathe. I'm more of a swim 20 laps kind of girl. I'll bet you didn't know that I was on the swim team at Ambrose High School. We were state champs my senior year. See, I was right, Gavin said, moving closer still so that she could see the emerald green flecks in his eyes. Sophia nearly lost her breath trying to maintain eye contact before she drowned in Gavin Spencer's presence. Right about what? You're my kind of girl, and I'd like to get to know you better. But if I've read the vibes going on between us incorrectly, you can say no, and I'll leave Ambrose and never bother you again. Sophia gave him a wicked smile and spoke softly. I might be crazy to accept your invitation after our quarrelsome phone conversation last week. And I might end up regretting this. But please bother me, Mr. Spencer, she said. I would love to see another one of your fires. Now that's something I've never heard a woman admit before. I'm not your average woman. I've come to that conclusion over the last several days. 
Your conclusions are astute, and you're not an average kind of man, either. That made Gavin's eyebrows shoot up. Now, that's also something I rarely hear from a woman I'm interested in. Perhaps you've been looking in the wrong places, she told him. When he laughed at that, the sound of his voice filled Sophia with a strange warmth she had never felt before. Over the next 24 hours, Sophia met with the Ambrose Oil Company board. The members were split on their ambition to drill more wells or let the current ones run their course. Drilling was costly, and there was no guarantee that the ranch still had any oil hiding beneath its acreage. Lillian's estate and will, despite the decades of savings, now had much bigger amounts going out in payouts. It would be nice to have more assets coming in, but hard to risk what had been saved already with hefty monthly interest the sums were accruing. There was so much for Sophia to learn. Lillian had taken care of everything for decades now. Her grandmother seemed to make decisions easily and decisively and never let the board force her into decisions she didn't agree with completely. Often the successful ideas and decisions had been hers to begin with. How do you do it, Granny? Sophia asked over dinner the night before she left for New Orleans. You seem to have an uncanny intuition about the ranch and the oil it produces. I've been doing it since 1971, my dear. Even before that, I was part of Richard's decisions. I learned everything I could about the business. Maybe you were just born into it. It suits you. Lillian speared a bit of asparagus and chewed thoughtfully. Perhaps it is in my blood. I listened to my father's well drillers and the Ambrose Company board when I was a child. A few times, I hid under the table in the company office and listened. My father also taught me math and statistics and spreadsheets, and I soaked it all up. It doesn't surprise me one bit that you hid under the table listening to all the men talk. A secret smile slipped over her grandmother's face while she sipped her lemonade. And maybe, just a little bit, I can smell oil on Ambrose's estate. Sophia's head shot up. Are you making fun of me? I would never make fun of you, my dear. But I think you were born with an uncanny business sense, too. Who knows? Maybe you inherited the genes to smell oil on the soil you were born on and raised on. I did get an MBA on top of my animal husbandry undergrad degree before going on to get my doctor of veterinary medicine. I think I was going to school for so long to pass the time, in addition to loving my studies and loving animals. Lillian placed her crumpled linen napkin beside her plate. But that trait is another reason I chose you because... I know you will run things well, despite potential fires and a board who will try to boss you around. Listen to your gut and your heart, and you will be perfectly fine. Sophia laughed softly. <laughs> if you say so, I do. How's the attic coming along? Find anything interesting besides donations for goodwill and dust? Sophia pushed her chair back across the dining room Spanish tile. She wasn't sure she was ready to share Margaret's journal quite yet. I'm still going through things. It's been a little busy around here, to put it mildly. And I'm leaving in the morning for New Orleans. That's right. You did tell me about Mr. Spencer's invitation. I'm glad you're going. You need a chance to get away and get some perspective. Perspective? What are you talking about? Perspective on life, my dear. You've been hiding from it for a long time, ever since Brett Anderson. Please don't bring him up, Granny. The trip to New Orleans means nothing. A week to relax and shop and eat a perfect bowl of shrimp gumbo. Uh-huh, her grandmother said, a knowing look on her face. What is that supposed to mean, Sophia asked. I've never heard you speak with so little articulation before. Don't be impudent, young lady. I wasn't born yesterday. I've seen you and Mr. Spencer look at each other. He is merely a fine male specimen, Sophia admitted. You took the words right out of my mouth. Sophia widened her eyes. Granny, you are terrible. 
I may be old and decrepit, but I have eyes, don't I? Oh, Granny, you do make life interesting. That's because life is interesting. Enjoy your time away. I trust you to do the right thing, and I also have gut feelings about Gavin Spencer. No, stop it right now. You will not play matchmaker. Well, somebody has to. Sophia pulled the pendant out from under her blouse. Then what are these necklaces for, except to remind us of Ambrose Estate's heritage of bad luck? Her grandmother waved her words away as she rose to her feet. Give him a chance. Give yourself a chance. And that is all I will say about the subject for this evening. I'm tired and going to my room to take a bath and read in bed. I'm packing. Gavin says I need to be at the airport by noon, and it's nearly a two hours drive from here. Good night, Granny. Sleep well. Can I help you upstairs? I am perfectly capable of walking to my own bedroom. Sophia watched her grandmother exit the dining room with its bay windows and soft drapes, then crossed the foyer marble floor. The sound of her footsteps faded on the carpeted stairs. While she quickly cleared the table of their meal, the thought of spending time with Gavin made her entire body tingle with anticipation. The man was too gorgeous for words. He was also strong and knew his own mind, and yet he was funny and charming too. Running upstairs, Sophia packed for several days as fast as she could so she had time to read more entries in Margaret's journal. The answers to the past history of Ambrose's estate and the truth must be in that diary. The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose September 26, 1896 George and I are now the proud owners of 500 head of cattle. My husband spends all of his time learning how to buy and sell bulls and cows, or he's hiring ranch hands and discussing ranch life with neighbors who are few and far between. Our little town, which doesn't yet have a proper name, is beginning to grow. There are a thousand people in the area already. I hope to become involved in forming a society for the women, sewing circles, quilting bees, and take some classes in home economics and gardening and raising milk cows. There is so much to learn. Thankfully, George hired a gardener as well as a local farmer to help us begin our house garden. We do not have the luxury of shopping at the London markets for our food and flour. We must grow our own food or starve. At least there is a flour mill twenty miles away. We also own our own team of horses and a wagon and a small carriage for me to drive into town. I have learned that if I am firm with the horses, they will obey me, although their fierce bodies and strength can be a bit overwhelming. Back home, we always had a driver for our carriage or hired a buggy or hansom to shop or attend the theater. Matty is now toddling around, and I must do something about him sucking his thumb. Old wives' tales say to put quinine on their thumb, but I can't bear to do that and hear him weep with those sad lovely tears streaming down his face. I kiss them away and hold him in the rocking chair and often weep for myself, too. I admit that I am dreadfully homesick, but Mother sends me long, lovely letters and that helps me get through the hard days. The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose May 5th, 1898 I gave birth to another son in April. One of the local midwives came to help me through the delivery. It was difficult, and I am left a bit weakened, but I'll soon get my strength back. We have christened him James Thorne Ambrose at the local church. The town has voted in the city council and named the village Ambrose after our estate. George is very proud that it was named Ambrose after our family because we own the largest ranch and have donated the most funds to the town for a park, 
as well as paying the schoolteacher a minister's salary. I must count my blessings for my sons are healthy and growing like weeds. Matty talks all the time and is learning his numbers and letters. Chapter 19 The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose January 16, 1901 It is a new year and the turning of a new century. Writing the date makes me feel quite ancient, despite my twenty-six years, although twenty-seven next month. I'm an old married woman now, George laughs at my melancholy silliness. The ranch takes all of his time. His life belongs to the ranch. That is all he thinks about, talks about, and dreams about. So many plans, so much to do all the time here in the wild country of Texas. The people are fierce and independent. The cattle have now grown to eight hundred head. We also have goats and sheep and four more horses. I'm learning how to make cheese and butter. There are fences around the main house, a big beautiful house with dormer windows and a flower garden. No more living in a plain cabin that got so crowded we bumped into each other all day long. Spring, 1903 I had a little cry today. George surprised me with beautiful furniture imported from the East Coast and a few pieces from my dear old England. Two sofas, wing chairs, pillows, a footstool, carpets, and lamps. He said it was a late birthday present for my 30th birthday anniversary, which was in February. The furniture had been ordered a year ago. It was late arriving. Of course, I could hardly care at all. It is so beautiful and fits my sitting room wonderfully. My house is looking more English and ordered all the time, and I'm grateful to have such a good husband. Now, to keep the boys from climbing all over it. The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose December 15th, 1905 We have new neighbors. The ranch adjacent to ours has been purchased by Amoncio and Celeste Fontaine. They are originally from Italy, although their families immigrated when they were young. They have been in the country for long enough to speak very good English, which is so lovely, since we can have evening conversation and dinners again with people closer to our own age. It's often quite trying to have an intelligent conversation with an eleven-year-old and a seven-year-old, especially boys. They ride the horses bareback and fish in the stream and, literally, go wild all spring and summer long. I don't feel quite so isolated with neighbors only two miles by road, although George could not care less. He is so absorbed in all the daily dealings of the ranch. I suppose he really is suited to this life, although why we couldn't purchase a farm in the countryside of England is beyond me. George often reminds me that I do not understand the freedoms of our new homeland. The government burdens are less, taxes are less, regulations fewer, and we are free to do exactly what we please with our land and our lives. I have learned to bake quite good bread and pies from our cook, with her help, of course, and George and I even took the horse and carriage to deliver our simple gifts of friendship and neighborliness, to the Fontaines after they officially moved into their newly built house. Texas is quite neighborly, much more so than England, where society is ruled by strict etiquette and manners, most likely because the population is small and rural. We cling to any small gathering, and everyone attends church for the social aspect, if not the spiritual. The Fontaine home is quite grand. There are rumors that Amancio is more than a decade older than Celeste, and it was an arranged marriage, and that Mr. Fontaine is extremely wealthy. The question in town is why the Fontaines would choose a small community north of Houston in the state of Texas. There are so many more exciting cities in the United States of America. I, for one, would love to visit San Francisco one day. George has promised one day. We shall see. I have to admit my own shortcoming, for the touch of envy that has invaded my heart. I was quite overwhelmed to meet Mrs. Fontaine. She is very beautiful, with raven black hair and rich dark eyes. Her figure is petite, and her finely made gowns show off a tremendous figure. After giving birth to a daughter a few months ago, 
I feel quite large next to her. I find myself attempting new hairstyles and hiring a seamstress to make myself young and fashionable again, and to catch George's eye when he comes in tired after working the land all day. But our intimate conversations are fewer and farther between. The boys and new baby take up all of my time and energy, and George's as well. Such is the life of a Texas mother, I suppose. Even so, I try to count my blessings that we are all healthy and the ranch is prospering. Sophia stuck a finger in the leaf of the journal inside, a touch of melancholy coming over her through Margaret's words. She was sorry for her great-great-grandmother's loneliness. The move to this country was hard on her. The social life she had once enjoyed, virtually, gone. She took pride in her children, but even that was difficult. The year of 1905 had one more entry, and Sophia read it, her eyes burning but curiosity overcoming her desire for sleep. The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose New Year's Eve, 1905-1906 through 1906. We had a wonderful evening with the Fontaines, including several other families in the vicinity. Mrs. Fontaine's tables were loaded with fine food of every kind. Delicacies, savouries, hors d'oeuvres, desserts and wine flowed freely. Her home was still decorated from the Christmas season, and she took us ladies on tour. Fresh flowers from a hothouse in Houston scented the air with a heady perfume. It was quite the talk, as well as her unique crutches and twelve-foot-tall Christmas tree. There was much laughter and stories and entertainment with singing and dancing. Mr. Fontaine hired two musicians to play for us. It's been so long since I've danced. I even coaxed George onto the dance floor, but after three dances, I went upstairs to the nursery to feed little Helen and put her to bed. George was the perfect gentleman and danced with all the other ladies, especially those whose husbands refused to dance and preferred to play card games and smoke their cigars in the corner of the men's side of the drawing room. It was as if I was watching my old George of our youth. I went home happy. Celeste Fontaine has promised many more parties and soirees in the future. She is quite a talented hostess, and we shall be delighted to be their guests. There was only one sad note recalled from the evening. Celeste followed me upstairs where I laid Helen to sleep until the evening was over. The other children of the guests were amusing themselves in the playroom with a nurse and a governess Mrs. Fontaine had hired for the night so the guests could enjoy themselves. After I dressed Helen for bed and nursed her, Celeste took her from me and rocked her to sleep, laying her gently on a small bed. She was quite motherly. But after we tiptoed out of the room, Celeste confided in me that she was having trouble conceiving a child, which she desperately desires. I am so envious of you with your beautiful children. They look just like your handsome and charming husband. You are truly fortunate. She added in her lilting Italian accent. I am, I said quietly, wondering why she was confiding in me so. Perhaps you should take an appointment with Dr. Thompson in the village to seek advice. I hope he can help you and Mr. Fontaine to have a child. I will do that, she said. And I will try to contain my jealousy of you, Margaret. It is heartbreaking not to get pregnant. I hid my shock when she used such a flagrant word out loud. But we descended the elegant staircase, chatting of other things. Her words left me unsettled for days afterward. There was no reason for her to be jealous, let alone tell me of her envy or speak in such crass terms of bearing a child. It was so strange. Perhaps the Italian people are more personal in their conversations. I did suggest she contact her mother for support, who I believe lives in Chicago, but Mrs. Fontaine only shook her head and gave me an odd look, conveying the notion that her mother was not quite right in the head, which was another shocking revelation. I vowed to be kind to Celeste, now that I know her life isn't as grand as it appears to be. Closing the journal, Sophia changed into her nightgown and crawled under the sheets, her heart thumping at revelations in the journal. There was a mood coming over the pages of the journal that bothered her, but she couldn't quite put her finger on exactly how or why. She wanted Margaret to be blissfully happy, but Margaret wasn't truly happy.
I'm probably making things up out of nothing, she muttered. But before she turned out the light, she jumped up one last time and tucked the old journal into her luggage for the trip in the morning. Her phone buzzed before she could silence it for the night. It was a text from Gavin, and Sophia sucked in a breath of anticipation. Sophia, a quick message to suggest that you pack a nice dress for dinner and dancing on Friday evening. Sophia, dinner and dancing in the Big Easy? Ooh la la. You're going to leave your jeans and cowboy boots at home? I'm not sure I'd recognize you out of your fine uniform. Gavin, just find the mystery man, and it will be me. Sophia, the intrigue continues, but I think I can manage to throw something together. Twelve hours later, she was flying on the luxurious Spencer plane from Houston to New Orleans. It was a 90-minute flight, and Gavin's pilot landed smoothly on the runway. After disembarking, Gavin took Sophia's elbow to lead her across the tarmac, a porter carrying their luggage on a cart. The entire trip was effortless. No decisions needed to be made. No taxis flagged down. No lost luggage, of course. A hired car was waiting for them. The driver loaded the luggage and drove them downtown to the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in the French Quarter. I'm impressed, Mr. Spencer, Sophia said, as they sat in the back of a black Lincoln town car while the driver maneuvered through the narrow streets. These leather seats are very soft and beautiful. I'm sure this is old hat for an oil heiress, Gavin said blithely. How many sports cars do you own? Not a single one, Sophia shot back. You figure me all wrong. My grandmother raised me up as a regular girl. I had a part-time job during college. I muck out the horse barn, and I can cook my own dinner. I feel lucky this regular girl agreed to join me on an adventure. I'm starting to think that your entire life is an adventure. Gavin shifted on the seat to gaze at her with his bottomless green eyes, his arm resting along the seat back but not touching her. A dangerous adventure. There are moments when I think I truly am crazy to be in such a risky business. Crazy can be exciting, Sophia said with a teasing lilt in her voice. For instance, I've never gone to New Orleans with a man before. Actually, I've never gone anywhere with a man. And I have no brothers, so there's that. Now that's surprising. But you make this trip sound like we're having a secret rendezvous when it's completely above board. You might even call it business. Business? Sophia widened her eyes in a mocking shock. People cannot have a holiday in New Orleans and call it business. I am fighting a fire tomorrow. I'm not. I'm doing research. Gavin's laugh was so deep and genuine, Sophia couldn't help laughing too. What kind of research? I'm taking notes on your firefighting methods and comparing them to the ones you used on Ambrose Estate. A woman can never do too much research. And I'm making sure you didn't charge me too much, she added with a quick bat of her eyelashes. You ended up with two fires, so the bill had to double, unfortunately, he said, spreading his hands as if it couldn't be helped, a twinkle in his eyes. Double? But you were already there for the first one. Travel was cut in half. I'm still figuring out the final bill, he said evasively, and Sophia knew he was teasing the living daylights out of her. Be sure and fully itemize because I will be double-checking, pun intended. There was a small moment of quiet, and Gavin said, You are so different than I expected. Sophia tilted her chin at him. Is different good? Very good. But now you're fishing for compliments. Chalk it up to naivete, Sophia replied smartly. I haven't been out with friends in so long, and this is very nice. I hope we're friends, Gavin said, lifting his fingers to touch one of the locks of her hair before pulling away, as if he was worried he might be coming on too strong too quickly. I suppose we are friends, Mr. Spencer, Sophia said lightly, wishing he was still touching her hair. So why do you keep calling me Mr. Spencer? 
because I like teasing you, just like you call me Miss Ambrose. I think it's payback for my orneriness during our first phone call. It's easy to tease you, too. Gavin's voice had softened, and Sophia's heart was in her throat at the way he looked at her. I'd forgotten how pretty New Orleans is, she said now, gazing through the windows at the beautiful ironwork on all the buildings and shops of the French Quarter. Dozens of hanging flower pots bloomed with a profusion of spring colors. A moment later, the Lincoln pulled up to the Ritz-Carlton. Gavin helped her out, brushing aside the doorman, as if he wanted an excuse to take Sophia's hand and hold it while they walked up to the double glass doors. Her stomach was doing somersaults at the touch of his warm hand enveloping hers. More than that, it was full-on hand-holding, fingers interlocked while Gavin kept giving her sideways smiles while he checked them in and they followed the porter up to Sophia's suite. Oh, wow, Sophia breathed when the porter unlocked the door and held out his hand for them to enter. The room was a garden suite with a back patio loaded with flowers and a private jacuzzi. There was a sitting room with plush couches and fine tables and baskets of fruit, and flowers rested on the marble fire hearth. Spectacular plate glass windows on one side of the suite overlooked the city, and the bedroom, situated behind a set of double doors, held a spacious king-size bed, and the master bathroom was decorated with blue and gold tiled floors, granite and marble counters, and a large wardrobe. You didn't have to get such a luxury hotel, she told Gavin, as he checked the security on the doors that led to the patio garden. You're worth it. A beautiful room for a beautiful woman. You don't have to wine and dine me to impress me, Gavin Spencer, she told him. I want you to be as comfortable as possible, he told her. Mostly. I wanted you to know that this fireman isn't a complete country hick with a dirty face all the time. I do have a wardrobe with more than work overalls and fireproof suits and helmets. I never thought you were, Sophia said quietly. I try not to be a snob. Gavin reached out to take her hand. I don't think you're a snob at all. In fact, the opposite. You're the most down-to-earth girl I've met. A girl who wishes she had brand new puppies slobbering all over her face. Highly unusual for an old princess who regularly deposits checks in her bank account for thousands a month. Sophia gave him a sideways glare, then widened her eyes. As she realized, she had moved closer to him. She liked how he described her. He knew her better than she had thought. Gavin cleared his throat, running a finger along the skin of her hand. What I'm trying to say, very badly, is that I want you to know I'm not interested in you for your oil money. By the end of every day, I'm sick of oil. Sick of oil wells. Sick of oil fields and mud and lighting my hair on fire when things get too hot on a job. Are you serious? Now I want to see your hair going up in flames. I'll bet you would. Seriously, how do you keep from losing all your hair? I jump into the line of water pumps and instantly get soaked head to toe. That's what I want to see. You doused in water. I even shake out my hair like a dog. Even better, Sophia shot back. Gavin growled in his throat. You sure do like to keep me on my toes. That's the best place to keep you. What else do you like, Gavin? His eyes were fastened on her, and Sophia's stomach was jumping all over the place. I like to fly my planes. I like to plan my fires and hone my firefighting skills. And I like puppies, too. Is that so? She said now, her mouth lifting into a big smile at the way he talked about puppies. So, why are you interested in taking me to another fire? To show off all the skills you honed at your job? Nope. I have other reasons, but the most important one is that I'm interested in you. And I figured spending more time together was a pretty good way to see you off the oil field and in real life. 
I think you're trying to tell me that you're not interested in me as an oil heiress and the millions I can't touch because they're in a trust and 401k, among other things. Something like that, Gavin said now, a boyish smile creeping over his face. After riding in your luxury private plane, I'm not worried at all. You're more financially well off than I ever expected. Can I unpack now? She asked, her lips twisting with mirth. She stared at his mouth, wondering what his lips would feel like on hers. Joking was the only way not to jump all over him and make a fool of herself. That's what I get after spilling my heart out? You are one heartless oil heiress, Miss Sophia Ambrose. It's all part of the package, she said, flirting outrageously. Touche. Unpack and take a rest. Then we'll drive out to the fireside. But only if you want to. You can stay here and swim or nap all afternoon. I can swim later and sleep tonight. I'll pick you up in about 45 minutes. Is that enough time? Perfect. After Sophia saw him out the door, she whirled around the gorgeous suite and then flopped on the luxurious bed. Hotels weren't something she did very often. She'd been too busy with school and work for years to travel much, except for a few long weekends with college roommates or her longtime high school friend, Janine, who now lived in Seattle with her husband and twin daughters. This little getaway was a total treat, and she was looking forward to being pampered and spoiled by Gavin. Quickly, she unpacked her clothes and toiletries while daydreaming about Gavin's big warm arms surrounding her. Her heart was in her throat remembering the romantic touch of his fingers along her hair when they leaned against the leather seats of the Lincoln. Was she a silly romantic fool for coming here with Gavin? This trip was inviting trouble she didn't need. Deep down she knew she could never really have the man as more than a brief friend in her life. Despite his handsome looks, rugged work ethic, and charming and funny quips and jokes, Gavin Spencer was dangerous to her heart. Very dangerous. No. If she was totally honest, that wasn't the problem at all. She was dangerous to him. Chapter 20 Gavin's new fire job was located close to the Gulf of Mexico shoreline, about an hour's drive from downtown New Orleans. By the time Sophia came down to the hotel lobby in her jeans and t-shirt, Gavin had one of his four-wheel drive trucks parked on the curb. You look great, Gavin told her, a big smile on his face. I like your hair and the ponytail, too. You look like a girl who should be out riding a horse. That's the one nice thing about being home for the foreseeable future. I can ride Star every single day. Maybe what happened two weeks ago was meant to be then. What are you referring to? Sophia asked while Gavin held the door open for her as she climbed into the passenger seat. He put the truck into gear and checked for traffic. You're meant to be home, running Ambrose Estate. You are the oldest grandchild. Sophia didn't answer for a moment, and she sensed Gavin studying her. A huge burden got dumped into my lap without warning. So... It's going to take some time to come to terms with it. I think your heart is there, though, Gavin mused. Why would you think that? Sophia laughed. All I've done is complain since we met. It's understandable to be overwhelmed, to fight new things, to feel the weight of the responsibility for your family and the company and all of the employees. But when you talk about home and the land and your horse, and your grandmother. I can hear the love you have for them in your voice. It would be a grinding job if you didn't care so much, but you do. Your eyes light up. You also have the knowledge and degrees and chutzpah to figure it all out. And how would you know all that, she quipped. Easy. The minute you knew you had a well fire on your property, you were on the phone calling my company. Not just calling, but making demands wanting to know details. You get out there and figure it out and make it happen. I never thought about it like that, Sophia admitted. And, Gavin went on slowly, I'm really glad I never moved permanently to Baghdad. Sophia sucked in a breath of surprise. 
Were you seriously considering it? He shrugged and turned off the main road onto a smaller highway that headed south. It was tempting. There is a lot of work over there, and it pays well. But I miss the Texas rolling green hills. The desert isn't for me. And now, I'm doubly glad I'm here. Sophia gave him a sidelong gaze. Why is that? Because if I had taken a permanent job with Shell or BP, I would never have met you. A blush rose up Sophia's face. She was thinking the same thing, actually. In reality... She needed to stop thinking about Gavin Spencer like that. At the moment, she refuted his hypothesis. If I hadn't been home, the ranch hands would have discovered the fires and had the CEO hunt you down. I would have stayed where I was and signed the papers for my new vet clinic. But fate can also play dirty tricks on us, twisting happiness into tragedy. All of a sudden, Gavin spun the steering wheel to take a narrow road that looked like it led to the middle of nowhere. But far in the distance, there was a familiar black cloud of smoke and a plume of fierce flames. Gavin stopped the truck before they got within range and left the engine idling for a few moments. What tragedy, Sophia, he asked, twisting in his seat to look at her. Sometimes it seems like you're talking in riddles. She bit back an onslaught of emotion. Why did this man seem to look into her mind, her soul? Hey, I have five sisters. Isn't that enough drama? I love big families, actually. I only have one younger sister, and she takes care of our mother. Sophia heard a note of sadness in Gavin's voice. Is she ill? She's got MS, and it's getting worse. She was diagnosed when I was in high school, so she's been living with it a long time already. And your dad, after what you told me, I guess he isn't much help. Nope. He actually has liver disease now, on the list for a transplant, but he can't stop drinking to save his life, literally. I'm so sorry, Gavin. You might lose them both much sooner than you'd like. She touched his hand, and he gently wrapped his fingers around hers. Leaning across the truck's console, Gavin kissed the back of her fingers, soft and sweetly and ever so romantically. Sophia's free hand clenched, and she pressed her knuckles against her mouth, trying not to melt into a swoon. I know you have a story, too, Gavin said, because you were raised by your grandmother. You've mentioned your mother's new marriage, but where is your father? And where are your sisters? My sisters are all over the country, living their own lives, lucky things. Emma is in Egypt working as an archaeologist, and actually, there are three different fathers. Gavin's eyebrows shot up, but he didn't say anything, merely waited for her to continue. I was six when my dad was killed in an air show right there in Houston. He was a Blue Angels Navy fighter pilot. Lauren and Emma and I are his daughters. Gavin's expression was one of shock. The muscles in his jaw twitched. Sophia, I never expected you to say that. What a tragedy. How horrible not to have known your father for very long. Emma was only a year old, Lauren three. Ever since, my mother has never handled life very well. She's been married a lot. I ended up living with my grandmother while they lived in town. It goes without saying that my mother really loves her social life. Your grandmother is quite the matriarch. I imagine she's made out of old-fashioned discipline and a work ethic of steel. In spades. She's also opinionated and terribly bossy, but when she gets the itch to bake in the kitchen, she makes a mean chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> Isn't that what a grandmother is supposed to do? Gavin said with a chuckle. Not mine, but Granny was young when she lost her husband in a strange accident. Only 40, I think. She took over the budding oil company and built it into a pretty successful enterprise. Hey, Sophia added softly, lifting a finger to point through the windshield. You have a fire waiting over there, with your name on it. Right. Gavin slipped his fingers from hers and put the truck into gear, turning to Sophia one last time before pressing down on the gas pedal. Can we finish this later? I think there's a lot more you're not telling me. I'm a simple girl, Mr. Spencer, she said flippantly. Inside... 
all Sophia could think was, don't look too hard. You'll get burned worse than one of your oil fires. A few minutes later, they were pulling into the open field near the raging rig, where Jake and Earl and the rest of the team were unloading cranes and front loaders. Dusk was deepening by the time they got back to the hotel. Sophia changed into one of her simple dresses and a pair of wedge sandals for dinner. You look great, Gavin said when they met in the lobby. Today's been a long day with the plane travel, and Friday will be done a little earlier than tonight. It will give us more time to have a leisurely dinner and find a place to go dancing. Sounds perfect, Sophia told him while they strolled the charming streets of the French Quarter, window shopping and enjoying the crowds and street parties going on, including magicians and jugglers and outdoor bands. Bourbon Street was especially crowded as they weaved in and out of the packed people, past curio shops and cafes to finally discover a small Creole restaurant with spicy food and a two-man band playing lively tunes on their fiddle and accordion. After they ordered their food, Gavin gazed at Sophia across the small table in the corner. You're an anomaly, you know? I hope you mean that as a compliment, or I won't let you get any dessert, she retorted, lifting an eyebrow. He sat back in his chair, his eyes drinking her in, as if he couldn't get enough. The attention was making Sophia's head spin, and those eyes were enough to drown herself in. Sophia reminded herself not to get sucked into this man. It was merely friendship, despite the magnetic pull Gavin was emanating. Every time he touched her, even just a small touch on her back to guide her over a pothole on the work site, or a step down on the sidewalk, sent a shockwave of desire through her body. It's definitely a compliment, he said now. Most wives and girlfriends never come out to an oil fire. The magnitude of the fire can be pretty overwhelming. Brings to life the danger their men put themselves in to bring home a paycheck. I don't blame them, Sophia said, taking a sip of her ice water. Those fires are the most intense thing I've seen up close and personal. That's the biggest reason I was panicking on the phone with you. After seeing mine... I had nightmares of my entire field exploding and losing half of my ranch. I'll bet it's hard on married couples. Unfortunately, the divorce rate is high, Gavin admitted. The stress can be as bad as the job of a police officer or having a spouse in the military. We're in harm's way at all times. There's no let up. It's sad to hear those statistics. I suppose someone has to go into the line of fire but I imagine it's nerve-wracking when it's the life of the person you love. Most family members don't want to know the details, but you seem to be able to handle it, as well as you're interested in the process. I find it one of the most intriguing jobs I've ever seen up close and personal. But please, don't ask me to be on your team, Gavin chuckled. <laughs> don't worry, I'm not offering you a job. Besides. There's no way I would put you at risk. But you'll put yourself at risk, Sophia told him, swatting his hand lying on the table. Gavin reached out to grab her hand, his eyes on her face, as if no one else in the world existed but the two of them. The powerful jolt in Sophia's stomach when he held her hand was more potent than any kiss she'd ever had. Gavin, she whispered, trying to breathe without hyperventilating. He leaned across the table, their faces close. Yes, Sophia, our dinner is here, she said, when the waiter began to place their salads in a basket of hot bread with melting garlic butter. You are a tease, he told her, shaking his head. After dinner, they strolled through Jackson Square, chatting about college and books and favorite music. Despite it being nearly ten o'clock, the city was coming alive with lights and music. Come over here. Gavin said, tugging at Sophia's hand. They climbed the embankment to watch the Mississippi River roll silently by in the dark. Shafts of silver light from the moon cast a glow that was magical. It's beautiful, Sophia whispered. Shall we get a powdered sugar beignet? Gavin suggested as they passed Café du Monde, with its long line snaking out the door. That sounds fantastic, but dinner was so good. I ate too much gumbo and catfish. Let's plan dessert for tomorrow night. 
We can't leave New Orleans without a bag of powdered sugar beignets. Tomorrow is a happy word. I propose we purchase a dozen and lie on the grass in the park and watch the stars while we stuff ourselves silly. Sounds delicious and decadent. When she laughed, Gavin's arm slid around her waist, and Sophia leaned into him instinctively, as if his arm belonged around her. Inside her mind, Sophia warned herself not to enjoy his body so close and protective, but it was hard not to give in to her own desire to touch him. We have a long day tomorrow, Gavin finally said as they drew closer to the hotel. It'll be an early morning, but you do not need to come out to the site. You've had such a busy couple of weeks yourself that you should take some time off to relax and enjoy New Orleans. I like to watch you work, actually. I can't explain why exactly. The strategy and finesse of bringing such a powerful force of oil and fire mixed into submission is mesmerizing. With a bomb, no less. Every job is a new challenge, that's for sure. Plus, I like the paychecks. You're such a mercenary, she said, placing a palm on his chest. Quickly, Sophia withdrew it, as if she'd been burned. Gavin's heart was beating hard and fast, exactly like her own. To distract herself, she pointed down the street. Look at all the fortune teller and voodoo shops. Hey, that's what you can do tomorrow. Sleep in, then get your fortune told. There's a fortune teller on every block around here. And if you want to go somewhere else, the hired car is available for you. I will only get my fortune done if you do it too, she told him with a sly grin. A card reading or a glass ball? How about one for you and one for me? You're on. Laughing, they shook on it. Then Gavin flagged down a taxi since Sophia was starting to yawn. They had walked nearly a mile away from their hotel by now. When Gavin said goodnight at her hotel room door, he said, Remember, my room is at the end of this hall if you need me. You have my number, too. I'll have to get you by seven in the morning if that's not too early. If you change your mind, send me a text. Okay, but I won't. Although, I do have a little bit of reading I need to do tonight. He gave her a sideways look. Sounds intriguing. What are you reading? Actually, my great-great-grandmother's journal. Granny has me cleaning out the older part of the house, going through books and papers and trunks in the attic. There's a massive amount of stuff, and it's mostly disorganized after all these years, just dumped everywhere. Between you and me, I suspect that's the real reason she willed me the estate. Emma and I are the only ones who like history and the past. And Emma is in the Valley of the Queens, Gavin said. I'm impressed. You have a good memory. What years is the journal about? Late 19th century, early 20th. 130 years ago, the Ambrose estate was established. Reading the diary is like peeking over my great-great-grandmother's shoulder into her personal thoughts. Pass along all the gossip and juicy parts, Gavin said, amused. Most people never leave their diaries lying around. It was hidden at the bottom of her trunk of black morning clothes, placed in a box so that I had no idea it contained a book let alone a journal. But it's set at the end of the Victorian era, so there's not many juicy parts. Everybody has pieces of their life they want to keep hidden, Gavin said, as if reading Sophia's own heart. I hope you'll trust me with yours. You can trust me, you know. Emotion tugged at Sophia's throat. If he knew the truth of her life and family heritage, he'd run as far away from her as he could. There was so much she had to keep hidden to protect him. Chapter 21 The Life Recordings of Margaret Florence Thorne Ambrose May 20th, 1910 I have not written in this journal for several years, except for a few brief mentions of our cattle crops in the hot, humid Texas weather. Needless to say, I have become quite the ranch wife, if I do say so myself, but ranch life and motherhood certainly take all of a woman's time, energy, and sanity. Several months ago, we had a lovely distraction with a visit from my younger brother and his bride of two years. Houston continues to grow, and there are theatres and good restaurants that we took Lloyd and Victoria to, staying at one of the nicer hotels. Sadly, 
It was very difficult to say goodbye after the two months they spent with us. Meanwhile, Celeste Fontaine and I have become close friends, despite our cultural differences and my bit of jealousy at her beauty, although I have to remember that it is God's gift to her. She has come to rely on me greatly. A year ago, she suffered another miscarriage and has been quite low in spirits. Her husband, Amoncio, is gone with his various businesses so that she becomes quite lonely. Celeste spends quite a bit of time at our house. While I appreciate the friendship and the conversation and the time she spends entertaining the children with stories and games while I am busy running a household of three children, I find that I crave personal time alone from all the hustle and bustle. Often, she will take the children outdoors to play and swing, but while strolling the grounds, she detains George to ask him dozens of questions about ranch life. Once she even saddled my own horse to find him to ask for his help with a sick milk cow and a sow who had given birth to twelve piglets, despite the fact that she has farm and ranch hands of her own. She often stays for dinner, and then I am jealous not to have my family alone in the evenings for our own conversation, Bible time, and bedtime routine. We always stay up much too late for the children's own good, especially when school is in session and the children have their lessons to practice. I know that I should not complain. Celeste is a friend, and her troubles are my troubles. George is so patient spending his little free time with her, and I ask for forgiveness in my heart that I will not be impatient or stingy for a friend who is sorely lacking in friends and an attentive husband. The Life Recordings of Margaret Florence Thorne Ambrose January 21st, 1911 After a much colder December and January than we are used to, our little Ambrose village is a flutter. Celeste Fontaine is throwing a party on February 12th in honour of my birthday and invited everyone. I'm honoured and George told me to order a new dress made. I'm quite taken aback that I am about to turn 37 years old. It does not seem possible. I think a new hat is in order too. George patted my cheek and told me to spare no expense. I think he feels guilty that he's been neglecting me lately. The Life Recordings of Margaret Florence Thorne Ambrose February 15th, 1911 The party at the Fontaine Estate was an extravaganza, more luxurious and festive than anything I ever attended in London. Celeste hired special caterers to prepare a most impressive and sumptuous six-course dinner. Imagine six courses of heavenly appetizers and savouries, and pastries and fish and beef and fruit plates and an entire trolley of desserts. Mr. Fontaine has certainly hit his stride with his various businesses. There are even rumours that he has invested in oil. Yes, oil is springing up from the ground in various places of the state. Imagine that. Oil was actually first discovered a decade ago now, but it seems that nobody talks about cattle any longer. It's all oil, oil, oil. George is quite eager to explore our ranch for the stuff, but exploration is quite costly. We might need to wait for an unexpected gusher. Unfortunately, Mr. Fontaine was unable to be at the party, despite knowing it had been scheduled for several weeks. The foundry he owns in Colorado had an emergency, and he was called away at the last minute. But there were so many attendees at the party, he wasn't actually missed very much. He can be a very reserved man although he provides anything that Celeste wants. I think she merely snaps her fingers. The most intriguing aspect of my birthday party was the woman Celeste hired from Houston. A woman of the occult, Celeste asked George to drive all the way to the southern outskirts of Houston to pick her up, which took a full day of driving in his fancy new Model T, including an overnight stay. Madame Zelana is younger than I expected and quite a mysterious beauty from Romania, although she has lived in the country for many years, having immigrated with her parents as a child. She wore layers of skirts and lace shawls, including heavy makeup and bangles and big gold hoop earrings, the like I have never seen before. Her eyes were the darkest I have ever seen. 
and Celeste set up a corner of the parlour for Madame Zelana to tell our fortunes, replete with a small table and lamp, curtains and smoky candles. It was quite enigmatic and mysterious. There was much laughter and ambience, as one by one the women sat at Madame Zelana's table to hear their fortunes. The women asked mostly silly things, how many children they would have, and if they would ever have a chance to travel to South America, or if their husbands would become rich from the oil business in the future. Since George and Mr. Fontaine already own personal motor cars, we are considered wealthier than most, although cars are becoming more plentiful on the roads every year. As the birthday person, I went last. My stomach was all aflutter when I sat in the plush chair at her table. Madame Zelana had a crystal ball and tarot cards spread out on the pretty table. Her red-painted fingernails glowed under the light of the candle. She smelled exotic and mysterious, and I confess that my laughter was a bit nervous, especially as the women of the party were watching us from across the room. Then Madame Zelana went quiet for several long moments, and I began to worry. Surely everything is all right, I finally asked her. You have a successful husband, yes, she said to me, her dark eyes gazing deeply into mine. I nodded, any words I was thinking quickly disappearing. You have three healthy children, two sons and a daughter? Yes, ma'am, I answered. I advise you to keep them close, she said, not taking her eyes off my face. What do you mean? That sounds ominous. Do not be alarmed, but the boys can be too adventurous and wild at times. They get into trouble. What about my daughter? I asked her, a frantic niggle now rising at my throat. Madame Zelona gazed into her clear globe again. She will be fine. All will be fine. Ambrose's state will go on for many generations. That's reassuring. My husband George is a hard-working man, and our estate continues to be successful. We are very happy. Hmm, she muttered as though she was not convinced. Life is often filled with unexpected tragedy, just around the corner. I pushed my chair back and rose to my feet. I'm afraid this conversation is becoming unpleasant. This is my birthday party, and I will not be subjected to gossip and dire predictions. And so you shall not, Mrs. Ambrose, she said, bowing her head in deference. I strode back to the main room, shaking to my core. She had given me no fortune whatsoever, just dark, empty threats of doom. I found Celeste laughing with George at one of his jokes at the dessert table. The servants were rolling back the rugs for dancing, but I did not feel merry any longer. A gloom settled over me and I had to swallow the fury that suddenly boiled over at always finding Celeste chatting and laughing and flirting with all the men in the room, including my husband. It occurred to me for the first time that Celeste didn't chat or gossip with the women very often. Rather, she spent most of the evening with all the husbands, while her own husband sat at the gaming tables drinking his endless wine. Of course, he wasn't there this night. I could only remember other gatherings over the years. My thoughts made me feel mean and petty, and I blamed it on feeling out of sorts after my encounter with the fortune teller and then stewing over Celeste's unbecoming flirting. I was not very good company for the rest of the evening. The next day, George and I had a terrible row about him driving Madame Zalona back to Houston. Life is very much out of sorts when George and I are not on good speaking terms. Sophia put a bookmark in the journal and set it on the table in her hotel room. She went to stand by the picture window that overlooked the fairy lights around the pretty gardens. Margaret's gloom settled around the edges of her mind. She had the same feeling of dread that Margaret had more than a hundred years ago. I can't read anymore, Sophia said, her eyes burning from the late hour. The story of her great-great-grandparents was leaving her slightly despondent. The gypsy woman telling fortunes at Margaret's birthday party was filled with dire premonitions. Here she was, reading about glass balls and tarot cards while in New Orleans herself, 
and she and Gavin had shaken hands on a bet to get their own fortunes told. Tomorrow was the last day of work on the oil rig on the Gulf Coast, and tomorrow evening, Gavin's planned celebration dinner. She was looking forward to it more than she wanted to admit. To sit across a pretty table with Gavin's eyes focused solely on her and his hand holding hers. If she was completely honest with herself, she was yearning for more now. She wanted to know what it was like to be completely inside Gavin Spencer's arms, without his team holding cover during the nitro bomb and the flurry of the worksite all around them. And yet, Gavin's arms were probably the most dangerous place she could be. Chapter 22 The well fire was extinguished successfully, and Gavin's team was in good spirits when they loaded up the equipment and trucks to head back to their warehouse in New Orleans. Do we get a bonus, boss? Jake called as he leaned out of the truck window, the engine rumbling. I'll buy you guys lunch when we get back to Houston, Gavin said, shooing them all away. Sophia laughed and called goodbye. She'd been getting to know the men in between the dangerous work while they were loading and unloading or waiting for the well caps to arrive. Jake talked about his new bride in glowing terms and shared adventures about their honeymoon to the Grand Canyon. Earl had half-grown kids with his wife, who was a school teacher. They both came from small towns near Lubbock, where Gavin had met them on a job several years ago. The caravan of trucks disappeared over a rise, and Sophia's heart fluttered in her chest when she watched Gavin standing silent, hands on hips, surveying the job. Dang, Gavin Spencer was one hunk of a man. Sophia's face heated, and she glanced away in case he caught her staring. You hungry? he asked, finally turning to smile at her. Or do I look too disgusting to talk to at the moment? You are a little oily, she said with a laugh, running her eyes up and down his grimy work uniform. Even your face is black, but I'm starving, so I'll overlook it. Gosh, thanks. Maybe I'll have to get you dirty on the drive back to the hotel. That sounds wicked, Mr. Spencer. Now I've been warned to stay far, far away from you in the cab of the truck. Don't go too far, he said, arching his eyebrows in a devilish pose, or I might have to chase you across an oil field. That could be tricky, she said, musing on it. I'm pretty good at climbing trees, but there aren't any trees on an oil field to hide in. He caught her fingers in his. I'd climb a dozen trees to find you, because I can't seem to take my eyes off you. The electricity in his touch was powerful, and Sophia's knees threatened to buckle. Good grief, this man completely thrilled her, body and soul. Come on, let's get out of here, he said. Sophia slid into her seat, her heart thumping against her throat, when her cell phone rang. The screen read Daniel Gentry. Wow, the lawyer seemed a million miles away instead of only 350. Hello? Sophia, this is Daniel, Daniel Gentry. Yes, hello, how are you? What's up? I was wondering if I could schedule a time for lunch and a meeting. I have some tax paperwork to go over with you. With an estate like Ambrose, taxes are a huge project. Even though April 15th was a month ago, we work on it all year long. I'm actually out of town right now. I had a, a sudden trip to New Orleans. Oh, Daniel paused, sounding surprised. When will you be home? I'd like to see you like we talked about. How about I call you when I return, Sophia suggested, wanting to get off the phone as quickly as possible, because Gavin kept glancing at her, curiosity obviously on his face. Although I'm not sure when I'll be home, I'll telephone next week and we can figure it out. Sure, great, that works. I look forward to it, Sophia, he added meaningfully. Sophia clicked off the phone, and Gavin studied her for a moment as he turned the key in the ignition. Who was that? Oh, just my, the lawyer, for Ambrose Estate. Questions about the will and taxes. Sorry, I shouldn't have asked. None of my business. I could tell it was a male voice on the phone, and I was too curious for my own good. Sophia glanced at him from the corner of her eye, suppressing the urge to tease him. You seem a little bit bothered. Everything okay? Gavin focused on the road. Not bothered at all. A mere lawyer, right? His question caused Sophia to pause. 
Daniel Gentry was very nice, but after that first initial buzz, the feeling had disappeared because she'd met Gavin. Daniel was just a lawyer. She didn't even think about the man when he wasn't calling on a pretense or coming by the house with papers. The knowledge made her feel guilty about promising Daniel lunch, but it wasn't something she could help or force. An hour later, they were back at the hotel, late afternoon sun slanting over the city. Sophia showered, excitement rising at the idea of their dinner date. Gazing at herself in the mirror, she finished the final touches on her makeup and hair, which she'd done in a fancy upsweep, a concoction of interlocking waves and curls that brought out the highlights of her hair. She pulled on the deep blue glittery dress she had packed, a dress she had bought years ago, then never had a chance to wear when she lost Brett Anderson. But she couldn't think about him, or else she'd cry again and get a stomach ache. Instead, Sophia turned on some music to distract her while she applied powder and lipstick. Her eye makeup turned out smoky and alluring, and her skin was glowing. For the final touch, she inserted a pair of sparkly fake diamond earrings with a pale blue hue of color in her ears. Lillian Ambrose had once admonished her granddaughter to wear fake diamonds, while the real ones were kept locked away in a safe deposit box. Then Sophia's eyes caught the pendant around her neck. The necklace had become such a part of her over the last 16 years that there were moments she forgot she was actually wearing it. Now the amethyst clashed with her evening gown. She stood still, staring at herself, thoughts whirling, and then with a sudden rebelliousness that rose up her spine, she unclasped the necklace and let the silver chain sift through her fingers, abandoning it to the top of the bureau. There. It was done. The pendant she had always promised to wear was lying in a puddle. At the moment, she didn't feel a thing. Well, maybe a twinge of guilt. But she wasn't going to let it stop her from having a good time tonight. Turning in a slow circle in front of the full-length mirror, Sophia checked the back of her dress, pleased with the way it lay, perfectly around her hips, and fitted her bust line. She hadn't dressed up like this in years, and she felt pretty and womanly for the first time in so long. When she appeared in the luxurious hotel lobby, Gavin's eyes were riveted on her face, as if she were the only woman in the entire world. Her evening dress swished across the glossy marble floor while she studied him in return. Gavin's sharp gray suit fit his wide shoulders and broad chest perfectly. The crisp, pale yellow shirt and dark blue tie, the perfect colors to match his green eyes, and suntanned skin from working outdoors so much. A smile lit up his entire face when she drew close. Then he let out a low, soft whistle. You are a dream, Sophia Ambrose. No, Mr. Spencer, she teased him. I am very much real. Then I am the luckiest man in the world tonight, because my dream girl is standing right in front of me. Those are some mighty nice compliments, Sophia said, the heat of a blush rising up her neck. I mean every word. I don't flatter a woman unnecessarily. Sophia searched the expression on his face and knew that he was being completely genuine. That's even better to know. Gavin tucked her hand in the crook of his elbow while they walked out to the curb to where the hired car was waiting for them. I'm probably too candid sometimes. Direct to a fault, some would say. I got a dose of your candid honesty the first time we met over the phone, she said. Of course, you might have been snarling at me, but I was the one doing the actual biting. I'm lucky I got a chance to redeem myself. Nope, I'm the lucky one, Gavin said, helping her into the Lincoln and then sliding in on the street side. After handing a note with the address of the restaurant to the driver, he clasped Sophia's hand firmly in his own, and she had to purposefully tell herself to breathe. She never knew that holding a man's hand could be so thrilling. The awareness made her take her attraction to Gavin Spencer even more seriously. Gavin voiced her own thoughts. What is it about you? You knock my socks off. I didn't realize I had that trick up my sleeve, Sophia laughed. But you clean up pretty good, firefighter. I try hard. Gavin ran his hand lightly down the length of her bare arm, and Sophia shivered from his touch, highly aware that she wasn't wearing much in the way of sleeves. His hand against her skin was intoxicating, and she had to blink herself out of a sudden stupor of thought. The streets of the French Quarter on a Friday night were bustling, 
Pedestrians swarmed the streets, car horns were blowing, and lights glowed from the pretty street lamps. A few minutes later, the taxi pulled up in front of Brennan's, a posh restaurant with beautifully decorated dining rooms, and a courtyard with outdoor tables in a lovely garden setting. Would you like to dine in the king's room tonight, sire? The maitre d' asked after inquiring about their reservation. We don't have a group using it this evening, so it's available for private dinners. Sophia gave Gavin an excited nod when he glanced at her for approval. The king's room was stunning with exquisite molded cornices, beautifully polished tables, and rich, soft carpeting. The floor-to-ceiling windows were draped in a burgundy velvet next to gold damask wallpaper. A large chandelier presided over it all, and Sophia gave a small gasp at the beauty of it all. The waiter seated them at the table next to one of the tall windows, and Sophia could see the lamp posts along Royal Street flickering on. The wrought iron balconies of the restaurants and old buildings across the street sparkled with draped hanging lights, as if it was Christmas. The chair seats are even a royal purple color, Sophia noted. The chairs are replicas from the inauguration of Queen Elizabeth at Westminster Abbey, the waiter said. See the embroidery has gold coronets and the color matches the drapes. Over here is a display of treasures and mementos from past spring Mardi Gras carnivals. The king's room and the queen's room next door used to form a double parlor when the building was a privately owned home back in the 19th century. He handed out the menus and left them to peruse the dinner selections. What do you think? Gavin asked. It's absolutely gorgeous. I love it. You are spoiling me. He laughed out loud. Me spoiling an oil heiress? I hardly think so. Sophia glared at him. Hey, I spend my time on a horse or weeding in the garden when I'm not delivering a wobbly new colt or doing surgery on a sick animal. I don't often go to high-class restaurants or nightclubs. Then you deserve to be spoiled. Everyone does sometimes. I'm thinking you work too hard and you're probably the first one to volunteer if something needs to be done. Sophia shrugged noncommittally. I think that might describe you, Mr. Spencer. Your grandmother trusts you. That's why she put you in charge. No, she enjoys bossing me around, and I'm the only grandchild who lives in the same state. All my sisters deserted me years ago. Are there internal family feuds? My sisters have varied careers and didn't want to be stuck on the ranch. There aren't a lot of men in the area, either. No social life, you know? Gavin gave her a puzzled look. Houston isn't that far away. It's just the way it all happened, she said vaguely, knowing her sisters had left the state to avoid the Ambrose curse. Tell me why, Sophia, Gavin said when their appetizers and salads arrived. But if it's really terrible, you can tell me to mind my own business. Sophia didn't speak for a moment while she sprinkled oil and vinegar on her salad and then took one of the warm buttered dinner rolls from the bread basket. Sophia, are you all right? Gavin asked softly. She stared out the window at the street lights, then set down her fork. Her heart was thumping against her ribs. Maybe she needed to scare Gavin off. We're getting into dangerous territory, talking about the Ambrose family, she finally said. The estate, the house, it's all haunted. Yes, Gavin, I live in a haunted house haunted by the spirits of all my ancestors who have died over the last century. I'm not sure I understand. People grow old and pass away, especially over a hundred years. Not in my family. At least, not the men. Gavin's eyebrows pulled together. You're talking about your father's early death, leaving you and your sisters when you were so young? Gulping back the tiny moment of courage, Sophia nodded. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. She wasn't being completely truthful, but how could she tell Gavin the reality of Ambrose's history? Now, tell me more about all the places you've visited around the world when you're fighting oil well fires. She suspected Gavin knew she was changing the subject on purpose, but he didn't press her. The king's room was so lovely, the background music was soothing, and the food spectacular, which made it so easy to put aside the inheritance she had been saddled with for the rest of her life. When they finished their beef bourguignon and fruit sorbet dessert, Gavin paid the check and helped Sophia to her feet. Let's take a walk. It's a nice evening. 
Royal Street is pretty superb on a weekend. The air was growing a little chilly by now, and Sophia only had a light wrap around her shoulders. She leaned into Gavin, and he put his arm around her to keep her warm. This is nice, she said, admiring the dressed-up tourists and city lights. I promised you dancing, and up ahead is a great club. You seem to know New Orleans well. Do you come here often? Louisiana probably has more oil fires than Texas. Well, make that a tie between the two states, actually. True, Sophia admitted. But you don't seem like the kind of man who would know how to dance. My mother told me at 16 that a man needed to know how to lead a woman around the floor so he didn't make a fool out of himself. I like your mama. I think she'd like you too, Gavin said when they entered the club. Someday we'll go to Atlanta and meet her and my sister. Come on, they're playing a good foxtrot right now. That's the easiest dance to do. Downstairs was a bar with small tables and a big talkative crowd while upstairs, a live band was playing dance music beside a polished wooden floor. Several couples swirled about, but it wasn't too crowded. I need to work off that fantastic dinner. Sophia said, when Gavin gave a small tug at her hand and pulled her into his arms. His other arm slipped around her waist. Oh my, Sophia gasped under her breath as she suddenly, irrevocably, knew what it was like to be in Gavin Spencer's arms. She could feel his hard chest muscles and the biceps outlined by his coat jacket. He smelled incredible, musky and masculine, a heady scent that made her so distracted she missed a step. Oh, oops. I've got you, Sophia, he whispered into her ear. Sorry, I'm distracted. You're distracting me to no end, Gavin said without missing a beat. I've wanted to hold you like this for the last two weeks. I'm a dangerous woman, she said lightly, but little did he know that her words were a double entendre. Nope, just mostly dangerous. After a couple of swing dances, the music changed into a slower two-step. Gavin's lips were against Sophia's ear as he leaned in close. Your instincts were right. About what? Sophia was trying to stay upright, his breath tingling against her ear. If Gavin asked her to follow him to the moon, she'd go without a second's hesitation. I was a little bit jealous. When were we talking about jealousy? Then Sophia remembered Daniel Gentry's earlier phone call. Oh, right, she added. When I heard a man's voice through your cell phone, I was envious because I've never been completely sure you were even available or didn't have a secret boyfriend. The night I first saw you coming out of your front door, I was so happy to learn that you weren't married. Sophia pulled back to look into his face. Are you serious? Dead serious. You might have had a husband and three kids in that big house. I'm glad you're not married either she said with a coy smile, because if you were, I wouldn't be dancing with you right now. <laughs> Good point, he chuckled, his cheek pressing against hers. I'm falling for you, Sophia, he added gently, and you're driving me insane. How in the world am I driving you insane? Because you're gorgeous and smart and sexy as hell. Pardon my language. I've never heard a compliment like that before. The rest of the world's males must be blind then, but I'll be happy to tell you every single day if you don't mind keeping me around. Sophia's throat closed up. She wanted him desperately, but a relationship could never happen between them. Of course, Gavin didn't get the memo on that piece of information, and she didn't have the nerve to tell him the truth. He'd think she was insane. Gavin would forget about her on his next overseas work trip. He had to because she wasn't meant to have happiness. A moment later, Sophia realized that the music had stopped and the band was taking a break. The other couples were moving downstairs to buy drinks from the bar. Gavin was gazing at her with such an intense look, chills swept all the way from her toes to her head. You haven't said a word in response to my confession. Plus, the music stopped. I, I just realized that. You were far away for a minute there. I wish you'd tell me all your hidden thoughts. I've been trying to read between the lines of what you're not saying. I suspect Ambrose Estate has got a few secrets you don't want to talk about. You're too smart for your own good, Mr. Spencer, she said, 
highly aware of the way he was holding her, his arms circling her waist, his height and breadth overwhelming her senses. She laid a hand against his chest and gulped at the feel of his broad chest against her fingertips. What I said was true, Sophia, and I don't want you to run away because you're scared of something. Because the truth is, I'm falling in love with you. Sophia sucked in a breath at his confession. Her heart jumped into her throat, her thoughts going wild with the thrill of what he had just said. There's nothing you can fix, but you'd better kiss me before I do run away. She spoke in jest, but Gavin took her seriously because, before she knew it, he had cupped her face with both hands, leaning down to touch his lips softly against hers. Sophia stood stock still, unable to move, unable to breathe. Gavin Spencer was kissing her. This was really happening. There were no words to describe the taste of his mouth on hers as he deepened the kiss, pulling her closer, their bodies fitting together so perfectly. A moment later, Gavin took Sophia's arms and pulled them around his waist. That's when she gave in to the desire he invoked in her, unable to resist any longer. And then they were kissing and kissing and kissing, her arms sliding around his neck, her fingers in his thick, dark hair, her mouth open to him as he deepened the most perfect kiss in the world. When Gavin slowed to kiss the corners of her lips, Sophia thought she would faint at any moment from the connection between them. But as much as her body was helpless against him, and her heart pounded with a thousand lightning bolts of desire, her mind was screaming from the injustice of her life, screaming from the attraction and desire she felt for this man. She wanted to be with him all the time, talking, laughing, joking, and now kissing, kissing like she had never been kissed before. But she had lost one fiancé in the past, and she couldn't do that to Gavin. To lose him would break her soul, break her completely. Finally, she pulled back, breaking the connection of their lips to catch her breath. She had to get her mind back into the real world. I, I can't. Why, Sophia? I will never hurt you. I can promise you that. But that kiss. You can't tell me you're not feeling the same thing that I'm feeling. We had a fiery explosion of our own over the last 15 minutes. Sophia sagged against him weakly. I can't stop, but we need to stop. There are probably people watching us too. His chuckle was low and deep. There's not a soul in the room but us. But since we fly out tomorrow morning, we should probably go back to the hotel. But believe me when I say that I've meant every word I've said tonight. She wavered on her feet, emotion swirling through her. Her eyes burned when she thought about Brett Anderson and what she had done to him. I believe you, she whispered back. But if you stay with me, I might hurt you. You talk in riddles, Sophia Ambrose. Tell me what dark thoughts are going through your head. Confide in me, please. I... I can't, she repeated, breaking away to run down the stairs to the lower room, past the bar and tables filled with laughing people, and out the door. On the sidewalk, she gulped in fresh air, trying to clear her mind of the mesmerizing moments she had just spent with Gavin. His voice suddenly sounded behind her. He reached out to hold her shoulders, filling her with a warmth and strength she wanted so much. She didn't want to live a lonely life but what choice did she have? I won't press you, but I'm serious when I say you can trust me. She nodded silently, fighting the tears swimming behind her eyes. Gavin helped Sophia back into the hired car and held her hand on the way back to the Ritz. But she felt no pressure from him, only comfort and assurance. She did trust him. And that's what made this whole thing even worse. Why did Gavin Spencer have to turn out to be the one her heart and soul wanted. Chapter 23 Thirty minutes later, Sophia was in her room, pressing her face into her pillow. Why did Gavin have to be so perfect for her? Why did he have to turn out to be strong and charming and smart and devastatingly handsome? She could not stop reliving every single one of Gavin's kisses, every touch and every look. Frustrated, 
She jerked up off the bed and paced the suite, her mind spinning all the agonies of meeting someone who might be the one. Deep down, she knew she had to cool things off between them. Perhaps that was the easiest thing to do since Gavin traveled for work so much. It would be easy to put him off, pretend she was busy or missed his calls. Of course, that part was not easy. In reality, it would be agony. Sophia fanned her face, remembering those delicious, perfect, and so very, very romantic kisses. Maybe she needed to take a cold shower. Even better, she'd go down to the hotel swimming pool. Some exercise would clear her head. She needed a lot of head clearing. After dressing in her bathing suit, she grabbed a towel and her cell phone and headed down. The pool wasn't huge, but all she needed was a quick dip to get her mind off Gavin. Leaving her sandals and towel on a chair, Sophia heard her cell phone buzz. It was Gavin. Hi, Sophia. His warm, beautiful voice caught at Sophia's chest. I got a call from the supervisor, at BP. They're having trouble with the well cap we just installed and wanted me to take a look at a leak. I've alerted Jake and Earl, and they have the truck and some tools ready to go. I should be back by midnight. Does that happen very often? Sophia asked. No, but it can. At least we can fix it now without having to come back in a couple of days. Hey, where are you? Your voice sounds a little echoey. Oh, I came down to the pool. You should have called me. I would love to have a swim with my favorite girl. After all that kissing tonight, I'm not sure that would have been a wise decision. She spoke lightly, teasingly, but her insides were aching with wanting to see him again, too. Be safe. I'll see you in the morning. Absolutely. This shouldn't take long. Let's have breakfast at the hotel before we leave for the airport. Yes, perfect. After saying goodbye, Sophia laid her phone on the edge of the pool. Then she plunged into the water, rolling onto her back to float while she closed her eyes and tried to shake out all the obsessive thoughts she was having about Gavin. Those lips, his smile, his deep green eyes. The door to the pool opened and Sophia's eyes flew open. Her few minutes of solitude and reverie were broken. It was Gavin, walking toward the edge of the pool, wearing his work uniform. A sizzle started in her toes and ran straight up her neck at the side of him. Sophia swam toward him, her head out of the water. She had left it in its fancy hairstyle, although the back of it was now wet. Is something wrong? she asked, aware of his eyes on her although he managed not to stare at her bikini. No, I just couldn't leave without saying goodbye. When you said you were in the pool, the temptation was too great. Sophia walked up the tiled steps, holding on to the handrail for balance, because Gavin totally kept her off balance. He leaned in for a quick kiss and she laughed, wiping a finger against his lips. Now you're all wet too. Believe me, it's worth it. I'll call you in the morning, okay? Hope it's an easy fix out there. I guess you're taking spotlights so you can see what's going on? Yep, Jake and Earl already loaded them. I'll leave you to your swim. Just save some swim time for me. Maybe at Ambrose Estate Pool? I think it's nicer than this hotel pool. What a brazen man you are, inviting yourself over for a pool party, she said flippantly. I gotta grab those moments with you when I can. Sleep well. Sophia gave a quick wave as he left through the glass doors of the pool area, then retrieved her belongings. Time for a shower and a good book, she muttered. An hour later, after a shower, donning warm PJs and watching part of a movie from the Mountain of Pillows on the king-sized bed, Sophia grabbed Margaret's journal. The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose May 15, 1911 there is good news in the neighborhood. Celeste has recently visited Dr. Thompson. She is expecting a baby again. She's thrilled, of course, and all of her friends have been celebrating with her. I told her in all earnestness of my happiness for her and my fervent prayers that this child would be born healthy and strong and grow up to make her proud. It's planting season and birthing season on the ranch, so this is a very busy time. I look at my children and I'm shocked to see how tall and grown-up they are becoming. Mattie is 17 years old, 
and quite the grown-up man. He has applied to several universities on the East Coast, which is much too far away for this mother. James just turned 13, and Helen Elizabeth is no longer a child either, at nearly six years old. She wants to learn how to bake cookies and wear grown-up dresses instead of her little girl pinafores. The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose June 16th, 1911 Celeste Fontaine does not keep to tradition very well. Her pregnancy is beginning to show at more than four months' gestation, and since her husband provided her with three different vehicles, she is out and about all the time, shopping, visiting, even driving into Houston for the theatre, or to be fitted by her special seamstress. This new century has certainly brought about many changes in the world. I will now confess the wicked machinations of my own brain. As I was directing the gardeners the other day and admiring the burgeoning flower beds, a very peculiar thing suddenly occurred to me. If Celeste Fontaine is four months expecting, that would put conception in early February, about the time of my birthday extravaganza. The exact time Mr. Fontaine was away on business on the East Coast for six weeks. I do hope that I merely have my dates all muddled or that Celeste has her due date mixed up. Perhaps Dr. Thompson has it all wrong. I pray so. Even so, I cannot help ruminating on it over and over again. When I brought it up to George, he looked outraged and scolded me for being so unkind to my best friend. Sophia dropped the journal into her lap and got up from the lounge chair. Then she ran back over and flipped through the pages. Yes, it was true. Celeste's husband, Mr. Fontaine, was out of town during the birthday party. Surely it was all a mistake. How well did women know their pregnancy due dates in the past? But doctors weren't stupid, and women weren't naive about how babies were created. A peculiar sense of gloom settled in Sophia's chest. She picked up the television remote to find a romantic comedy to watch, something that would make her laugh and take her mind off Margaret's life and her own plight over Gavin. She had only scrolled through a few channels when her cell phone rang. It was a number she didn't recognize, then realized it was a Houston area code, the same prefix as Gavin's. Quickly, she punched the button. Hello, Gavin? This is Jake, Miss Ambrose. What's... He cut her off. There's been an accident out here at the whale site. Gavin is hurt. We lost our spotlights, and he was moving a pipe between the rig and one of the oil company's trucks. The driver didn't see him, and he was crushed. He was, what? No. An ambulance already took him away. Where? What hospital? I'll meet you. Sophia's voice turned wobbly, and her limbs were suddenly shaky, her stomach sick. The University Medical Center. I don't think it's too far from the French Quarter. Can you get a taxi? Yes, yes, of course. Gavin was hurt. How serious was it? Was he going to be all right? There were a hundred questions she wanted to ask Jake, but he already had clicked off. No, 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 she moaned as she yanked on her jeans and pulled a shirt over her head. Jamming her feet into her shoes, she grabbed her handbag, phone, and a hotel key and ran for the door. Chapter 24 The hotel concierge called a taxi for her and during the entire ride to the hospital, Sophia's mind was sick with worry and fear. Had the Ambrose curse already struck at Gavin? But they were here in New Orleans, not back home. But did the curse care? Maybe it didn't make a difference. This was the closest she had come to a serious relationship in seven years, and the mysterious Ambrose curse was always out there lurking, biding its time to strike. It seemed too much of a coincidence. Sophia held her fists tight in her lap in the dark back seat of the taxi, while her mind ran away with convoluted, panicked thoughts. The premonition of dread in Margaret Ambrose's journal was becoming Sophia's terror now. Perhaps it was affecting her, or her imagination was running away with her. All Sophia knew was, she had to finish that journal. Tonight, if possible. As soon as she knew that Gavin was okay. How badly hurt was he? Would he survive? Please, God, she silently prayed as the taxi driver honked his horn and maneuvered around thick Friday night traffic. Please don't let him be another victim of my stupidity and selfishness. 
Soon the lights of the hospital came within sight. She wasn't married to Gavin. They were not engaged, not even an official couple. Surely the curse couldn't get at him, and he hadn't been at Ambrose Estate in almost a week. Tears swam in her eyes, but Gavin had held her in his arms tonight and kissed her with a passion and fervency that was more real and powerful than anything Sophia had ever known. Sophia's hand flew to her chest. She hadn't worn the pendant tonight during their dinner and dancing date, and she had forgotten to put it back on. Now she felt bare and exposed without it. Had taking it off made her, and Gavin, more vulnerable? Here we are, ma'am, the driver called out, pulling up in front of the hospital doors. Sophia gave him a few bills and hurried across the concrete entrance, pushing at the doors and looking about wildly. Earl appeared beside her, apparently down in the lobby to watch for her. Earl, what happened? How is he? We should never have gone out there tonight, he said, the expression on his face tortured. You can't blame yourself, Earl. You've all done this a thousand times before. It was an accident. We need to get back home tomorrow and want it to be done with it. Oil Company was worried about the leaky cap making it more vulnerable to light up again with a fresh fire. Then, of course, you needed to go out there. But Gavin will be okay, won't he? The man was scaring her. I think so. The doctor's coming soon. Earl led her to one of the examination rooms down a sterile hallway. Jake stood at the door, his face sober. Hey, Miss Ambrose, he said with a weak smile. You okay, Jake? Barely, he muttered with a crooked smile. Gavin will sure be glad to see you. Is he conscious? Sort of. The two men pushed open the door and Sophia slipped inside. Two nurses were there, checking IVs and vitals. Gavin lay on the bed, his face pale, eyes closed. His hands were still, but it was obvious he had been clutching at his chest. How is he? Sophia asked the male nurse who looked up at her, while the other checked the fluids in the IV bag. Are you his wife? Sophia bit her lips and shook her head. No, just a friend. His co-workers called me to come. We're all out here from Texas together. His ribs took a beating tonight, the man said, slipping his stethoscope around his neck. Two are cracked and two are bruised. We did a CT scan to make sure his lungs aren't punctured. Results are being read right now. Sophia forced herself to remain steady. If one of his lungs is punctured, how serious is that? And what's the treatment? He'll need surgery. They can repair a punctured lung, but the recovery can take six to eight weeks. In the meantime, there's a waiting room down the hall. We've given him some painkillers, so he's a little out of it right now, but he'll probably be able to talk briefly before we take him into surgery, if that's what's determined from the CT scan. Thank you, Sophia whispered. Jake and Earl were staring at her, their faces haggard and anxious. Sit with him, Jake told Sophia. We'll see you in a little bit. Gonna get us some coffee. It's been a brutal long day. I'm sorry, guys. You both should go back to your hotel and get some sleep. We will, Earl said. I'm going to call my wife, then we'll be back. The female nurse finished up with Gavin, and they left the room, leaving Sophia alone for a few minutes. She sank into the hardback chair and reached out to take his hand in hers, holding it to her face and closing her eyes. Oh, Gavin, what are we going to do, she said, her words barely making a sound in the quiet room. Down the corridors came the hustle and bustle of the hospital, gurneys being wheeled, nurses calling out to each other, a janitor attempting to clean the floors at the end of the day. It was close to midnight now. Sophia's eyes burned with worry and unshed tears. Gavin shifted slightly, and a small moan escaped his lips, his free hand clutching at his chest. His breathing was labored and wheezy. Sophia brushed a hand along his brow and gazed at him to memorize his features. Then she ran a finger through his tousled, unruly hair. His cheeks were smudged with dirt from the oil site. His dirty work uniform was stuffed into a hospital bag and sitting under the bed. He was wearing a hospital gown and a light blanket covered his feet and legs. He was so large. His feet hung over the edge of the bed. His chest and powerful arms filled the entirety of the mattress. Only a few hours ago, Gavin had kissed her over and over again. 
and the memory tortured Sophia with longing. She ran her finger along his lips, then bent over his face, and lightly pressed her own mouth against his for a brief moment. You'd better get yourself together, Mr. Spencer, she whispered. That's an order. Sophia, Gavin suddenly moaned. His voice was rough, and he tried to open his eyes. Yes, it is me. Jake called and I came right away. You were supposed to stay at the hotel and swim laps with me, she teased him. That would have been a better use of your time, you know. Instead, you had to go out there and get yourself crushed to death. Yeah, his raspy voice chuckled, and then he winced and clutched at his chest again. When his eyes closed again, Gavin's fingers found hers and tightened to hold her there at his side. A moment later, he lifted her hand to his mouth and kissed the back of it. A fierce yearning for this man shot through Sophia, and she fought to keep her composure. You're going to be fine. The doctors are taking care of you. His eyes slid open again, and a half-smile cracked at his lips. Am I hallucinating, or did you just kiss me? She let out a laugh. I think you're coming back from the dead already. Kiss me again, Sophia, he said his words coming in small spurts. Before Sophia could obey his wishes, a woman in a white lab coat and a name tag of Dr. Benoit walked briskly into the room. Mr. Spencer, you are a lucky man, she said, walking to the opposite side of the bed to place a hand on his arm and peer into his face. The good news is your lungs are not punctured. The bad news is that you have several fractured ribs and a couple more that are pretty bruised. Will I live, Doc? Gavin asked, quirking his mouth. At least for another day or two, she replied. We're going to clean you up, wrap those ribs, which means you're going to look like a mummy for a few weeks, and keep you overnight. I want to make sure you have no other injuries we're missing, make sure you don't get a fever, and that you can walk out of here tomorrow on your own two feet. But I have a flight tomorrow. If it's later in the day, you might make it. For now... We're giving you some strong pain medication and sleeping pills to help you get some rest. Keeping her eyes on Gavin, she flicked a glance at Sophia. Is this your wife, Mr. Spencer? Not yet, he answered with a smart aleck grin. You okay with that answer? The doctor said, smiling at Sophia. We need to talk, Sophia said, glaring at Gavin, who merely chuckled, then winced once more, his fists clutching at the bedsheet. Okay, Mr. Spencer, take it easy, Dr. Benoit said. The nurses will be back with a little sponge bath since you're dirty as sin. You'll get your mummy wrappings and some meds you are gonna love. I'll see you in the morning before my shift is over. She departed the room when the two nurses appeared with a cart full of supplies. Sophia leaned over the bed again, gripping Gavin's hand. I'll see you tomorrow. You cooperate and sleep. Don't do anything foolish. He gave her an impertinent grin. You're the only one I want to run away with. Bite your tongue, Sophia quipped in return. She picked up her handbag from the chair and headed to the door. Don't I get a kiss goodbye, Gavin asked, groaning as he tried to lift himself up an inch. Knock it off, fireman, she scolded as she walked back toward the bed. If you promise to do what they tell you and don't get any hard-headed ideas... Then Sophia leaned over him, gazing into his eyes, which held hers firm and steady. You scared me to death, you know, she whispered. You're making me crazy. You're making me crazier, he said in return. Softly, she pressed her lips against his. The taste of his mouth, so warm and masculine, made her head swim. Wavering on her feet, it took every ounce of Sophia's emotional strength she had to say goodbye and slip out the door. A few minutes later, Sophia's eyes watered in the back of the taxi to the hotel, tears slipping down her face. Seeing Gavin like that had scared her more than she let on. She had had a taste of what it might feel like to lose him. And that's when she knew that she had already fallen in love with him. Chapter 25 Sophia unlocked the hotel room door and let her handbag fall to the nearest chair. Then she flopped onto the couch that faced the street windows. 
The lights of New Orleans twinkled under the midnight sky like scattered jewels. From somewhere in the distance, live music drifted down the road, mingled with the chatter of tourists on the streets below her balcony. Slogging to her feet, Sophia picked up the clothes she'd flung around the bathroom in her hurry to get to the hospital, hanging her bathing suit and damp towel on the towel rack. After slipping on her nightgown, she climbed into bed and turned out the light. After tossing and turning for a few minutes, she knew she couldn't sleep until she had read the end of Margaret's story. Sophia picked up the journal and snapped on the lamp as she turned to the next entry. The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose July 30th, 1911 I have never seen Celeste look so radiant or so beautiful. She is ecstatic about the baby coming and blessed with not a single day of illness. She's already prepared the nursery, purchased his clothes. She's convinced it's a boy, sewn its nappies, painted and wallpapered in blues and greens. Playthings galore sit ready for him, including blocks and spinning tops and a toy train set. She even had two rocking horses commissioned by the best craftsman in town. Celeste will spare nothing for her child, her first to be born healthy, we pray. I should not resent her, but for some odd reason I do. It is probably the most uncharitable feelings I have ever had, for my own dear friend, no less. I must be jealous of her beauty and vivaciousness, which puts my own character in a pitiable, desperate light. Celeste continues to put on parties and intellectual gatherings at her lavish mansion, despite her condition. Sometimes I think she's flaunting it on purpose, but I cannot figure out why exactly. As if she is bragging, as if this child is more special, more wanted than any other woman's child. Only once have I seen Mr. Fontaine these last few months. He was quite abrupt with all of us at the luncheon Celeste put on, despite the heat of the summer making us all swelter. She hired servants to fan us and keep us cool with cold drinks, bringing in blocks of ice for the occasion. I keep my secret thoughts to myself, but I watch Mr. Fontaine surreptitiously and wonder if he suspects the same thing that I do. But if my, his and mine, suspicions are true, then who is the father of this child that Celeste brags about and flaunts her own growing figure? Wouldn't a woman who was carrying another man's child be more discreet? And then the answer occurred to me. Celeste doesn't care because she's in love with the father of her child and the father could not possibly be Mr. Amoncio Fontaine, for he was not at home the entire month. Conception had to have occurred. In fact, he is rarely home now, which told me that stern Mr. Fontaine, a wise and learned man so much older than Celeste, knows the truth. He knows it. If it was his child, his firstborn, wouldn't he be home to make sure Celeste and the child remain healthy and have the best care? The secret was his and mine, but, of course, we never spoke of it, although once he caught my eye and gave me a most peculiar, pointed look that sent shivers down my spine. The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose August 10th, 1911 The entire town is in shock. Celeste Fontaine has lost her son, a premature stillborn, another child gone once again. She was in the garden cutting roses when the pains came. Her manservant rode like a wild man to our house, and George took off immediately to help Celeste get safely to Dr. Thompson's clinic. There was nothing the doctor could do for the child. Mr. Fontaine cut his business trip short when a telegram was sent to Denver. He buried him on their property in a small grave, Without anyone else in attendance, I am certain that he shunned a public memorial and burial because he knows the truth. The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose August 29th, 1911 I have taken to my bed. I have never been so utterly and completely devastated in my entire life. Never have I wished death on someone. I have learned for myself that Mrs. Fontaine accompanied my husband, my George, to Houston to fetch Madame Zelana last February, and they spent the night in a hotel together under a false name. 
The dates match up perfectly. My own friend was pregnant with my husband's child. Could any knowledge be more painful than this? My heart is utterly scarred and broken. I'm not sure I can ever recover from such deception and infidelity. The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose October 25th, 1911 Devastation does not adequately describe this month of my life. As horrific as learning that my dearest friend Celeste betrayed me in the worst possible way, and my husband broke our marriage vows by loving another woman and fathering a child with her. My life has been torn asunder in the cruelest manner. God has taken Mattie. My dear, kind, intelligent Mattie. He was killed in a buggy accident while leaving the ranch on his way to the railway station to attend university. He was with his dearest childhood friend. John merely broke his arm but is alive and well and will continue on to college. But my Matty is gone and the world is dark and gloomy. I have buried my eldest child. Some might say I should have compassion on Celeste who lost every child she carried. But my Matthias had his entire life ahead of him. I am numb to my core. The funeral at our local Ambrose Presbyterian Church was a blur, despite my longtime friends claiming it was a beautiful and moving tribute to Matthias. How can I go on? There are days I wish I could die myself, but God forces us to breathe to wake, to move. I pace the halls of Ambrose Estate at midnight because I cannot sleep. George and I rarely speak. We have not shared a room in months, and I am certain that my life has been shattered forever. Eventually, I drop into a stupor of exhaustion on one of the couches, but when I wake at dawn, the pain and grief are still there, often worse than ever. I cling to James and Helen like a drowning woman. George has moved into a different wing of the house. How could our lives be destroyed so thoroughly? The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose January 25th, 1912 It is more than three months since we lost Maddie in the terrible accident that left him mangled and lifeless. I didn't think life could get any worse. But it has. Three weeks ago, our boy James was killed. George sent him out to help Celeste find her runaway horse, her favorite horse, of course. He could not stop himself from helping the woman when Mr. Fontaine is away. I despise Mr. Fontaine, too, almost more than George. If he had been home more over the last few years to give comfort and companionship to his wife, Perhaps she would not have bewitched my husband. There was a terrible storm that night, and I argued with George that the Fontaine horse would find its way back home on its own. Horses are certainly capable of that, and it was too dangerous to send our little Jimmy boy. The torrential rains and wind were so fierce. I was afraid we were in for a tornado. The wind shrieked so mightily. Instead, my James was struck by lightning. When he didn't return home, George found his body on the property line of Ambrose and the Fontaine estate after comforting Celeste over her lost horse. A horse! He was more worried about a horse than his own flesh and blood son, his son, who will never live to carry on the Ambrose name or give us grandchildren or light up the room with his smile and chokes. I am in despair. I wish God would take me too. The next day, when the storm disappeared like a dandelion's puff in the breeze, the Fontaine horse showed up in its stall, whining for oats. My son's life was traded for absolutely nothing, and I will never get over it. Life has turned darker than I ever thought possible. I am contemplating returning to England. My parents are getting elderly 
and it might be best for me to help them through their last years, as well as have time apart from George, while I decide what to do about our lives and our marriage. I will take Helen with me, of course. George can have a duel with Mr. Fontaine over Celeste if they care to. She is not worth it, but men are fools over a woman with a pretty face. I truly believe Celeste might be possessed by a devil, for fresh gossip came from the most unexpected source. I overheard some of the townswomen talking at the produce market. They had a most interesting tale to tell. The week James died, it seems that Madame Zelana had been staying with Celeste Fontaine. The coincidence is uncanny. What wicked spells did those two concoct to destroy my life and steal my husband and family? Did Celeste take my two boys? Because she had lost her child, George's child, so that I would not have my sons any longer either? Wickedness abounds here at Ambrose. The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose April 3rd 1912. I will be wearing black for the rest of my life. After losing my two beautiful sons, George made an attempt at repenting of his wayward ways. He was inconsolable at the loss of Matty and James, and most likely his own guilt finally caught up with him. He met several times with Reverend Johnson and asked for my forgiveness. He wants to stay married and try to repair our relationship. I think the shame of separating or divorcing is too much for him to face. He is a coward. But how can I live with a man who loves and protects my enemy instead of me? My sorrow and numbness know no height or depth. A dark void has invaded my heart. In order to keep herself occupied, Mrs. Celeste Fontaine has taken to having seances to raise the spirits of her dead children. Madame Zelana is deceiving her for the filthy lucre Celeste gives her. The trust George and I used to share has been broken too many times to repair. Even though he lives here at Ambrose, I don't trust that he doesn't visit Celeste when Amoncio is gone or she lures him there with a spell from that gypsy woman. Only with God's divine help can things be restored and that will take time. My heart is sealed off with the burden of losing my children. I told George that he has to prove to me his atonement and give me solid proof that he does not maintain any kind of contact with the Fontaines. This is where we stand at present. May God forgive me if I have an unforgiving heart. I need his healing more than ever. I need strength to sustain me while I finish raising Helen. I spoke with George about taking Helen to England during the summer since passage across the Atlantic is safer during the summer months. This would be a good part of her schooling to raise her into a fine young woman of stature and means. But could I trust my husband while I am gone for several months? The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose April 18th 1912. The trip to England has been cancelled after the sinking of the Titanic. Those poor souls, more than 1,500, have drowned and frozen in the sea. It is unbearable to consider risking Helen, but my heart longs to be with the family that I miss. I need consolation and true friends, as well as distraction and a break from Ambrose estate. I think I have wept more tears than any human could possibly survive this past year. George doesn't want to lose me and Helen in such a voyage. We shall see. The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose May 2nd, 1912 My hand is shaking badly as I write this. My eyes so blurry, I fear I might go blind. My limbs are weak. I have taken to my bed. Celeste took her final revenge two weeks ago after learning that George would not leave me once and for all to come to her. She cursed him so that I couldn't have him. While rounding up cattle with the foreman, George suffered a severe blow to the head 
by our big sire bull in preparation for mating season with the cows. My husband has ranched for 17 years, and he was accompanied by experienced ranch hands, no less. His accident is no coincidence. George succumbed to death a day after lying in a coma. The doctor said he died of a brain hemorrhage. In a little over six months, I have lost my husband and two sons. How will I ever cope or survive out here all alone? The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose August 31st, 1912 My dear brother Lloyd sent his wife across the Atlantic to be here with me for the summer. Victoria is so good and so kind. I have grown very fond of my sister-in-law. She brought her lady's maid, Nellie, with her so she wouldn't be alone on the ocean voyage. Nellie lifts everyone's spirits with her genuine kindness and laughter and sweet singing. Over the last few months, Victoria tried to get me out walking in the gardens, but for most of the summer, I sat on the veranda overlooking the estate in my morning garb, just staring, occasionally holding Helen, who was getting too big for my lap. Actually, she was too big about three years ago. But I crave her closeness, her sweetness, even when she fights to run off and swing in the gardens or play with the new kittens in the barn. Will Celeste take her from me too? I begged Victoria to take her back to England with her to save her. But Victoria laughs off my worries. I tried to tell her about Celeste and George and the dead infant that ties with the loss of my sons, but she is convinced it's all in my imagination. Only I know the truth. I now have proof of it in Celeste's own hand. In June, Mr. Fontaine sold their ranch and left for San Francisco with his wife to start over and begin again. I have never been so glad to see someone gone, but the wicked curse that Madame Zelona concocted for my family over the last year was never undone. The fortune teller, with her seances and mutterings from the underworld, disappeared from the village of Ambrose in June. No one knows where she went, but Celeste was sure to give me a dire warning that the Ambrose curse was in effect until someone could break it. She would not tell me how the curse was to be broken, but in July, after she and Mr. Fontaine were safely in San Francisco, I received a letter from the woman. Enclosed was the curse in Madame Zelona's own hand, directed by Celeste for our downfall. She never could have loved George if she didn't care that he died. She only wanted me to suffer for her losses. She could not bear to know that I would have my husband and sons, and she nothing. Since I cannot stand to look at the curse for one more second, I will write the details in my own words so my progeny will know what to do to save future generations. Madame Zelana stated that in retribution for the loss of Celeste's son with George and his subsequent betrayal to her, every Ambrose son and father and brother will die. Every Ambrose woman who loves a man will lose their husbands and sons. Arrogance would not save Ambrose's estate from the curse. Only George could have done that, and he had not given in to Celeste. In the end, he shunned her by not running away with her. These facts confirmed to me, too late, that George had finally broken all association with her, something I never believed from my husband's own mouth, because I was too distrustful. Celeste was bitter and vengeful. She had allowed her own sins to blacken her soul. She didn't care what her bitter envy would do to George and his family, the man she professed to love. This is not love. This is wickedness at its deepest depth. Madame Zelona states in her vile curse that the only way to break the hold of the curse is for every Ambrose woman to willingly give up or lose something they dearly love. If they do not, they too will lose the men they love. The curse was written by Madame Zelona's own hand and signed with Celeste's own blood. The devil is in the details. I am putting this journal and Celeste's curse in my trunk of mourning clothes. 
Helen is too young to be told these things yet, but before she is married, I will tell her. I have vowed to do my part. I will not return to England. I will stay here and run the ranch and estate myself. All those hours of contemplation in the gardens and ruminating on the veranda of the house George and I built together convinced me that I belong here. England holds nothing for me any longer. It has been nearly twenty years, and it would be too difficult to start over. George worked too hard for this estate with my own dowry, and it's the only way I can honor his memory and have peace within myself. May God bless my sweet Helen and all the future generations of granddaughters, so Ambrose Estate will live on. Be brave, women of Ambrose Estate. Sophia was weeping by the time she finished reading the journal. All of her fears and her sister's fears were real, not their wild imagination at all. The Ambrose curse was real. Every single male had died over the last hundred years and would continue to die unless she and her sisters broke the curse. But how would they accomplish it? The most unnerving thing of all was holding the actual curse in her hands written on parchment paper by Madame Zelana. The old-fashioned handwriting was ghostly eerie, and the dark smear of Celeste's dried blood now brown with age. It was as if the spirits of the past were speaking to her from their graves. There was no way to change history. It was too late to turn back the clock and undo her feelings for Gavin Spencer. She was already hopeless for the man, and there was no way out. He would die if she continued on the path of their relationship. She would be sealing his certain death by not banishing him from Ambrose's estate. She needed to tell him that she did not love him, that he needed to forget about her and find someone else. One way or another, Sophia was going to get her heart broken into a thousand pieces. Chapter 26 Pacing the floor of her hotel room, Sophia mopped her face with handfuls of tissues, and then she grew angry. Why hadn't Granny ever told her any of this? Why hadn't her mother? Surely they knew. Did this explain the reason why two of her mother's husbands hadn't died yet? They had never actually lived at Ambrose Estate. They had never worked here, and they had never had children with Poppy. Only she and her five sisters who had lost their fathers in sudden tragic deaths, killed by the curse. She had spent most of her life fatherless all these years because of an evil curse. Sophia grew more and more furious with her mother and grandmother. It was more imperative than ever that Sophia contact her sisters again. She would force them to listen. Grabbing her cell phone, Sophia dialed the airlines, pulling on her clothes while she waited for a United operator. When is your next flight to Houston? We have a 5.20 a.m. one and a 7 a.m. flight. May I book it for you? Sophia glanced at the bedside clock. It read almost 1.30. She needed more than two hours sleep if she had to drive the two hours from Houston to Ambrose once the plane landed. Yes, please book the 7 o'clock. Here's my credit card number. In five minutes, it was done, and she had a confirmation number. She finished throwing everything into her suitcase, placing the shimmery blue evening gown on top with the pale blue earrings in their jewelry pouch. Her makeup bag went in last, and then Sophia zipped it up. She needed to get to the airport by 5.30, so she had a few hours sleep to avoid being a total zombie or risk killing herself on the freeways of Houston. Turning out the lights, she lay on the bed, bunched a pillow underneath her head, and closed her eyes after setting the alarm but her mind was troubled, worrying with too many thoughts. She had to talk to her grandmother and shake some answers out of her. When the alarm went off, Sophia brushed her teeth, ran a comb through her hair, and was down in the lobby in ten minutes. The concierge called a taxi for her. While she waited, Sophia went to the front desk and handed over her room key. I'd like to leave a message for Gavin Spencer. Oh, and is there a way I can get something photocopied in the next 15 minutes? Of course. We have a copier in the offices. I'll have the desk clerk run it for you. 25 cents a sheet. That's fine. It's very important. Sophia handed him the journal. It's very old, so please be careful. Of course, ma'am. 
Here is paper and a pen for the note for Mr. Spencer. I'll make sure he gets it. A lump in her throat threatened to overcome her. Her eyes were burning with so little sleep and the crying jag she had. She wrote, Gavin, I'm flying to Houston this morning and headed to Ambrose. I hope you're feeling much better this morning. I'm sure you will heal quickly with lots of rest. The Ambrose curse is real. I know it now without a doubt. Enclosed is the journal I was telling you about. If you're interested in why I've left New Orleans, you may read it. If not, I'll understand. You can mail the photocopy back or burn it. I just don't want it lost or stolen due to its personal sensitive nature. Thank you for all of your help with our oil fires these last few weeks. I hope you get better very soon. Take care of yourself. Sophia Ambrose. Fighting to keep her emotions at bay. Sophia opened the padded envelope the front desk woman handed over, placed the note and the copy of Margaret's journal inside, and then sealed it. Then she tucked the original journal into her carry-on bag. Your taxi to the airport is here, miss, the concierge said, leading her outside. Have a safe journey. The minutes seemed to crawl by while she waited to board, and then flew the hour back to Houston. After landing, she rented a car, loaded her personal items in the back seat, and began to drive to Ambrose Estate. Frustration and resentment simmered inside of her like a pot about to boil over. Had nobody ever read the journal? Had nobody thought to check the birth and death records of her ancestors? She couldn't marry Gavin one day only to have him die fighting one of the dangerous oil well fires. It would kill her. It was easier to leave him before their relationship got more serious. Sophia knew that she loved the man. She had known it with a certainty that knocked her over when she saw him lying in the hospital last night. Little pieces of her heart had torn off, and she had left those pieces on his lips when she kissed him goodbye. Tears ran down her cheeks when she realized that she would never kiss Gavin Spencer again. After another hour of driving, Ambrose Estate came into view. Sophia's heart tugged at the sight of her beautiful and deadly home. Wrenching her bag out of the back seat of the rental, Sophia strode through the front door and banged it against the foyer wall. Before leaving the airport at nine, she had sent a message to Mrs. B to warn the housekeeper that she would be home soon. The older woman came running down the hallway from the kitchen. My, my, Miss Sophia, what brought you back home so early? We didn't expect you until at least tonight. I need to see Granny as soon as possible, Sophia answered, her voice so tight and constricted, she thought she might break her vocal cords. Where is she? I'm right here came her grandmother's voice from the doorway of the drawing room, just across the foyer. I heard you bang into the house. Did something happen in New Orleans? Did Mr. Spencer not treat you well? Fury grew inside Sophia. That's the first thing you think of when I come home early? No, Granny. Gavin was the perfect gentleman. He's perfect. My problem is with you. Me? Her grandmother's eyebrows rose, and she smoothed a hand down her perfectly pressed slacks, lifting her chin. I think you need to come with me inside the drawing room so we can sit down and talk properly. Sophia's eyes narrowed. I don't need to go behind a closed door. Mrs. B can hear everything. I'm so tired of the Ambrose secrets and lies. What in the world are you talking about? Have you ever read Margaret Ambrose's journal? Lillian frowned one hand reaching for the substantial ornamental knob at the end of the staircase banister. I'm not sure what you're referring to. It was in the old attic, packed away underneath her morning clothes. Black clothes she wore from the time she was 38 until the day she died. When did she die, Granny? This was your grandmother. I'm sure you have an idea of what year she died. I don't recall exactly. Did you find any genealogical records? It probably has the exact dates. I wouldn't be surprised if she died of a broken heart. Her daughter was Helen, your mother. It appears that you've been doing some reading, my dear. I didn't realize you had found anything of significance. I thought it was just the diary of a new bride and her adventures immigrating to Texas. I had no idea the heartache she suffered, the pain, the loss, 
Within six months, she lost her sons and her husband. I think I remember my mother saying something about that, but I had no idea how close their deaths were. You should read it sometime. You might learn a few things, but I swear, Granny, I don't think you're telling me the whole truth. You've known about an Ambrose curse for a long time. I'll bet your mother told you about it. Helen probably grew up hearing it from her mother, Margaret. Perhaps, her grandmother said vaguely. Stop being so ambiguous, Granny, or I swear I will start smashing vases or taking a baseball bat to the chandelier. Lillian's mouth became a thin line. She had never liked confrontation, unless she was the one doing the confronting. You're getting yourself all worked up. That's the understatement of the year, Sophia said, glaring at her grandmother. I read Margaret's journal. I read her heartache, her husband's infidelity, all her losses. Her best friend hired someone to curse the family. It's horrible, frightening. And it's all real, in black and white, in her own handwriting. Why didn't you tell me or my sisters? Why didn't you do something? What could I do? There's no stopping it. We are all helpless to stop the accidents, the deaths. Her grandmother suddenly sounded weak and confused. If you read her journal, you must know how to break the curse. Lillian shook her head. No, I never read her journal. And frankly, I had no idea one actually existed, let alone where it was located. My mother, Helen, mentioned it once but I never had the nerve to tear apart the house to find it. Sophia couldn't believe that. You've always had nerves of steel. Not about this, my dear. And I was a young teen at the time, twelve or thirteen. When I heard my mother mention it, it seemed like an old wives' tale. Curses and seances. I only thought about it again after your grandfather died so young. I thought it was one of those old family legends that had been exaggerated. That's why I had the necklaces created for you girls with your birthstones when you were 16, a way to unite you all as Ambrose women. I even had them blessed by a priest, thinking that would stop whatever silly curse there was, especially when you had three different fathers. I didn't want to see the Ambrose estate broken up when I died. Sophia ran her hands through her hair, so exasperated she wanted to scream. Didn't you think all those deaths, every male in our family dying, was horrible and too coincidental? Every death seemed to have a natural cause. Accidents, actually, but not sinister. They dismayed me, saddened me greatly. But there was no reason to think there was an actual curse. Well... It's time to get angry, Sophia burst out. You could have broken the curse, but you left it for us, me and my sisters, to do. Lillian's face crumpled. I'm sorry, my darling. I'm sorry, but I didn't know how. I thought the accidental deaths ended with Amelia's father 25 years ago. All of your fathers were such good men, but nobody has died since. <sighs> Sophia pounded her fist against the staircase railing. That's because mother only had daughters, no sons. Lillian pursed her lips. You're correct. I put it out of my mind and tried not to think about it. Sophia stared at her in disbelief. Put it out of your mind? What the heck? She fought to regain control of her emotions. My entire life, I figured I could never marry. After Daddy died and Mother talked vaguely about an Ambrose curse, I used to walk the Hall of the Dead and stare at all of their pictures. Even then it seemed that a husband and a family was out of my reach. Perhaps I should never have lived here with you. I should have run away with Poppy and my sisters. When she said that, her grandmother's lips trembled. I could never have borne living here by myself. I love you, Sophia, with all my heart. But I have no hope, Granny. I have no path to happiness, especially after Brett. Lillian's eyes darted away. She knew Sophia was right. Sophia had already sacrificed happiness without ever knowing why. I remember when Daniel, Mr. Gentry, was here the day of the reading of the will, Sophia said quietly. 
you made a statement I've never forgotten. You said that you hated secrets, that you liked everything out in the open. But I have learned for myself that this family is riddled with terrible secrets. Sophia stopped. She had just repeated a phrase that Margaret Ambrose had written in her journal when she discovered that George had been unfaithful. I have learned for myself it was a disquieting revelation. I didn't want you girls fighting over the will. I truly dislike it when families fight and argue or litigate a will. I'm not sure my sisters will care that much. We each have so much money coming to us for the next several decades. If the wells keep producing, which they might not, that is a problem I need to figure out. But right now I'm stuck. Truly and completely stuck. I won't even have a daughter like you did, or granddaughters to raise and love. My sisters might escape the worst of the curse, since they have all lived most of their lives away. I am truly the one who is cursed forever. Don't say such things, Sophia. Sophia's chin shot up. She eyed her grandmother, thoughts running wild in her mind. Who else has died, Granny? Is there anyone you've been keeping from us? Tell me everything, no matter how painful it is. Lillian's chin wobbled, her eyes darting about the foyer. I never thought it would matter. Wasn't losing my husband and son, Roger, enough. Sometimes Sophia forgot that she had an uncle who had died of a stroke at the age of 28, Poppy's older brother. Who else did you lose, Granny? Please tell me. An exasperated sound came from Lillian's throat. Her lips tightened, as if trying to keep her own emotions in check. I didn't bear just two children, she finally admitted. I had another son who never grew up. Oh, Granny, no, Sophia whispered. He died at four months old of SIDS. We called it crib death back then. But I didn't want to believe it was the curse. Roger's massive stroke was a strange fluke, a blood clot nobody knew about. He was probably born with it. And back in the 1980s, there weren't all the medicines to help people suffering or dying of stroke. So I lost my baby in 1962 when Poppy was three years old. And then Richard. And then Roger. Giving us the pendants was a way to make you feel less guilty, as if a necklace with a motto would save our husbands and sons. You hate secrets, Granny, and yet you've kept one of the biggest secrets of all. Sophia held her head in her hands, shaking badly. Margaret said the only way to break the curse was to give up something we loved. And I've already done that, haven't I? I lost Brett Anderson. And now I've lost a life of my own. My clinic, my friends, my condo. The choice to live my life on my own terms. But your destiny is here, darling. Is it, Granny? I think I'm going to explode or die myself. The curse hasn't been broken. It's still out here, hovering, waiting to strike. Maybe because I never truly loved Brett. I thought I did at the time, but I know it's not true now not after spending the last couple of weeks with Gavin. I will give him up because I do love him. I will not let him die, too. Darling, her grandmother began, moving toward her. Please, let's sit down together. No, Granny. I can't talk about this any longer. I have to get away for a little while. Whirling around, Sophia raced through the rear of the house, past the gardens and the swimming pool, and straight to the horse barn. With shaking hands, she saddled Star, murmuring to her and crying a little. She took comfort and strength from her childhood horse and the unconditional love Star always gave her. After adjusting the bit and the reins, Sophia lifted herself into the saddle and kicked the mare's sides with her heels. She wasn't in her riding clothes or boots, but it didn't matter. When she was 16, she had ridden barefoot and bareback often enough when she felt wild and rebellious. Go, Star, go! She cried as the horse eagerly trotted out of the barn. Sophia spotted Colt Brennan on the far side of the corral and gave him a quick wave. He tipped his cowboy hat and lifted his own hand. Once she was clear of the barns and fields surrounding the house, Sophia pressed her thighs against Star's flanks even harder, leaning over Star's head to whisper into her ear, Let's run and run and run, Star. It was exactly what she needed. 
the wind tearing at her hair, pulling out her ponytail, the hot sun on her face, burning up all of her crazy thoughts in the heartache of knowing that she had lost Gavin. With a neighing sound bursting out of her and shaking her mane with the joy of being away from her stall, Star broke into a gallop. Tugging at the reins, Sophia directed the horse to run along the creek. The stream's water sparkled under the sunshine, gurgling over rocks and boulders. All the sounds of her childhood. She did have a good childhood here. Sophia began to regret yelling at her grandmother. While Star ran and she bounced on the horse's warm back, her hair streaming in the wind, the words of the curse ran through her mind again. Every future woman of Ambrose's estate had to break the curse for herself. It was a depressing thought. Madame Zalana had certainly twisted the hateful curse as tightly as possible, affecting all of them forevermore. The sun was in Sophia's eyes when they galloped deeper into the ranch along the winding creek. The most recent storm had torn down a few tree limbs from the old cottonwoods. Star jumped several easily for at least a mile, nickering in eagerness. The jumps were exhilarating, the wind in Sophia's eyes, a catch of emotion in her throat, until the biggest tree limb of all, at least twenty feet long and five feet in diameter, suddenly appeared directly in their path. There was no way to go around it, not at the pace they were galloping. Star attempted to jump it, and Sophia ducked low over the mare's neck, lifting herself up out of the saddle to give the horse breathing space, but it wasn't enough. Sophia could see the whites of Star's eyes when she leaped off her back to give the mare more space to clear the tree. Neither of them made it. Sophia scraped her shoulder across the scattered branches and tumbled over the prickly grass of the field, while Star's hooves caught at the protruding smaller branches of the huge tree log. The horse went down instantly, stumbling over her own legs, which folded underneath her with a horrible cracking noise. The last thing Sophia heard was Star shrieking in pain. Chapter 27 I've got to get out of here. Gavin said to the nurse. He'd been calling Sophia for an hour, ever since they'd brought breakfast. The pain meds were making him woozy, but he tried to swallow a little of the oatmeal and gulp down a Gatorade. Sophia wasn't answering. Was she still asleep at the hotel? He knew she had come to the hospital the previous night, and it was late, but he thought he would have seen her by now this morning, and he was anxious to see her. Gavin couldn't stop thinking about the kiss she had given him. It was gentle and incredible, of course, but different, too. There had been palpable emotion attached to it, a kiss that held more than the excitement of new kisses, more than a friendly good night when they took him into the treatment room to clean him up and bandage his ribs so tight he was practically immobile. What did that kiss mean? Gavin was desperate to see her. He tried one last time, but her cell continued to go straight to voicemail. Finally, the fog began to clear his brain, and he got the brilliant idea to call the hotel to ask them to ring her suite. Even if he woke her up, he'd know where she was and could stop worrying. Of course, she might just have gone down for breakfast, and he was worrying over nothing. But if she had, why wasn't she picking up? After four rings, the front desk answered. This is Gavin Spencer. Would you please ring Sophia Ambrose's room? There was a shuffling of papers, then the sound of tapping at a computer keyboard. I'm sorry, Mr. Spencer. Sophia Ambrose checked out this morning. What? Gavin swung his legs off the bed, groaning in pain. Are you sure? Why would she do that? What time? My records indicate that she checked out at 5.30 a.m. That makes no sense. Where would she go at that early hour? Uh, the concierge just indicated to me that she took a taxi to the airport. The airport? Something had happened, something terrible. Gavin's heart began to pound with worry as he set the phone receiver back in its cradle. Just then, Jake poked his head in the door of the room. Hey, boss, how you feeling? I hurt like hell all over, but I'm getting out of here. Call Earl and tell him to get the plane ready to leave. Like now, ASAP. Jake's eyebrows shot up in surprise. What's going on? Sophia Ambrose is going on. She went back to Houston. Jake frowned. That doesn't make any sense. Not after the way she kissed you last night. Brilliant. Now you know why I'm worried. Get the nurse. 
An hour later, Gavin and his team were at the airport and checking with the tower for takeoff. Gavin had convinced the head nurse to give him extra meds to get him back to Texas, as well as extra wrapping. He had dressed as fast as his sorry body would let him, which was completely frustrating. His ribs were going to take time to heal, but he didn't have any time. He'd have to grin and bear it, or gulp down more pills until he saw Sophia and knew she was okay. Their pilot had made it to the airport without complaint at the urgent request. Then Earl showed up, bringing their luggage from the Ritz on a wheeled cart to stow away in the hold. How soon can we get this bird off the ground? Gavin barked. Gavin, slow down. We're checking in right now with the tower about our flight schedule. We'll be there in less than 90 minutes. Straight shot to Houston. No stops, no layovers. But we're private, Earl said pointedly. Commercial always gets preferential treatment. Now lie down on the couch and rest, or you're going to be no good to Sophia when you see her. And here, I brought you a package from her. What are you talking about? Turns out she left a package for you at the hotel. Desk clerk gave it to me when I checked out of all of our rooms. Earl dumped the padded envelope in Gavin's lap. Now read her note, and then take a nap. Gavin's muscles screamed when he leaned back against the seat, but he ignored the pain and ripped open the package, just as the plane began to taxi to their assigned takeoff location. His eyes flicked back and forth over her words. They didn't make sense. It was a goodbye note. Goodbye? Not after last night. Not after the way they had danced and kissed for two hours. They had connected in a way he didn't think was even possible, as if they were meant for each other. When she came running to the hospital, he was sure of it. When he and his men had gone back out to the job last night, Sophia was all he could think about. Her laugh, her gestures, and her gorgeous smile. After those irritating phone calls in Iraq, the biggest surprise of his life had been meeting Sophia Ambrose in person. He'd never forget seeing her for the first time. A charming, gorgeous smart aleck with a killer body and even better lips. Gavin sighed now, frustrated. His worry level rising every minute that passed, even as he tried to call her again. For some reason, she wasn't picking up on purpose. Tension tightened in his chest. None of this made any sense. The rest of her note was cryptic, something about an old family curse. She had been so evasive about it at the time he tried to ask her about it. But now he pulled a stack of photocopied sheets from the padded envelope. Pages filled with old-fashioned handwriting. Sophia's note suggested that he read the pages, the journal. It didn't make sense, but he would read it if it helped him figure out why Sophia had run away. His eyes narrowed as he began the first page. The Life Recordings of Margaret Thorne Ambrose Born February 9th, 1874 April 23rd 1893. Today, I married George Frederick Ambrose II, the man I have loved since I was 16 years of age. Chapter 28 Groaning at the sudden fall to the hard ground, Sophia put up an arm, blinking as she shielded her eyes from the bright sun. Inch by inch, she rolled over, the wind knocked completely out of her, she gasped for air, trying to assess any damage she might have done to herself. There were a few scrapes and scratches, but nothing serious. When she couldn't catch her breath, Sophia wondered if she had broken a rib like Gavin. She didn't think so, but the thought of the man she loved made her throat swell with unshed tears, knowing she had lost him forever. Moving slowly, she crawled over to her horse, and then she did begin to cry. Oh, no! No, no, no. Star was lying awkwardly on her side, legs bent underneath at the wrong angle. She was agitated and breathing heavily. Her eyes rolled back as she attempted to lift herself up, but it was impossible. Star was crippled and unable to move. Shh, shh, darling girl. I'm here. I'm going to take care of you. Tears blinded her as Sophia assessed the mare's front legs. Both legs were badly broken. The right leg was bleeding because the bone had broken through the skin. It was bad, very bad, and she had no medical supplies with her. Dear Lord, she pleaded out loud. Please don't do this to me. I can't take it. Not now. Please. Why had she gone on a run with Star? Why today of all days? 
could things get any worse? First, she had lost Gavin, and now she was going to lose Star in less than 24 hours. Fumbling at her pocket, she yanked out her phone and dialed Colt. I'm down at the creek just past the willow patch, she cried out when he answered. A bad accident with Star. Come fast. Yes, ma'am, he grunted immediately, and Sophia knew the older man would be on his way within seconds. Star was writhing now, but had given up on trying to roll over or stand. Sophia tried to calm her down. She stroked the mare's velvety face and chestnut forelock, then smoothed her hand down her neck to keep her calm. Good girl, Star. Good girl, she said softly, barely keeping her sobs in check so as not to alarm her horse. We're going to take care of you. Everything's going to be all right. Star's eyes rolled back and Sophia could see the mare's fear. She knew she was in dire distress. It's going to be okay, sweetheart. Oh, hurry, Colt. Hurry, Max. A few minutes later, the two men appeared in the distance, riding fast. Sophia jumped up and waved her arms, yelling, Don't come too close. There are tree limbs down everywhere. Colt nodded, cursing under his breath when he jumped down from his horse, and he and Max ran quickly to the scene of the accident. Had a storm here Friday night, but had no idea this area was such a mess from down tree limbs. This is a big tree. I can see why Star couldn't make it over. I'm so sorry, Miss Ambrose. I shouldn't have been galloping her so hard. I was stupid and distracted. She's probably too old to be ridden so hard and fast. This is all my fault. He shook his head. Not your fault at all. Don't go thinking that. Accidents happen. The foreman knelt to examine Star, wincing at the bad breaks, the oozing blood and bone shards. Why has she gone so quiet, Colt? Sophia asked. A minute ago, she was trying to get up on her feet and moaning a lot. Sophia knew why, but she didn't want to admit it. She wanted Star to keep moving, to keep trying to talk to her. She's hurt real bad, Colt said, his face sober and tight. And she's in shock. It's the body's way of numbing us to excruciating pain. I know, I know. Sophia rose to her feet, nervous energy screaming to get out. She paced the dirt, her throat burning from the strain of trying not to weep from the deep despair inside of her. I've had stars since she was a filly. I was there for her birth. She's been a good horse for you, Sophia, Colt said, rising from the ground and placing a fatherly hand on her arm. You watched her born, and you're here with her now at the end. She loves you, too. You have good memories. A lot of great years together. Sophia closed her eyes, shaking her head back and forth. I know what you're saying, but I don't want to hear it. I know, I know, he said gently, while Sophia leaned into him. She needed her father right now. She needed Gavin. And she had neither. But she was grateful for Colt Brennan, who had always been there for her family. Since before she was born, he was part of Ambrose Estate as much as she was. Max took a step forward, staring in the direction of the house, although they were at least four miles away. Who's that? he asked. A vehicle was coming across the meadow, bouncing over rocks and uneven ground. Sophia gulped. That's my black truck, but who's driving it? It's your grandmother and someone is with her, Max said, pursing his lips while he and Colt continued to examine Star and stroke her flanks to calm her. Good grief! Why is she bringing someone out here? Now, of all times, I'm in no shape to talk to anyone. I saw a car pulling up in front of the driveway just before you called, Max said, shading his eyes. Looks like a man, so it isn't one of your sisters. Maybe that lawyer fellow? Holding up a hand to shield the sun, Sophia stared, her eyes blurring. I'll be back in a few minutes, Miss Sophia, Colt suddenly said, swinging his legs back into his stirrups. What are you going to do, she asked. Desperation tinged her voice. This was all happening too fast. You're a trained vet, Miss Sophia, the foreman said quietly. I know this is hard for you. He broke off, and Sophia knew where he was going. To get his shotgun. It was no use getting Star to an animal hospital. It was too far away, and transporting her would take more manpower than they had. Worst of all, was the fact that Star was too badly injured. Even if they could get her somewhere quickly, Star would never walk again. 
The breaks in her legs were the worst she had ever seen. A horse who couldn't stand or walk, let alone run, was a fate worse than death. Have we got a tranquilizer to calm her down so she doesn't see the gun? Sophia asked. I'll die myself if she's terrified. I don't want her to know what's happening. And then suddenly, the four-wheel drive truck braked, sending a cloud of dust into the air. Granny climbed out of the car and stood next to the door, watching Sophia and assessing the situation. Slowly, she nodded with understanding. Her small body seemed to collapse just a little. Granny's passenger was slower, climbing out one leg at a time. Then the man forced himself into a standing position as if he were in a great deal of pain. Taking slow steps, he walked toward Sophia, his shirt flapping about his broad chest in the small breeze. His eyes were fastened to Sophia's face as if they were glued together. Kevin, she breathed. Sophia couldn't take her eyes off of him as he moved one step at a time toward her. The man should have still been in the hospital, but there he was coming closer every second, and then arms were wrapping around her body and enveloping her in the biggest bear hug. Sophia gasped, barely holding back the emotion she was trying to keep at bay. What are you doing here? She choked out, her face in his chest. My best girl ran away, and I had to find her, Gavin said softly in her ear. Sophia's arm slid up his back, her cheek pressed against his, while a tear rolled down her face. He held her head with one hand, his other hand pressing her tight against him. Am I hurting you? She asked. Nope, he said. At least not much. I'm going to be slow for a few weeks, but it hurt much more when I found out you'd checked out. I'm sorry, but I had to come home. I had to talk to Granny. He leaned back to look at her. I understand completely. I don't blame you. You read the journal on the plane? Every word. How did the hospital let you out? They didn't, but nothing was going to stop me from getting to you. So many things make sense now. All your cryptic little messages, the subjects you avoided. Then you'll understand when I tell you that you have to leave. You need to leave Ambrose Estate or you will die. And I can't lose you too. Her voice truly broke then, and tears began to cascade silently down her face. Gavin placed his palm on either side of her face, locking eyes with her. I'm not leaving you, and I'm not going to die. Then you didn't read that journal very closely, you foolish man. Go find yourself someone who doesn't have a death curse hanging over her head. Nothing doing. His mouth quirked into a small smile as his Texas accent thickened. It's been bad around Ambrose Estate for a hundred years, and the curse will get broken. But first you have to tell me your secrets. No more hiding from the past. What past? Sophia asked. You wouldn't be acting with such fear if something terrible hadn't already happened to you. She jerked her chin up to stare at him. What makes you think that? A lucky guess. And a little bird told me. Granny? Sophia looked past Gavin's shoulders to stare at her grandmother, who stood stoic by the car. A flash of annoyance went through her. Granny had no right to tell Gavin everything, and yet there was true grief and sadness in her grandmother's face as she surveyed the scene of Star hurt and dying. Her grandmother really did care about her fears and pain. Someone has to drag it out of you, Gavin said, and I'm lucky it's going to be me, because I want you, Sophia Ambrose. I want you completely, with every piece of my heart and soul. I want you too, she admitted in a whisper. But I can't have you. The curse won't let me. Gavin reached up to wipe tears spilling from the corners of Sophia's eyes. Don't change the subject. Tell me what secret you're keeping from me. Okay, okay, you win. Seven years ago, Sophia stopped, choking down the tragic memories. My boyfriend, my brand new fiancé, died after visiting Ambrose. He was killed in a car accident. Gavin shook his head, sorrow and compassion in his eyes. I'm so sorry you had to go through that, Sophia. That would be extremely devastating. But everything makes sense now. I don't blame you for running away from life. From me. Although, I'm glad nobody else took off with you before I got a chance. A moment later, Max and Colt were coming back down the slope of the hill toward the creek. The two men slid off their horses and tethered them. I can't. 
I can't, Sophia sobbed. Not Star. It's not fair. Bring Sophia over to the car, Mr. Spencer, Granny ordered in her quiet, authoritative voice. No, Sophia gasped. Not yet. I have to say goodbye. Pulling away from Gavin, Sophia moved toward Star with jerky steps, stumbling over the rocks and uneven ground. Kneeling in the coarse grass, she laid a hand on her horse's forehead, then stroked her mane before leaning in to kiss her. You've been so good, Star. We've had the best times together. I'm going to miss you dreadfully. Bending down to kiss her one last time, Sophia whispered, I love you, Star. One day we'll ride together again in horse heaven. Star let out a small grunt in response, as if she understood what Sophia was saying, as if she knew that she would never walk again. Colt's face was grave and sober when Max knelt to give the mare the tranquilizer shot and rubbed between her ears while he spoke softly to her. Choking back her grief, Sophia tried not to completely lose it, but Gavin was next to her, his strength giving her courage. His hand slipped around hers, holding her tight against him while they walked up the slope back to the truck. He didn't let her argue or pull away, just opened the door while she stumbled into the back seat and gazed out the window. After a few minutes, the tranquilizer went into effect. Star stopped moaning and writhing and closed her eyes. Bending over her knees, Sophia put her hands over her ears, her body trembling with dread while Gavin rubbed her back. Even still, she jerked and flinched when the single shotgun blast rang through the air. That's when Sophia broke down, sobbing against Gavin's chest while he held her and stroked her hair. You've got a lot of grief to get out, he said softly. I'm not going anywhere. After several long minutes, Sophia wiped at her face and gulped down the lump in her throat. She knew she would cry many times in the future over losing Star, but she was grateful for good and steady ranch hands and that Gavin was here with her to share the pain. How do I break the curse, Gavin? She whispered, leaning her head against him while she took a ragged breath. Sophia, if you want my opinion, Gavin said soberly, I think you already did break it. What do you mean? The curse demanded a sacrifice, remember? The curse wanted the Ambrose women to give something up to lose something they loved. You just lost your beloved childhood horse, suddenly and unexpectedly, within two weeks of finding the journal. I honestly think the curse has been broken for you. I don't know about your sisters, but the curse demanded a hefty price from you, and now it's done. Sophia climbed out of the car, turning in a wild circle, nervous energy making her crazy while the wind whipped at her hair. But how will we ever really know, Gavin? She said, her voice rising as he gingerly climbed out of the back seat, holding himself carefully so as not to jar his broken ribs. Maybe there's more to come. Maybe I'll still lose you. Her voice trailed off as a thousand fears crowded her mind. With slow steps, Gavin came toward her, his face fierce and determined. You've been living with this terrible fear your entire life but you have to have faith that the curse for you is done. It's over. You don't have to worry any longer. I am not worried about it. She swallowed hard, searching his face. How can you be so certain? I know, because I want you, Sophia Ambrose. I told you last night that I'm falling for you. Well, I've already fallen and hit the floor. I just didn't want to scare you off. But I love you and I will take any risk to be with you, to share a life's worth of happiness with you, whatever form that takes. Sophia couldn't take her eyes off of him. You would do that. You're not afraid. You're worth it, he said, stepping closer to take her in his arms once more. And no, I'm not afraid. I admire your willingness to sacrifice your own happiness to save me, but that just makes it icing on the cake. It's not the curse holding you back any longer. It's just fear, plain and simple. You have to give up your fears once and for all. You need to trust me. You have to trust yourself. Will you believe me? Oh, I want to. Oh, how I want to believe, she whispered. She searched those green bottomless eyes of his that made her shiver and tremble. Then give us a chance, Sophia. 
What if I spend my life just waiting, fearing for the other shoe to drop? Gavin wrapped his arm around her shoulders, letting out a small grimace of pain before pressing his lips against her hair. You adorable woman, shake off all the worry and dread that's keeping you from living the life you're meant to live. Just tell me that you'll live it with me, and then I want you to kiss me every single day for the rest of your life. When she pulled back to give him a small smile, Gavin brushed the tears from her cheeks with his thumbs and then gently kissed each side of her face. But it's not fair that I had to lose Star, Sophia said with a shaky breath. How could the curse take a beautiful, innocent animal? How could someone be so horribly cruel to inflict that on people who weren't even born yet? Gavin nodded soberly. Madame Zelana and Celeste Fontaine were cruel, vindictive women. But Star's death was an accident. A terrible, sickening accident. A lot of innocent people have died too soon and too young in your family. Way too many, Sophia whispered, her voice cracking. Fate is often harsh and cruel, Gavin said, kissing her forehead with a tenderness that soothed and comforted Sophia's soul. Grim accidents happen every single day to people who don't deserve the tragedy and heartache. But after all the grieving and broken hearts, the human spirit is a powerful and miraculous thing. You can heal and move forward. You know the truth now, even if it's incredibly painful. But I know you're strong and amazing, my beautiful girl. I know you can reach out and grab a better future for yourself. A whole new beginning. Sophia gazed into his beautiful eyes, her limbs turning to liquid at the way his voice sounded in her heart. Maybe you're on to something, Mr. Gavin Spencer. And I think I've fallen hopelessly in love with you, too, she added softly. His face lit up at her words, and he grasped her hands firmly in his own. The best part is that this particular beginning has no ending at all, he murmured, his face lowering to tenderly kiss her lips. She melted at the taste of him, her mouth softening against his as her arms slid up around his neck. And then Gavin Spencer was kissing her with a fervency that Sophia knew would last an entire lifetime and beyond. This love, this kiss, had freed her from the Ambrose curse at last. You have been listening to Mostly Dangerous, The Women of Ambrose Estate, Book One. Written by Kimberly Montpetit. Performed by Reagan Boggs. Copyright 2019 by Kimberly Montpetit. Production copyright by Kimberly Montpetit.